This is Audible. Audible Inc. presents Assault Troopers, written by Vaughn Hepner, narrated by Christian Rummel. Prologue. I remember the day it finally happened, the day an alien race made contact with humanity. The latest presidential campaign was already in full swing. Endless rivers of money flowed to advertisers and political slogans clogged the airwaves. As far as I can recall, no astronomer spotted the alien starship cruising through the solar system, passing Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and then parking in orbit around Earth. One minute there was nothing. The next, CNN, Fox News, every TV station on the planet blurted out the amazing story of a real live UFO visitor. The vessel was mind-bogglingly big. One commentator said as huge as Rhode Island. It was as if someone had hollowed out one of the bigger asteroids and stuck engines in it. But this thing wasn't an asteroid. It was metal, a construct, black, oval, and with giant fins sticking out of it like an old 57 Chevy. The political ad stopped airing as the TV stations played the alien starship 24-7. I was stationed in Antarctica. My name was Creed, by the way. Just Creed. I didn't like my first name and had never used it. We sat glued before the TV, forgetting about the science experiments. According to what we watched, people by the thousands, millions maybe, aimed their backyard telescopes or binoculars at the vessel, and of course the military used radar. For thirty-seven hours the starship waited up there as silent as the Sphinx, making the world increasingly nervous. Finally, the U.S. couldn't resist doing something to prod the aliens into talking. They pulled out a mothballed shuttle and launched it into orbit. Who should pilot it but Mad Jack Creed, my father? My mom had divorced him years ago, but we'd kept in touch. He was one of the few people to visit me during my stint in prison. Mad Jack spoke into the shuttle camera giving the world a running commentary as his craft approached the alien ship. It was amazing. I watched. The world watched. Maybe it would have been better if it had been a grainy image instead of pure HD. Mad Jack grinned out of the TV. He'd torn off the goofy astronaut's headgear and put on his old Air Force cap with its chipped silver rocket pin on the bill, and he sported four days' growth of beard. He'd flown F-18s in his day, a fighter jock with three confirmed kills. It was obvious he was enjoying the heck out of getting up in the air again. He shoved his face in the camera and told us the alien hovered 260 miles over Spain. The dimensions of the starship awed me as my dad approached it, like a flea nearing an elephant. My chest ached with pride for my old man. He had guts, and he played this cool and collected. I know they must have asked for volunteers, and he would have been the first in line. As Mad Jack talked, cameras showed the shuttle's bay doors opening and a space arm unfolding, lifting a giant communications device. Computers began aiming the dish at the starship. The aliens had been quiet, continuing their sphinx-like routine of inscrutability. Finally, however, they began to react. Look, my dad's co-pilot said. Something's happening. Focus camera five, Mad Jack said. I couldn't sit still as the others watched. At first, I'd crouched in front of the TV with my fists clenched. Now I strode back and forth behind the other sitting watchers, needing to move. None of my co-workers told me to sit down. They knew better. What is that? My dad's co-pilot asked. That registered with me. I stared at the screen. I imagine everyone in the world stared into their TV or smartphone feed. They all saw a slot open on the starship. It appears Mad Jack is making them react, the TV commentator said. Without warning, a beam fired out of the starship a ray of incandescent light, looking more like a sci-fi movie than reality. My dad had time to shout a single, angry profanity. 
Our TV picture froze for a moment and showed him hunched over his panel, staring out of the shuttle window. He looked as if he wanted to launch missiles in retaliation. I saw him. I saw the fighter glaring out of his eyes. Then there was nothing but old-fashioned, blizzard-like static on the tube. The TV technicians worked fast. They switched to an open-mouthed commentator outside the Pentagon. The woman blinked several times in confusion until someone told her she was live. The aliens dusted the shuttle, I said. The others in our Antarctica shelter turned toward me. A cold, hard knot of fury erupted in my chest. The aliens had killed my dad. A fierce sense of loss exploded in my stomach. I swayed, staggered back, and sat hard on the floor. I stared, slack-jawed, seeing nothing in particular. Look, Rolo said. What are those? I remember focusing, turning to stare at the TV again. Openings appeared in the vast starship. Was the network using a satellite to image this? Big, ugly... missiles. They must have been missiles. Darted out of the ship. They moved like hungry sharks, showing long exhaust tails. The missiles dived into the Earth's atmosphere and headed in different directions. For different cities, it turned out. The next few minutes of TV showed a medley of shouting, panicked confusion. I witnessed Patriot missiles lofting trying to shoot down what we found out later were thermonuclear annihilators screaming toward U.S. targets. Another brief report told us that the Chinese had a laser defense system that no one had known about. None of it mattered. Earth tech wilted against the alien battleware. Beijing vanished in the biggest mushroom cloud the world had ever seen. Los Angeles disappeared. So did New York City, Rio de Janeiro... Johannesburg, Cairo, London, Berlin, Moscow, Bombay, and Ho Min Chin City. As if that wasn't enough, the aliens dusted the planet with a bio-terminator. It was the last thing I witnessed on the TV. A big drone spraying black spores into the air. That proved the aliens must have known about humanity ahead of time in order to create a biological weapon to kill the survivors. Either that, or that's what they'd been perfecting for the last 37 hours. In the blink of an eye, Judgment Day came to us. It started with Mad Jack Creed and ended with over 99% of humanity dead and gone. The nuclear holocaust killed hundreds of millions. The bioterminator proved worse. Billions choked on black gunk bubbling in their throats. Most drowned to death in their own fluids. A few of the nukes and mutated spores missed succumbed to radiation poisoning or the horrifyingly new weather patterns. The aliens proved to be more like Darth Vader than E.T., and that might have been the end of humanity. What chance did the final 1% have? Actually less than 1%. The survivors remained in places like Antarctica, where we were. I took my rifle out of my locker that day and never put it back. I yearned to kill aliens. Survivors were left on oil platforms in the Arctic Ocean, in submarines, on deep-sea transports, and in Siberia and other remote places. Out of billions, a few million shocked and scattered individuals waited for extinction. A high proportion of them were military or in high-risk occupations. That meant far more men than women survived. In the aftermath, although no one knew it yet, women became the most precious commodity left. If Homo sapiens were to escape the dodo bird's fate, the last females were going to have to bear plenty of healthy children. Otherwise, in one generation, there would be no human race. I'd like to say we rose up, the last humans, pitched in together and overcame every obstacle with our native pride, stubbornness, and cunning. No, it wasn't anything like that. It was grimmer, darker, and included low-down killing, the kind where we wrestled in the slime, gasping for breath, 
enduring agony and deep cuts. Our prize was the opportunity to stick a knife in our enemy's guts. Maybe that's too metaphorical. I don't know. The thing is, the aliens and their monstrous starship made a mistake. They should have finished their filthy deed, exterminating the last of us as if we were cockroaches. Instead, yeah, maybe it's time to tell this in a direct, linear fashion. Before I start, I should add that the last humans were the rough kind. The risk-takers. The lucky. The mean and the tough bastards who worked hard for a living. I was one of them. And I wasn't a wallflower nice guy. Not that I was bad. Misunderstood most of my life, yeah. But not evil. The best place to start would be that fateful day in Antarctica, when I met the aliens face to face. I remember it all right. It happened like this. Chapter One Another purple-colored snowstorm howled outside our Antarctica shelter. Every once in a while, a high-pitched shriek added to the symphony of noise. The snow itself wasn't purple, but the clouds racing across the sky were. Purple, bloody red, and a stark orange I'd never seen before. We were in Victoria Land, near the Ross Ice Shelf. The McMurdo military base, a U.S. installation, had already gone under. Rollo took out the tractor yesterday to see why communications had stopped with them. We'd felt the shockwave, the earthquake, two days ago or what we figured was a mother of a tremor. Rollo reported back that the shelf ice near McMurdo was gone. Some kind of tsunami must have cracked the surface and swallowed everything. That wave had probably slapped the land hard enough so we'd felt it here. The shock of losing McMurdo, the people and resources, further damaged what remained of our shattered morale. My comrades hunched around the radio. They were subdued, pale, and had wide, staring eyes. Communications tech Rice slowly twisted her dial, listening to static and waiting for some lone voice to talk to us. It was pathetic, and at the same time all too human, with the digital numbers climbing higher and higher. Slower, one of the others whispered to Rice. You're going too fast. Shut up. She replied. I know what I'm doing. I sat well away from them. I didn't want to hear static or rewatch video footage of the starship, my dad's death, or the first nuclear explosions. Two days after the end of the world, I was near crazy with grief and impotent rage. It wasn't only Mad Jack who had died. My mother, cousins, my old grandfather, dead. My hometown obliterated. My favorite football team. Radioactive waste or a pile of black gunk. I tried to bottle the grief and keep down the howling beast inside of me because I didn't want to lash out at the others. They didn't deserve that. I hated everything about the World Destroyers. I wished I could invade their planet and drop antimatter bombs on them. I wanted to hurt the enemy. Maybe it was part of my makeup. I've always felt that if someone beat me to death, I was going to bite them back at the very least. I wanted to give them something to remember me by. A broken bone, a cut, or even a tooth mark on their ankle, if that's all I could manage. These aliens had beaten humanity to death, and none of us had been able to do a damn thing about it, or to hurt them back in any way. I wish the Chinese lasers had worked at least a little. If we turned on our radiation detectors in the shelter, they still registered too high. We were all getting too many rads. Life anywhere on Earth had become just as bad as being sent to a Soviet-era nuclear submarine or living near Chernobyl. We were screwed. Humanity was screwed. Maybe the entire Earth. The penguins I'd seen yesterday had wobbled too much. They never were much good at walking. This bunch must have been migrating into the mountains. I'd seen thousands in a long stream, a carpet of them. And it seemed as if all those penguins were drunk. Hundreds just keeled over, 
kicking their webbed feet before spitting black gunk and dying. I buried them. I don't really know why I did. I guess it was better than doing nothing. Yeah, I shoveled frozen dirt over 400 penguins. I stopped counting at 399. I'd used my spade to hack at the icy ground until sweat poured from my skin. That black stuff they spit frightened me. That had been yesterday. Today, I sat on a stool away from the others. I had my rifle propped between my knees and an oily rag in my stained hands. The metal parts gleamed. This baby was ready to use and then some. I knew my dad would have approved. Did my eyes roll around in my head? The others had stopped looking at me, and they tiptoed when they moved near. I was security for the base. Well, me and Rollo. He was tall and bony, a real whiz with the computers and the video games. I'd boxed in the military, the U.S. Army, and I'd lugged a heavy machine gun around in the light infantry in Afghanistan. The name of Creed was one of the few things I inherited from Mad Jack, other than my temper and physique. The story of my life really started with my stepdad. He used to laugh when I did something stupid. It was harsh, jeering laughter. Before he learned better, he'd slap me around, too. Later, as I gained size, the laughter stopped, and he'd swear at me, adding a few punches. I only hit him once, and I'd felt guilty about it ever since. My mother used to send me to church, and I knew about honoring my father and mother. It was the third commandment. Still, my stepdad shouldn't have hit me. From his hospital room, my stepdad pressed charges. I'd been sixteen at the time. The judge had been a friend of his. The judge decided I was too big to go to a juvenile lockup. Under the provision of an obscure law, he sentenced me to prison as an adult. During my three years among the cons, I learned more about fighting than I ever wanted to know. It wasn't nice, fair fighting by rules, but bare knuckles. A shank of steel at times, and the heel of your shoe used to stomp and break bones. I'd almost been seventeen when the bars clanged behind me the first time. The age Robert E. Howard had made Conan the Barbarian in his literary entrance into civilization. I was too young for the pen, but I had size, attitude, and hard muscles. None of that mattered to most of those cons, who believed I was the virgin boy. The first time they tried, one of them brought two gangbanger buddies. They cornered me in the storage room next to the kitchen. I could see the lust in their eyes. It was a horrible thing when you were on the receiving end. I picked up a big jar of olives and smashed it against the nearest face. That was one of the most savage battles I ever fought. I have scars from it, and still dislike it if people close in around me. Those jailbirds never did me, though. Not those punks, and not anyone. The worst assault came three years later. It was a gang thing. Payback for what I'd done earlier. Prison taught me about vengeance, because those I beat down never forgot and never forgave. This time I was armed with a shiv, a piece of metal with a cloth-wrapped handle. Mine was sharpened to a razor's edge. Long story short, I shanked two more wannabe rapists. One died, and one would limp for the rest of his life and would never be able to rape again. I found myself before an old, white-haired judge with the thickest lenses I'd ever seen. It made his brown eyes behind them huge. I might have become a lifer that day because I defended my honor. The judge must have seen something salvageable in my belligerent stare but I don't know how it could have been possible. Maybe he knew how it was inside, and how I'd had no choice. At nineteen, I'd been lost to an inner rage. I recall standing in his courtroom with hunched shoulders, glowering up at him. He told me I had two choices. More prison, if I liked fighting so much, 
or the military. That old judge must be dead by now. Wish I could shake his hand and thank him for his kindness and for his mercy. I owed him big time. In any case, after army boot camp, I hoofed it up and down the mountains of Afghanistan, lugging a fifty caliber machine gun. They're heavy, and they get even heavier in high altitudes. There's not much to say about that time, except for that a lieutenant managed to get half our platoon killed in a firefight. I lost some close friends that day because of the man's carelessness. After the funeral, I spoke to the lieutenant concerning his stupidity. He was an arrogant prick and shouted at me. The man lacked all shame. His confusing orders had aided the Taliban. He could see that, right? No. He got red-faced, as I explained it to him, and he tried to drag out his service pistol. That was a hostile action. So I hit him and knocked out several teeth. For my justifiable self-defense, they tossed me out of the military. They must have partly agreed with my analysis about the lieutenant, because they could have stuck me in Leavenworth. Instead, I was only charged with insubordination and given a dishonorable discharge. Instead of going back to the States, I joined Black Sand, a military security contractor outfit. Supposedly, they didn't wage war, but supplied bodyguards for moneyed people in bad places. I did okay for a year. Then I got in an argument with my superior. Because of ongoing labor disputes, we set up a roadblock and checked papers for our employer, who owned the various company towns in his part of Java. It was an island down there in Southeast Asia, and the area was set amidst 200 square miles of coffee plantation. After three days and six hours of boring duty under some local banana trees, a little brown-skinned beauty pulled up in a jeep at our roadblock. She was a sight. Pretty little hat, red lipstick, and wearing nice white gloves. We'd seen her before. She was visiting her sister, one of the protesting labor leaders, and this girl liked to laugh. My superior, Mike Edwards, couldn't take his eyes off her, and he'd been muttering for days what he'd like to do to her in our shed. His uncle ran black sand on Java, so he thought he could get away with anything. Mike was a big bastard, too, with a big gut, wide face, and mean black eyes. He constantly needed a shave, and there were always taco stains on his shirt. The man was a drunk, and mean drunk this time from too much scotch. Edwards told her to get out of the jeep. Rollo and I glanced at him. We knew her papers were in order. Edwards took a wide stance gripping his gun belt with his thick fingers and dirty fingernails. He liked to feel important, and he shouted at her to hurry it up. She was classy, opened the door slowly and put high-heeled shoes onto the dirt. She had great legs and a short skirt, showing that her ass was as wonderful as the rest of her. Edwards licked his lips, and those piggy eyes shone with lust. I'd seen that look in prison before I bashed faces and broke teeth with my olive jar. Is there a problem? she asked. Not yet, Edward slurred. One of his paws descended onto her wrist, circling it like a fleshy manacle. She gave a little gasp of surprise. Edwards dragged her, and when she tried to dig in her heels, he yanked, making her stumble after him. I'd heard stories about Edwards. He liked to rip off women's clothes, make them scream and press down on them afterward as he indulged himself. In truth, the man was a pig. A big one. A rutting boar of a rapist. Edwards, I said. Bugger off, he told me. I'm busy for a while. What can you do? Rollo whispered to me. His uncle runs the place. If we lift a finger, we'll be in trouble. The little woman with the white gloves peered over her shoulder and gave me a pleading look. Edwards, I said again. He swiveled that wide face of his, stared at me, and spat in my direction. If you're smart, 
He roared with pain because I had stepped up as he spoke to me. I'd grabbed his thumb, the one on the girl's wrist, and twisted hard. That's what made him yell. Then I grinned in his face, twisting harder until he released her delicate wrist. Then my right foot happened to move behind his left heel, and the wallowing pig tumbled backward onto the dirt. Run, I told the woman. Vamoose. She backed away with terror in her eyes, staring at me and then at Edwards. He bellowed from on the ground and unsnapped his holster. I took two steps and kicked. The revolver he drew out of the holster spun into the jungle, the heavy thing slapping banana leaves before thudding somewhere out of sight. Go, I told her, pointing at her car. She hurried to it, slammed the door after getting in, looked once more at me and peeled out as Rollo held up the crossbar. Edwards was a tough guy, and he was used to getting his way, especially in these things. He rose like a ponderous elephant and shook his hurt hand. When he was done with that, he squinted at me, charged, and took his first swing. Rollo told me later that I was grinning crazy-like as Edwards' fists hammered against my ribs. I don't know about that. I let Edwards take several swings, though, before I beat him into unconsciousness. Soon thereafter, I found myself reassigned to Antarctica with these eggheads. Rollo joined me because he hadn't helped Edwards defend himself. Naturally, the uncle hadn't believed our side of the story. Or maybe he had, but didn't care. And that was the fact of my life. The powers that be sticking it to me because of greedy self-interest. It seems like it should have gotten easier, putting up with these injustices. But it never did. In any case, now the wind howled outside in Victoria Land, Antarctica, beating against our building. Rice hunched over the radio set spinning her dial with her glossy red fingernails with the little sparkly swirls. Others re-watched Starship video as if it was their favorite porn, seemingly unable to get enough footage of the destruction. I sat on my chair in a black funk, wishing there was an alien conqueror for me to kill. I debated praying for the first time in years, asking God to send me an alien. The main door swung open then. It felt weird and surreal. Had God heard my thoughts? The idea bemused me. Snow swirled through the open door. It blew between Rollo's long legs as he came in. Nope. No alien. I was disappointed. High in the sky, purple clouds raced like NASCAR madmen shifting into nth gear. Rollo stepped in, and his goggle-protected eyes locked onto me. What? I asked. He opened his mouth, but couldn't seem to speak. I saw confusion in his eyes, like an elk in the headlights. I stood up as my neck tingled. Without thinking, I chambered around. I held my rifle, a good old M14. There were extra magazines and two grenades in my parka pockets. His lips moved, and Rollo said, Aliens. I was already moving toward him. Maybe I sensed what he wanted to say. The others by the radio half-turned, staring at Rollo. I clutched his right triceps and let my fingers dig in painfully. That cleared his eyes. He raised his left arm, pointing up into the swirling sky. Aliens are coming! What are we going to do? With a snarl, I jerked Rollo out of the way and charged outside with my rifle. My disappointment vanished, and my mind became clear. It was payback time. Chapter Two As the wind hit me, I remembered my goggles hanging around my neck. The snowstorm raged, with stinging flakes biting my cheeks. I finally fit the goggles over my eyes, doing it one-handed because I still clutched the M14. Once the lenses were in place, I tilted my head upward into the storm. 
I expected to have to search for the alien ship, a flickering dot moving up, down, and all around. No need. This thing was the size of a jumbo jet minus the wings. It had a box shape, with the front slanted back, no doubt to lessen friction. The giant lander headed toward our shelters. We had three buildings and two high-tech tents. I'll make that one tent now. The new, crazy, messed-up wind had torn down the other one. Just like Rollo, I stood open-mouthed. Freezing flakes of snow landed on my tongue, a few hitting the back of my throat. This was a wild storm. With a click, I snapped my teeth together. Start thinking things through, though, because you're not going to get a second chance. Right. I needed to think. To analyze. But before I could do that, I had to observe. The alien lander moved smoothly. It appeared that the wind didn't buffet it hard enough to sway it from its flight path. Did the extraterrestrials possess anti-gravity? I'd read plenty of science fiction and played sci-fi video games with Rollo. I knew a few things, or thought I did. No, I didn't think they had anti-gravity. I spotted thrusters in back, and jets of flame, like from an F-16 using afterburners. I heard a thunderous roar, too. It was louder than a jumbo jet. I noticed as well that it did have stubby wings, small things, nubs, really, which seemed to wobble the slightest bit. It told me the howling wind did buffet the craft. Somehow, that did it for me, and helped me regain my mental balance. These weren't magical creatures... Arthur C. Clarke had said something about super high-tech appearing as magic to less developed beings. The lander now didn't seem magical to me, but understandable. Another group of thrusters appeared as the lander changed the manner and direction of its descent. The new thrusters sprouted from the bottom of the craft. They roared with flames as the lander came straight down. Swirling flakes melted in the stab of afterburners, and the thunder grew ponderous. I dropped my M-14 onto the snow and clapped gloved hands over my hood-protected ears. The noise was incredible, with the rumbling boom shaking through my body. Despite that, I watched, marveling at the lander. This thing was from another star system. Who knew how many light years away? In it were alien beings. Aliens who had annihilated most of Earth including my dad. I ground my teeth together. This was my chance to hurt them for hurting us. Would it be a useless gesture on my part? I didn't know. Everyone was wired differently. I was a fighter by nature, a counterpuncher, and I believed it was an ominous sign that they were coming down here. Why send a lander near one of the few sets of survivors? It couldn't be for any reasons of kindness, but it must be due to their vicious alien psychology. Yeah, okay. I was ready to duke it out, to bite them on the ankle if I could. After days of wishing for something like this, I was too angry to run away. As it neared, the lander began to look bigger than a jumbo jet. This thing had to be the size of a football stadium, making it gargantuan. That troubled me. What did they use for fuel? I understood some of the alien tech, but we were still the aborigines, the Native Americans or the Indians if you're old school. I'd read a lot of history, mostly in prison, to help me pass the time. When the Europeans went exploring throughout the world, it never went well with the aborigines. If the primitives were too few or too far down the scale of technology, they ended up being annihilated or assimilated. As far as Earth went, it appeared to me that we were like Australia in the 1700s when the British showed up with guns and sailing ships, high-tech for the time. That meant picking off the first alien, shooting him in the head, would achieve little. It would be like the Indians killing Christopher Columbus's rowboat landing crew. It still would have left the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria offshore. Could I hurt these aliens in a more grievous manner? 
I gazed past the lander, past the purple clouds with their red swirls spinning like whirlwinds, and tried to pierce the intervening mists into orbit. Did that mother of a spaceship still sit up there? If so, that's what I needed to shoot down. I snarled because I'd forgotten how to laugh. I felt so helpless. I almost picked up the M14 to empty the magazine against the lander's hull. Why didn't the alien craft launch a missile at us? Were the aliens coming down to hunt the last animals like the Predators had in those old movies? Was I just a big game animal to them? I decided to wait and find out. I could always fire my rifle later. Yeah, what good would that do? I might as well have pissed at the alien craft for all the harm I could do to them. My anger was hard and righteous, but fear kept trickling out of my gut, telling me to run and hide. Sometimes a mouse could survive where a lion died. Rollo stepped up beside me. I glanced at him. He looked over at me with his hands pressed against his ears. I recognized the look. It was the same as when Edwards had dragged the girl toward the shed. What can we do? The answer was not a damn thing. We were ants, fleas. It might have been better if we could have been bacteria or viruses. Wasn't that how H.G. Wells said Earthlings defeated the Martians in War of the Worlds? I watched the lander. What if I could carry a nuclear device inside it, like a suicide bomber? That would destroy it. Yeah. It wasn't indestructible. It wasn't a chariot of the gods. The beings inside were mortal. Otherwise they wouldn't need a spaceship, right? I opened my mouth to help lessen the pressure against my ears. The flames from the thrusters licked out a hundred feet and melted snow on the ground. The lander, the stadium-sized vehicle, blew ice and frozen dirt. Giant struts lowered into place from the bottom of the craft, with huge sleds or skis on the ends. The flames of the thrusters weakened. The noise became bearable, a piercing whine, and the monstrous shuttle thudded onto the earth, causing the ground where I stood to tremble against the soles of my boots. At that point, the fire in the rockets disappeared, and so did the thunderous sounds. Tentatively, I lowered my hands, and Rollo lowered his. I bent to scoop up my rifle. Rollo grabbed my shoulder. Do you think that's wise? Bent over like that, I pondered his question. I could go open-handed to the aliens who had murdered the Earth. I could show them what peaceful, lovable creatures we Earthlings were so they'd spare the last of us. Or I could carry a gun. I could go armed and fight back if the aliens decided they wanted the last Earthers as zoo specimens. They might kill me as too dangerous, but that would be better than becoming their cosmic play toy. I picked up the M14 and temporized because of the trickles of doubt radiating from my gut. I slung the carrying strap over my shoulder. Are you coming? I asked. The lander was about a half mile away. Rollo hesitated. Would you like to huddle in the shelter with them? I asked, jerking a thumb at Rice. The radio operator stuck her head out of the door, with several others standing in the shadows behind her, watching. Do you think it's safe? Rollo asked. No, but who cares? He managed a sickly grin, and he patted his side, telling me he was strapping a pistol. Both of us gulped air, and the two of us marched toward the lander. I felt as if I walked to my gallows, a mouse marching to face a grinning hawk. About halfway there, the thing began unfolding a ramp from its side. They were coming outside. Would they be like the grotesque creatures from the movie Alien? Or maybe like Zergs from StarCraft? Would they be big, little, fast, slow, what? We reached the lander as the end of the ramp clanged against rocky ground. The entrance up at the top of the ramp opened, 
but it remained gray, as if covered somehow. The magnitude of the entrance bothered me. Were these things the size of elephants? Maybe thirty seconds later, a tracked vehicle pushed through the wall, or membrane of the opening. The substance seemed to cling to the tank, like a soap bubble to a finger pushed through it. Why bother with such a membrane? Do you see that? Rollo asked me. The tank or the membrane? I asked. Membrane, he said, as if tasting the word. Yeah, that sounds right. They must use it to keep our atmosphere from rushing into their ship. I raised my eyebrows. Rollo was a bright, geeky guy. Yeah, his idea made sense. The tracked vehicle was the size of an M1 tank, and it began to clatter down the ramp. By my reckoning, it weighed 70 or 80 tons, but it was built along the lines from an Abrams. The alien tank was longer and lower to the ground, and it had a bubble canopy in the middle. A heavy machine-gun-sized turret poked out of the bubble, but I couldn't spy an orifice at the end of the barrel. The U.S. had fired depleted uranium shells from their tanks. Well, the United States was gone. History now. Their tanks had used such shells. I didn't think that little turret fired solid projectiles, though. Likely it projected some kind of beam. It squeals just like our tanks, Rollo observed. He meant the treads. They clanked, squealed, and rattled as the vehicle climbed down the ramp. The treads needed oiling, servicing, which made the alien seem a little less frightening. They had problems just like us. Well, maybe not extinction problems, but you know what I mean. The vehicle reached the snowy ground and turned sharply toward us. The turret lowered until it aimed at our chests. I don't like this, Rollo whispered. I shrugged because I didn't know what to say. The fear in my stomach had grown enough to dampen my former rage. Gripping the rifle strap with one hand, I put the other on my hip and stared at the turret. My feet itched with the desire to run away. My mind told me that was useless. If I ran, the turret could easily track and fry me. No, I'd come this far. Now I'd stick it out in a game of chicken, which I was going to lose in less than thirty seconds. The thought of my coming death revived the anger. I forced myself to study the alien tank, searching for a hatch to force. If I could, I'd rip out all my fingernails trying to pry open a hatch so I could fire one bullet after another into the alien crew. All the while, the tank trundled closer, the heads churning over snow and spitting a muddy-colored spume from the sides. Creed, Rollo said. We gotta move! So move, I said, staring at the tank heading straight for me, hating it the closer it neared. What's standing here gonna prove? he asked. Not a damn thing, I said, with my gaze riveted onto the tank. I was a mouse daring a hawk, and I was about to become squished human. Despite my best efforts to observe, I didn't see a hatch, a way into the tank. I revised my plan then, because it seemed insane to let myself get rolled over. Bite, scratch, do something to hurt them. The open entrance up there on the lander gave me an idea. When I give the word, I said out of the corner of my mouth, Go left. I'll go right. Yeah, Rollo said in a skeptical tone. And then what? Then we circle the tank and sprint for the ramp. What? Why do that? For the best of reasons, I said. We rush up the ramp, storm inside the lander, and kill everyone on board. Then we have ourselves an alien space vehicle. Rollo looked at me. He didn't look scared, but confused. It was enough to cause me to glance at him. Are you crazy? he asked in a voice telling me it was a genuine question. 
Before I could answer, the alien tank squealed to a halt thirty feet from us. At the same moment, the end of the turret glowed with a pink color. Before we could move, a ray beamed in a wide swath, including Rollo and me in its path. I'd played chicken with the aliens and obviously lost. I was sure this is exactly how they'd treated my father. The beam wasn't hot, but it was bright like the sun and seemed to encompass my mind and thoughts. My first instinct, after finding myself alive and on my feet, was to drop to my belly and slither away, but I hesitated. The pink light continued to flood my eyesight, and I found myself blinking rapidly. What in the... in the... It felt as if the beam flipped a dozen switches in my mind, and I became dull-witted as my anger drained away. There was a final moment of panic, and then the feeling evaporated. This entire episode began to feel like a dream. Alien landers, tanks, beams. I grinned. Maybe the aliens would come out and I'd get to meet them. The idea filled me with something approaching giddy excitement. The beam stopped, and I massaged my forehead, even rubbing my eyes. A strange languor gripped me. I felt torpid and more than a little sleepy. Something in the alien tank uncompressed and a blast of noise like a trucker's air brakes. It should have frightened me, or made me flinch, at least. I felt my lips stretching into a smile. I was going to meet creatures from another planet. This was exciting. Lines appeared on the glaciers of the tank. Steam rose from inside as the front part of the vehicle opened like a jackknife, the slab of armor becoming a mini ramp from the tank. Behind it was a blank wall, or what appeared to be another membrane. Something oozed out of the membrane until a humanoid in battle armor, or perhaps a spacesuit, stood at the top of the tank ramp. The being was humanoid in that it possessed two arms and two legs. It also had a long tail. It wasn't a monkey-like tail, but something an upright, walking alligator might have. Sorian, Rollo said in a lazy voice. Huh? I asked, feeling unreal staring at an alien from a distant star system. It's a Saurian, Rollo muttered. Oh, I saw what he meant. The alien had a bubble-like helmet. The creature was a walking lizard, or looked like one, a giant gecko from those insurance commercials. That widened my smile, and for a second I wondered if this Saurian would speak in a British accent. The Saurian had a different gait than we did, walking in a springier manner, and it was smaller, maybe four and a half feet tall. It stalked down the tank ramp, its lizard-like eyes regarding us. Moisture appeared on the inside of its helmet. The thing opened its mouth and a forked tongue flickered. How oh, very interesting. The creature must have pressed a switch somewhere on its suit. Air seemed to blow inside the bubble helmet and the moisture on the inside glass, or whatever the substance was, vanished particle by particle. Perhaps it tasted our air. Rollo cleared his throat, and I had the impression he planned to say something to the Saurian. I'm not exactly sure, but an inner caution, perhaps, dampened by a modicum of my joy. Something seemed different. I'd watched the lander come down, and... and... Wait, I told Rollo. We should try to communicate with him, Rollo said. This is the chance of a lifetime. Yeah, I said, looking at Rollo. He smiled, and his eyes shined with excitement. Did I look like that, too? The pink light? We should greet him and let him know we're safe, Rollo said. Greet him, I thought. Hadn't my dad greeted the aliens earlier? My memories were fuzzy. Yeah, 
I think my dad had gone up in a shuttle and... The memory slammed against me. The aliens had shot a beam of light at my dad, killing him. So why would I grin at this lizard now as if he was a friend? A pink light. The Saurians had just beamed a pink light into our eyes. Had the light played havoc with our minds? Wheels turned in my sluggish, dreamlike thoughts. These aliens were screwing with our minds just as they had messed up our world. No, I wasn't going to play along. Whatever the aliens had just fired at us, my inner rage burned through like a bright welding arc. Rollo must have seen something different on my face. He recoiled from my glare and took a step back. I turned and glared up at the alien, at the saurian bastard with his pink, mind-altering ray. Its eyes flickered back and forth between Rollo and me. It raised a hand, paw, talon, whatever the thing possessed. Something radio-like crackled on its suit. Then it moved its lips. A second later, a synthetic voice issued from a suit speaker. That told me this thing must have a device to take its words and translate them into our language. Sure, its pink beams could alter our moods or thoughts. Clearly, it knew something about human psychology. But the fact that it had to speak meant it could not communicate directly to our minds. The suit speaker must be hooked up to a translator. Both items proved the aliens had studied Earth in the past. Words boomed from it, but whatever it said sounded Russian to me. Why don't you try English, I said. The Saurian watched me closely, and I had the impression it listened to my words in its alien language. The lizard twisted a dial on its suit. Its gloved hand or talon consisted of three claws and what would have to pass for an opposable thumb. The individual claw or finger appeared to have one more joint than our fingers did. The Saurian spoke again. The outer speaker crackled, and it said in English, Do you understand me? Yeah, I said. What do you want? Creed? Rollo warned from behind. You gotta take it easy. They're peaceful. A pressure built up in my chest. I yearned to unlimber my rifle and blow away this world destroyer. It had been a fool to climb out of its tank, trusting in its mind-altering beam. Had they tested it on other humans? Hadn't anyone broken through the beam's quick conditioning before? My indicators show you are radiating emotions, the Saurian told me. How about that, I said. This is good, the Saurian said. Good. The arrogance tripped a wire in me. I slid the strap from my shoulder and gripped the M14 two-handed, pointing the barrel at Mr. Lizard. Creed, don't, Rollo pleaded. They're here to help us. You are an aggressive beast, the Saurian told me. This is excellent. The Jelk will be pleased. I scowled. Who you calling a beast? The Saurian waited before speaking again. Beast, animal, creature, monster. Does the translator not render my meaning into a word you can understand? You think we're monsters? I asked, outraged. My stepdad had called me an animal before. He'd been slapping me as he said it. Some of the guards at prison had told me I was nothing more than a caged beast. One guard in particular who liked nudging convicts with the tip of his baton had told me society should throw away the key and leave us animals to rot in here. I hated cages, confinement, and being treated like scum. I'd had my fill of it. My chest constricted now and my anger tightened into a coil. The alien waited, apparently listening to my words and then thinking about them. Not monsters, it said, but beasts, animals. Yes, 
You are an aggressive beast with a rudimentary language. Training will render you useful to the Jelk. The words struck like slaps to the face. It figured I was a wolf to capture and train. What else could such words mean? No. The aliens wouldn't call him me like a wolf, a wild mustang, or a convict. In its arrogance, the alien before me had made a fatal mistake. The tightened coil in my chest snapped, and rage washed through me. He's not gonna cage me. He almost had me with his pink ray. I shouted profanities at him. I decided to think of the Saurian as male. Not only had the aliens destroyed the Earth, but this one insulted the first human it met and threatened me with capture and beast training. The Saurian recoiled as if I'd struck him. How did his device translate my curses? His demeanor changed. It was obvious. One of his limbs, arms, dropped toward what looked like a gun attached to his spacesuit. It was the last straw. I tucked the M14 stock against my shoulder, aimed and pulled the trigger three times. The first bullet starred the glass of his helmet and knocked him back. The second round made crackling lines so I couldn't see his scaly features as well as before, and the second impact also made him stagger more. The last bullet did the trick, smashing his low forehead and splattering blood and bits of bone inside the glass. Creed, you're insane! Rollo shouted. The alien slid down as if his bones simply dissolved. He crumpled, with his body and suit tumbling down the small ramp and landing on Earth soil. I was in overdrive, blood mad at these murderers. But I also kept my wits, my rationality. I had to finish what I'd started and take out the tank crew. I bolted over the alien and charged up the ramp. The end of the turret glowed pink once more. Maybe the crew planned to give me another dose of its mind-stealing ray. The membrane looked solid ahead of me, but I'd seen the alien move out of it. The tank had moved through a membrane earlier, before it had come down the lander's ramp. I lowered my shoulder and met resistance. Then I powered through the substance. Heat slammed against my face, and the air in here tasted foul and was sticky making my eyes water. Three Saurians sat at various stations. One of them was higher up in the bubble dome. No doubt he was the gunner. They whipped around on their stools to stare at me. One hissed angrily like a snake. Another flicked its tongue at me. Each blasting retort of my M14 was deafening in the confines of the alien tank. The nearest Saurian pitched backward its chest erupting with blood. Methodically, I shot the bastards, careful to use each bullet where I thought it would do the most damage. I had three magazines with me and a lander full of these creatures to kill. It took four bullets to take out these three, meaning I still had some ammo left in the original magazine. As the last shot echoed in my ears, I found myself panting. The stench of their blood clung inside my nostrils. It was a nasty odor. The aliens stank, and they flopped on the floor, acting too much like shot snakes for my peace of mind. Moving as if on autopilot, I shoved a hand into a parka pocket, reassured that I had put two grenades there earlier. These would help in the coming assault. Hisses from several screens and an alarm rang inside the tank. The screen showed alien creatures, likely those remaining in the lander. There were strange symbols or words written on various bulkheads around me. While charging within, I'd had some idea of figuring out how to use the alien tank against the lander. As I looked around, I realized that wasn't going to happen fast enough. It would take too long to figure out their controls. Besides, this seemed like a human netting tank, an alien version of a dog-catching vehicle. They thought of us as beasts or animals. It was better to use what I knew right away, my M14, than to waste time. The initiative in battle counted for a lot. It might be the only thing I had going for me. I turned, readied myself, and burst through the membrane and back into the Antarctica cold. 
Rollo stood at the foot of the tank ramp, with his forty-five Browning in his hand. That was a good sign. He looked confused, though. What happened in there? he asked. You didn't hear anything? I asked. Soft pops, he said. I killed the alien butchers. Why did you do that? he asked. They beamed you with a mind-altering ray, I said. They screwed with your thoughts. They're evil, Rollo. They destroyed our world. Don't you remember watching them kill my dad, Mad Jack Creed? Oh, he said. You're right. We gotta fight back, I said. We gotta take over their lander. I motioned with my hand at the stadium-sized ship. That's crazy, Rollo said. I know it, I said. But now's our only chance. Are you with me? He stared into my eyes, glanced at the dead Saurian, keeping his gaze there for two seconds, and then stared up into my eyes again. He nodded. Rollo was a good man. I took a breath of pure, clean earth air. It felt cold in my mouth, like the best spearmint. I'd overcome their mind ray and killed some of the world slayers. Now it was time to take out more and capture a lander if I could. Chapter 3 I led the way, with the sound of snow crunching under my boots. We had to move fast and keep attacking in order to keep the aliens off balance. They must have figured we Earthers were faint-hearted creatures, ready to wilt for the first master race aliens to come along. They were learning differently now. Why did the Saurian come outside its tank? Rollo asked. What? I said. I don't know, to, to capture us, I guess. It called us beasts. And that was reason enough to kill him? Rollo asked. Hey, I said. The alien beamed our minds, right? And then he went for his weapon. Besides, I don't need any more reason than this. His kind nuked our world. They declared war on us, not the other way around. After that, he wants to talk to us while we're smiling idiots? No, I don't think so. I stepped onto the larger lander ramp and saw a space-suited Saurian appear up top. The lizard had a long gizmo in its hands, or talons. The device looked like a long-barreled rifle. Charging up the ramp, I fired from the hip. That didn't make for the most accurate shooting. My first bullet missed and wanged off the hull of the lander, creating a spark. The Saurian ducked. Then it seemed to think again, gained resolve, and stepped forward, aiming its gizmo down at me as if it was a long Kentucky flintlock. My second bullet caught a hand. The Saurian opened its mouth and let out a shrill hiss. It dropped the alien rifle. This time it took two bullets to do the trick, cracking the bubble helmet and pumping lead into the face. I hadn't stopped panting from my fight aboard the tank. Instead of weird alien stenches and atmosphere, now I was tired from sprinting up the long ramp. The Antarctica cold freeze-burned my throat as if I'd swallowed an ice cream cone. I could hear Rollo behind me, gasping for air. The top of the ramp proved flat, and the membrane opening into the lander meant I couldn't see what was on the other side. Take his weapon, I said, using the M14's barrel to point at the alien gizmo. I've been thinking, Rollo told me. We might have made a mistake. Here on the ramp, we were at least fifty feet high. The top of the lander might be another one hundred and fifty feet above us. The thing was massive. These lizards nuked our world, I shouted. They sprayed something afterward that makes penguins spit black gunk. Then they tried to capture us. This is our one chance. We have to grab it and do the best we can. But capture a whole ship? Rollo asked. Once it's ours, we fly to an army base and pick up more soldiers. Then we head into space and see if we can capture the Big Daddy spaceship. That's just crazy, Rollo said. There's no way we can pull that off. You got a better idea, I asked. Or do you want to be one of the trained beasts? 
He blinked at me several times, apparently trying to process the ideas. Maybe the pink ray still messed with his thinking. Take the alien rifle, I said. Start figuring out how it works. You're the tech guy, the computer geek, so you should be able to do that. Rollo blinked one more time. Then he holstered the forty-five, nodded stubbornly, to himself, I think, and picked up the long gizmo. I dragged my upper teeth across my lip, trying to psych myself up to charge inside and wreck what mayhem I could. Would the aliens use poison gas on us inside their vessel? Did their atmosphere hold treacherous elements that would render us unconscious in several minutes? I had no clever ideas now. No big plans other than shooting aliens until I ran out of bullets. Then I'd use my bowie knife and find out how strong these lizards were. Here we go, I said. Expecting the worst, I ran at the membrane and dove. I hit the barrier low and burst into a large gym-sized chamber. It had three more alien tanks waiting. Crews climbed into them through the front. I didn't have time to see more of the chamber, although five Saurians with long rifles marched toward the outer entrance. They wore spacesuits, but without helmets. At the sight of me, they unlimbered their weapons and fired a volley. Every one of the lizards aimed too high. It was the reason I'd instinctively dived through and come in low. The long rifles shot finger-sized projectiles that sizzled through the air. Each alien bullet or grenade hit the membrane behind me, plowing through, but not before shorting the barrier, destroying it in some fashion. The howling Antarctica wind swirled into the lander. None of the firing Saurians wore helmets. Some of the tank crews stared in what I'd swear was horror at the lost membrane. Was Earth air bad for them, as Rollo had suggested earlier? Rollo crawled through the burst opening, swinging his alien rifle wildly. Here, I said. I'd crawled to a box of some kind for cover. Rollo saw me, and he aimed the long gizmo, pressing a button. The alien rifle discharged another of those finger-sized grenades that sizzled as it flew. It struck near an open tank and detonated. Sizzling lines of electricity, or something like electricity, felled the nearest lizards. A savage sound of laughter tore out of my throat. How I'd wished for a moment like this during the last several days. I began aiming carefully, shooting aliens. Some scrambled to get away from me and out of this chamber of death. Others rushed into their tanks. One of the tank ramps began to close into the front glacis. I stood up, took out a hand grenade, yanked the pin. It tinkled against the alien floor and hurled the explosive like a fastball. The grenade flew into the vehicle. I heard it explode as the ramp eased into the glacis. We're doing it! I shouted. I scooped up my M14, tore out the spent magazine, and slapped in another. Some of the lizards had sprinted for an opening deeper in the chamber. I headed that way. Come on, Rollo! I shouted. We raced through the gym-sized compartment. None of the canopies on the alien tanks had begun moving yet. No engines revved, nor did turret guns beam their mind-screwing rays. We'd caught them by surprise. A fierce elation filled me. It was impossible to conquer the lander. Or it should have been impossible. But why not try? Cortez had conquered Aztec Mexico against impossible odds. If nothing else, I could win this lander. Figure out the controls and ram the alien starship. We'd make them feel some pain for trying to annihilate humanity. I found out that a sprinting human was faster than a Saurian in a suit. None of the five who had fired at us made it out of the chamber. The last one twitched and flopped in death near the rear exit, with the back of his lizard head a gory ruin. This one possessed a similar hand weapon on its belt as the first Saurian I'd shot outside. I pried off the weapon. It was similar to a flare gun. I'd need something once I ran out of bullets, so I unzipped my parka and tucked the alien gun against my belt. Despite the ruptured outer membrane and storming weather, it stayed hot in here. Scan left. I'll look right, I said, meaning once we forced our way through the next membrane. 
Go, Rollo said. He understood my meaning. We pushed through the membrane and found ourselves in a large corridor going both right and left. There were no Saurians in sight, but a blast of heat and alien stench staggered each of us. The walls weren't smooth steel, but had fuzzy growths on them, like alien moss. The more I learn about Saurians, the more I hate them, I said. What do we do now? Rollo asked. That was a good question. We had to keep attacking. That was the answer. Follow me, I said. I strode right, hurrying along the corridor. Some of the aliens made it into the tanks back in the last chamber, Rollo said, running after me. I know. We have to find this ship's control room fast. You can't be serious. Did you see the size of this ship? Finding the control room could take hours. We killed some of them, Rollo. They're going to want vengeance against us. Hard vengeance. The only thing left for you and me is to take down as many of these world destroyers as we can. We're walking dead men. The sooner you believe that, the better off you'll be. He grew quiet, and a change came over his face. A grim seriousness. You're right. They destroyed twenty cities in atomic fireballs and dusted us with their bioweapon. I wonder why they beamed us, though, and then sent out a Saurian to talk to us. The answer came a minute later. Loud alarms or klaxons sounded. It made the hair stir on my neck. We turned right at an intersection and found another gym-sized chamber. This opening lacked a membrane. Rows of glass cylinders filled a quarter of the area in back. There were also two bulldozer-sized vehicles. Instead of a blade, each had a backhoe-like crane. And instead of a bucket, the ends possessed a clamp or a lobster-like claw. Each gripped an upright cylinder. Creed? Rollo said. Do you see what's inside those? My mind had focused on the vehicles and the room as I searched for Saurians. Now I glanced at the nearest cylinder. My breath caught in my throat, and a sick feeling welled out from my stomach. A naked man stood in the nearest cylinder. He had his palms pressed against the glass and smacked against it several times. I noticed his face. He had his mouth open, and it looked as if he was shouting. The thick glass deadened his voice so I couldn't hear what the man was saying. Seeing this, the Saurians had already been elsewhere on the planet, using their pink rays on others. If I hadn't overcome the peaceful feeling earlier and killed the lizard on the tank ramp, I'd likely be in a glass tube right now. Both Rollo and I would be moths in a jar. I raised my rifle, aiming at the lower part of the cylinder. I was going to shoot the man out of there. Creed! Rollo shouted in warning. They're behind us! I spun around and saw them. Three ugly Saurians in some sort of battle armor. These three didn't wear bubble helmets, but metal things with dark visors. I'd watched enough sci-fi movies to recognize combat suits. These three looked like tiny versions of mech warriors. The sight of the naked man in the cylinder filled me with loathing. I thought of Nazi experiments and what these aliens were going to do to us now. To them, we were beasts, just big game animals to hunt and mount back at home. I was going to teach them differently. I sprinted for the nearest backhoe-like vehicle. Rollo, I noticed, had already ducked out of sight behind one. He'd been closer to them. The three Saurians acted more aggressively than the lizards in the first chamber. These seemed more like soldiers. One of them aimed a heavy pistol, more like a flare gun, and fired a slow-moving projectile. I dove and rolled, trying to get away. The projectile turned out to be an electrical shock grenade, which hit the floor nearby, and I heard a sharp sizzling sound. Something like a pumped taser struck my left hip, jolting me. Then I rolled behind a Saurian vehicle and out of the grenade's radiating range. I slithered across the floor. My left leg was numb from the electrical impulse, and it didn't respond as well now. 
the three lizard mechs clanked toward me, sounding like something from an Iron Man movie. I strove to get up, to see what was happening. I couldn't let the lizards beat us now. They would surely torture us, or do other unspeakable things to Rollo and me for killing their kind. Rollo fired, with the sound of his forty-five loud in the chamber. His bullet wanged off alien armor, leaving a tiny dent. Their weapons made softer, popping sounds, and more mini-grenades flew. Two of them hit the vehicles on their side, and electric blue sizzling lines clawed over the top of my backhoe-like machine, flickering with color. I stepped back so I wasn't touching the vehicle. The last grenade sailed overhead and landed among tubed men and women. I twisted my neck to see what happened. Like a medusa of blue sizzling snakes, the electrical lines writhed wildly from the landed grenade, stroking the nearest tubes, but having no effect on the wide-eyed occupants inside. I noted the shock grenade's limited range. This must be more of their man-catching tech. I had to do something before the three of them clanked around my vehicle. From on the floor, I grabbed my left thigh and struggled upright onto one leg, leaning against the vehicle. Past the folded crane, I spied a saurian mech, took deliberate aim and fired three quick shots at the one piece of his equipment that looked vulnerable, the visor. The last bullet did the trick, and the targeted saurian staggered backward with a shattered visor and hopefully a gory, ruined face. He crashed onto the floor. A good sign. I ducked away and switched to my final magazine. There's one coming around to your right! Rollo shouted. I used my last grenade, tossing it up and over the vehicle onto the other side. The crump of the explosion and rattle of shrapnel against alien battle armor told me this was my chance. I wanted to roar like a berserk Viking. Instead... Silently psyching myself up as I used to do in Afghanistan, I forced myself around the vehicle. The Saurian still staggered, maybe from the force of the grenade's concussion. Hey, I said, to get his attention. He looked up. It seemed like a reflexive move. From point-blank range, I fired three times. Shards of visor and then drops of alien blood struck me as ricocheting bullets whined. He toppled back like a felled redwood, slamming against the deck plates. The last mech lifted his weapon, aiming at me from ten feet away. He would have killed me, or shocked me into a taser-like submission, but Rollo intervened. Despite his lanky frame, he could be like greased death at the oddest moments. This was one of those times. From behind the mech, Rollo charged and clambered up the Saurian's back, sticking the barrel of his browning against the visor. Blam, blam, blam! The creature from the stars ate it, and almost took Rollo down with him. My best friend roared and ripped himself loose from the mech's grip. Then he rolled across the floor as the Saurian soldier clanged to the deck in death and defeat. We'd won another encounter, but the ship's alarm still rang and I was down to half a magazine of bullets. We had to think of something else, or soon we'd be inside those tubes with the others. Chapter 4 We couldn't have much time left before the next enemy wave struck. It was move now or forever be an alien slave. Running away didn't seem like an option. They'd just hunt us down in the snowy wasteland of Antarctica. We had to go for the throat, for mastery of the lander. We needed more people, and we discovered a room full of them, if we could open the glass tubes. I checked the dead mechs for a useful smashing tool. I couldn't find one at first, but I did find something that looked interesting. I pulled off a half-moon curved blade from one of the dead aliens. Maybe it was the Saurian version of a bayonet. Come on, I told Rollo. Give me a hand. The nearest man inside a standing tube had a crew cut, a sweeping black mustache, and wide Slavic features. He was muscular, sported a Z tattoo on his right shoulder, and looked tough. Given that the Saurian had first tried to speak to us in Russian, I gave it high odds that the man in there was from that area of the world. He banged on his tube from the inside, yelling silently. 
I held up the curved knife and chipped at the cylinder. The blade scratched the glassy surface, but that was it. Wait a minute, Rollo said. I have a faster way. Like a kid, he climbed up and jumped into what must have been the driver's seat of the backhoe-like vehicle. As I'd said, the vehicle had a small crane with a clamp or claw holding the man-sized cylinder. The other cylinders stood upright in floor slots, as if they were high school test tubes for a science class. Rollo began experimenting, pressing buttons and pulling levers. The ship's alarm stopped, then, which seemed ominous making it much too quiet. What were the aliens going to do next? Were they worried, calling for backup, or getting ready to storm in here with more mechs? As I wondered, growing more nervous, the backhoe-like vehicle purred into life. Stand back, Rollo told me. I stepped away from the upright cylinder. The man inside the tube twisted around, looking in alarm at Rollo. The crane proved more flexible than a backhoe. It was like one of the tentacles from War of the Worlds. Showing his aptitude for such things, Rollo soon laid the cylinder on the floor lengthways. Good thinking, I said. Rollo didn't even nod in acknowledgement. He was too busy concentrating. I suspect he knew the odds and our desperation. The single big claw gripping the tube began squeezing. Then Rollo took his hands off the vehicle's controls. What's wrong? I asked. I want to shatter the tube, Rollo said. But what if I end up cutting the man inside? Just get him out, I said. We can worry about wounds later. Rollo took a moment and then went back to the controls. Soon the claw made grinding noises, and suddenly the glass shattered, with shards falling onto the floor. Stop! I shouted. The claw stopped. I rushed forward and used the curved blade to pry away chunks of glass. Are you okay? I asked the trapped man inside. He blinked at me. Can you hear me? I asked. I wondered on his mental state. You are American, he said with a Russian accent. Yup, I said. Are you Russian? No. I'm Dmitry Rostov, from Zaporizhia. Where? I asked. Zaporizhia, he said. It is in the Ukraine. You're Ukrainian? No, he said vehemently. I'm a Zaporizhian Cossack. I'd heard of Cossacks. Hard-riding, freedom-loving people from the steppes or plains of Russia and the Ukraine. They were supposed to be good fighters. Most people knew them as those acrobatic dancers who squatted low, folded their arms on their chests, and vigorously kicked out their legs. You were part of the old Soviet Union, right? I asked. Not anymore, he said. Now hurry! Get me out of here! We're working on it. I pried out a big glass chunk, nicking a finger so blood oozed, and finally I cleared away for him. You'll have to slither out, I said. I gave him a hand, and soon a stark naked Dmitry Rostov, the Zaporizhian Cossack, stood beside me. He was a solid, muscular man, shorter than my 6'3", and he looked angry and ready to do something about it. Did they use a pink ray on you? I asked. On all of us, he said. Now we must hurry and flee the ship. We're not fleeing, I said. We're going to hijack this thing and attack the big mother of a starship upstairs. Dimitri's eyes gleamed as a wild smile creased his face. Yes, he shouted. We attack. We kill the lizards. I agree. Saurians. Rollo said from the driver's seat. He used the flexible crane and claw to pluck another cylinder from the floor rack. He was in the process of laying the tube lengthways. We're calling the aliens Saurians, Rollo said. Dimitri nodded. It is good to name the enemy. Saurians. Yes, 
I approve. Now we must free the rest of the men and women before the aliens bring reinforcements. Are the others here Russians, Ukrainians, or Cossacks? I asked. I am the only Cossack here, Dmitri said. We are from the Russian base at Vostok, near the South Pole. Many of these people are former army soldiers. They are not Cossacks, but they should fight once I tell them your plan. He stroked his outrageous mustache. What is your plan? Do you see those dead Saurians on the floor? I asked. Yes, I see, he said. You're a clever fighter. I applaud you. That's what I'm going to do to the rest of the Saurians aboard the lander, I said. Afterward, that's what I'm going to do to the rest on the starship that started this. That is a good plan, Dimitri said. An excellent plan. You also have more guns, yes? Rollo cracked the next tube. As I began prying out shattered chunks of glass, I said, Nope, I'm almost out of ammo. We need more weapons. Maybe these alien long rifles and flare pistols will do. Anything in a storm, Dimitri said. His eyes gleamed then, and he grinned viciously. I wondered what the pink ray had done to his mind. Do you know the aliens have star armor? He said. As we talked, we helped out the next man. I didn't answer Dimitri's question because I was too busy talking to the new man. Unfortunately, he didn't speak any English. So Dimitri rattled off some quick instructions to him in Russian. With the claw, Rollo reached for the next tube. I pointed at the dead mechs. You mean that kind of armor? That star armor? That is steel, Dimitri said. Mechanized body armor similar to what Russian and American soldiers use, or will use, in fifteen years. There's no Russia or America left, I said. Dimitri stared at me, and he grimaced. I don't know what he was thinking. Had he been married? Had he lost children? A wife? Surely his parents, aunts, uncles, or cousins? He looked up at the ceiling, and muscled cords stood up on his neck. A choked, grieving noise came from him once. He shook his head, then swallowed, and he stared at me with shining eyes. We need guns, he said in a hoarse voice. Yeah, we need guns, I agreed. But we don't dare leave the ship to get more. The Saurians would seal all the hatches then and we'd never get back on board. No. This is our one chance to hurt the enemy and we have to make the most of it. Dimitri breathed deeply and he said, They tested us before. Tell your friend to stand lookout in the corridor, I said. We don't want the lizards to surprise us. Yes, Dimitri said. That is wise. You think like a general. He grabbed his Russian friend by the triceps and spoke rapidly. The naked Russian picked up an alien long rifle and hurried to the entrance. The man had a bloody gash on his back. Getting out of the tubes proved troublesome, but the Russian hadn't complained. As I've said earlier, the tough and mean humans had survived the alien onslaught. These men and women in the tubes hadn't been idle. They must have kept their eyes open. From careful observation, they appeared to know how to use the alien weaponry. Whatever the pink ray did to a human mind wasn't lasting, at least. Dimitri and I pried out glass from yet another tube. Rollo worked faster now, having gotten the hang of the crane and claw. They tested us earlier, Dimitri told me. I heard you the first time, I said. The aliens have no soul. They're thorough bastards. I believe the... What did you call them? Dimitri asked. You had a name for aliens. Saurians! Rollo shouted from the vehicle. We're calling them Saurians! That is a good name, Dimitri said. It makes them sound evil. And they are, my friend. 
The Saurians want humans for a reason. Like the old Russians did with the Cossacks. The aliens wish humans to be soldiers for them. I only half heard, Dmitri. His accent made it hard sometimes to know what he was saying. The fighting, the bad air in here, fatigue, maybe some of the after-effects of the pink ray all combined to dull my thoughts. Realizing that worried me. Were we thinking straight? I couldn't afford any mistakes. What had Dmitri just said? Something about the Saurians making us soldiers. No, I said. Not soldiers. The Saurians think we're beasts. No one is making me a convict again. Beasts! Animals! Yes! Dimitri shouted. The aliens tested some of us in a horrible manner. Several people died because of them. Two test subjects. I know the reason for the buzzing weapons. The Cossacks excitable. I frowned, trying to follow his words. Buzzing weapons? Oh, yeah, the alien projectiles act like taser grenades. Listen, my American friend, Dmitri said. I spoke to Ella Timoshenko about the tests. We spoke before the Saurian sealed us in the tubes. Ella is scientist. She's very smart and observant. Do you have a point? I asked. Yes, Dmitri said. I must show you. You are the general. You will know what we need to do about the star armor. Show me what? I asked. Then I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I turned and spied a naked woman. She was thin, with perfectly shaped breasts. She blinked in the manner of someone missing her glasses and had short brunette hair. Her eyes were sharp, and intelligence shone there. She noticed my scrutiny. She folded her arms before her breasts, glared at me, and spoke harshly in Russian. Dmitri protectively stepped in front of her, blocking my sight, and he spoke urgently to her. I suppose that was Ella Timoshenko. For a scientist, heck, for any woman, she had lovely tits and nice legs. I noticed Ella shaking her head as she spoke to Dmitri. The Cossack turned to me. Ella says we have no chance against the aliens. She says we should run away. Do you want to run, Dmitri? Do you want to let the aliens win? I am a Cossack. We have always fought, and we will always fight. I am with you, my general. But Ella, she is smart. I'm afraid we will lose in the end. Everyone dies, I said. So everyone loses in the end. That is not what the priests say, Dmitri said, about losing in the end. But you are right in saying we all die. It's living free that counts, I said, standing your ground when the alien tries to cage you. You must see the star armor, my general. I'm sure it will help us. I could get used to Dmitri. Rollo, I said, have one of those Russians work the crane. We have to keep attacking. We can't wait around for the aliens to make their next move against us. We have to keep surprising them until we win. Rollo didn't bother talking to the freed Russians. He jumped off the machine and grabbed one of the few alien weapons left. He must have noticed that the Russians were quick to arm themselves. Instead of one of the men, Ella Timoshenko climbed into the crane's control chair. She was nimble for a scientist. And those breasts. I looked away. As more Russians crawled out of the cracked tubes, they began working in shifts with the other backhoe-like vehicle. Its engine sounded like a buzzsaw and thumped from time to time. I wasn't sure how long it would run. I'd say we had forty people altogether, with seven free of the tubes so far. We're going to keep attacking, I told Dmitri. But we have to keep them off balance, I said. No, Dmitri said. Listen to me. You are a great fighter. You have killed aliens, and I don't know of anyone else who has done such a thing. I am forever in your debt. 
But you must see the star armor. Yeah, you talked about that. But I'm thinking... General, listen to me, please. Ella called it symbiotic armor. A living tissue mutated or grown for humans. What? I asked. Yes, Dimitri said. Now you're listening. You must come with me. I show you this thing. It makes more sense once you see it. I believe the Saurians made a critical mistake. By their translated words earlier, the lizards figured we humans were beasts, animals, or monsters. Wrong. We were thinking people, using every faculty to figure out what was going on. That included the trapped Ukrainians, Russians, and Cossack. Many of them were scientists, trained observers. Others had been former Russian soldiers. According to Dmitri, the Saurians had been conducting tests on them for two days already. One of those tests had included symbiotic armor, a kind of second skin for combat use. Why had the Saurians been testing the people? Dmitri said Ella had a theory, but the savant Ella Timoshenko had remained in the tube chamber to free the rest of the Russians. I'm not sure she liked me. Rollo, Dmitri, and I hurried down a corridor. Rollo had his forty-five and an alien long rifle. Dimitri carried the grenade pistol I'd picked up earlier, and I had my M-14. Dimitri lacked clothes or shoes of any kind, but it didn't seem to bother him. The heat caused him to sweat, so he left wet footprints on the floor. The muggy air made our clothes soggy, and I kept shaking my head to fling sweat out of my eyes. The alien stench in the ship atmosphere had begun making me dizzy. I longed for good old fresh earth air. We're going to need water soon, I said, to keep us hydrated. There's plenty of snow outside, Rollo told me. Getting cold feet, I asked. Most definitely, he said. This lander freaks me out, and these corridors with their fuzzy walls. They're aliens, all right. It makes my gut clench every time I think about it. Why did the Saurians ever come here? This way, Dimitri said, pointing into a narrower corridor. Are you sure? I asked. The corridor looked darker, like an alien cave I didn't want to go down. Dimitri grimaced. For the past two days, I have watched everything they do cataloging each horror committed on us. I am sure. I didn't like it, but I motioned for Dimitri to keep going. He soon led us before another membrane. I'm a little tired of going through those, Rollo said. So was I, but I clutched my rifle and charged through. In my opinion, we'd run out of time. We'd been taking too long. I plopped through into an oven of a chamber that hit my face like a hellish brick. The room was one-third the size of the tube chamber. The back wall glowed orange with heat. I spied four raised pads near the wall with a blob of a shiny black substance on each of them. To my horror, the blobs oozed back and forth, the surface making rippling movements. Two long tables stood on the left side of the room. On each table lay a dissected human, with his or her chest cavity and stomach laid open. The corpse faces showed rigid horror and pain. What is this place? I asked. Rollo swore quietly in outrage. I glanced at my friend and then looked to the right where he stared. Three tall tubes filled with a green solution stood from floor to ceiling. Each of the cylinders contained a dead woman, with a hundred tiny wires connected to her. I vowed to save the last bullet and use it on myself. I wouldn't let myself be taken by these aliens and have things like that done to me. Yesterday, Dimitri said in a low voice, Ella and I were in here. I knew those people. Dimitri shook his head and spoke in an even lower whisper. 
Isaurians are vile beings from the stars. They conducted experiments. Ella and I... Dimitri stared at me with smoldering eyes. We wore the symbiotic armor. It was strange. Ella understood, though. In the past, she has often made intuitive leaps of understanding. I think she is psychic, or maybe even telepathic. What? I said. Ella knew, Dimitri said. She told me the Saurian plan. If you knew the reason why we were in Antarctica... Go on, I said. Because why? It does not matter now, Dimitri said. Those are your answer, he said, pointing at the rippling black blobs on the pads. We put those on and attack the aliens. Those will give us our chance. What in the hell is he talking about? Rollo asked me. That was a good question. Dimitri had to be among the whitest persons I'd ever seen. Canadians and Russians. No one could be as white as them. Now, however, Dimitri went even whiter. Swayed and might have toppled. I caught his right arm, steadying him. He swallowed several times. I don't want to do this, he whispered. But Cossacks fight to the end. We always fight. Are you okay? I asked. You know you're not making much sense, right? Dimitri pulled free of me. Like a stone zombie, he moved to the hot wall with the four blobs. Rollo sidled up to me, whispering. I think the Saurian scrambled his brains. I was tempted to agree, but the last few days had shifted my thinking about a lot of things. Maybe it helped that I'd read so much science fiction as a kid and watched every SF movie I could. I was used to strange concepts and weird ideas. Rhode Island-sized spaceships, death spores, saurians, and the greatest nations on Earth demolished in the space of a half hour? Why couldn't Ella have psychic flashes of understanding? The saurians had used a pink ray on our minds. Why couldn't our side have an advantage or two? Great. Do you see that? Rollo asked, with loathing in his voice. Dmitri Rostov reached one of the black blobs. Using both hands, he grabbed the jelly-like substance and heaved the thing off its pad, dumping the mass onto the floor where it quivered. Then he did the craziest thing. He stepped onto it with both feet. His feet disappeared into the blob, so he sank up to his ankles. He had a blood-oozing scratch on the inner left ankle on the ball joint. Then the slimy blob oozed up onto his legs, coating his flesh with the gooey black substance. Dimitri! I shouted. Be calm, my friends, he said, with his palms held outward toward me. I have done this before. This is the symbiotic armor, the living second skin. Ella believes these creatures were genetically engineered for human use. That thing is alive? Rollo asked. Oh, yes, Dimitri said. It is warm, and it feeds off our sweat. More of the blob oozed up Dimitri's legs. The stuff reached his knees and continued to climb like slime toward his waist. Is that what killed those people on the tables? Rollo asked, indicating the dissected corpses. I do not know, Dimitri said. Possibly. I swallowed hard. What I saw sickened me, but our backs were against the proverbial wall. Maybe we were Earth's last chance. Who else had fought their way onto an alien lander? I was almost out of bullets, and the aliens must be radioing for backup. I'd watched these beings murder my father. They'd nuked humanity practically out of existence. Now Dimitri said this was living armor. One of my player characters had worn living armor before in a role-playing game. I understood the concept of living armor. It was much different seeing it, though. A lot different.
different. How much can I trust Ella Timoshenko? But no, maybe that was the wrong way to look at this. The better question was how much chance of victory did I have? In truth, I, we, had no chance at all against the aliens. If this stuff was living armor, and if it gave me some kind of advantage, but I don't know what it would give a person. What do you mean this is armor? I asked. What does it do for you? It amplifies your strength, Dimitri said. It also gives you energy and can harden its outer surface to deflect or stop certain kinds of attacks. Come on, guys, let's get out of here, Rollo pleaded. The black substance flowed up Dimitri's waist, past his belly button, and reached his shoulders when the first Saurian stepped through the membrane. I must have figured in the back of my mind that the Russians would race here and give us warning if the Saurians launched the next assault. What I failed to grasp was that the lizards didn't need to go past the Russians first. I should have realized there were many different ways to move about the ship. As foolish as it sounds on our part, the Saurians caught us by surprise. One after another, lizards rushed into the room. Many gripped a half-moon curved blade similar to that I'd taken off a mech lizard earlier. A wet green substance glistened along the edges of their blades. The first Saurian cut Rollo across the shoulder. My friend shouted in pain and surprise and threw himself away from the Saurian. As Rollo moved, his feet tangled and he tripped. I spun around and shot the nearest lizard in the face, the one going for me. I kept firing from the hip, taking down more. I backpedaled, shot another alien, and saw a Saurian crouch beside Rollo. My friend had stiffened strangely. The lizard held one of those curved knives, and it looked as if the Saurian planned to cut Rollo's throat. I aimed, pulled the trigger, and my rifle clicked empty. I was out of bullets. Croaking a desperate noise, Rollo finally managed to move, kicking feebly but not nearly hard enough. The half-moon curved blade came down, and it might have cut Rollo's throat and ended existence for my friend. Before that happened, a black-coated humanoid joined the fray. The thing punched the Saurian in the head. The creature catapulted off its three-toed talons and smashed against another of its kind. The two tumbled into a heap. I realized the black humanoid was Dimitri. The blob of symbiotic armor covered him from toes to just under his chin, leaving his head free. A fierce joyfulness twisted Dimitri's features into something unholy. Clearly, he liked wearing the armor, and he liked fighting. With amplified strength and heightened speed, Dimitri moved among the remaining Saurians. They cut at him, but could not penetrate the armor. They fired their weapons, and they died. I saw it. I can testify to the truth of what occurred. Several lizards slammed against bulkheads and crumpled to the floor. Others simply toppled down and flopped like snakes, with Dimitri's blows hitting them like jackhammers. Then it was over. This wave of seven or eight Saurians failed, just as their previous efforts had. How many lizards were aboard the lander, anyway? Watching Dimitri in this horror show, I was beginning to believe we could actually win. Earlier, I'd figured, what better way to end life than to go down swinging? Now? Now I began to think we might really hijack the ship. Do you finally believe me? Dimitri asked. I would have answered, but I saw Rollo. The curved blade had sliced into his shoulder. There was a little blood, but not enough to cause what I was seeing. Rollo seemed to have frozen into immobility. The foul Saurians must have envenomed their blades with a paralyzing drug. They didn't fight fair, that's for sure. I feared for my friend. I had to do something for him, fast. Chapter 5 Dimitri had the answer for Rollo, but I didn't like it. I saw the loathing in Rollo's eyes and knew he positively hated the suggestion. But I had to do something for him. 
Before I subjected my friend to this alien horror, I figured I should try it first. Tell me one thing, I told Dimitri. Are you still sane? The Zaporizhian Cossack paused before answering the question. You are human, right? I asked. Dimitri grinned wryly. I hesitate to answer because the living armor must lace chemicals into me through my skin. When I fought just now, I felt good. Yes, I am sane, but I believe it makes me want to fight when I wear the armor. Ella said yesterday that the symbiotic creature seemed biosculpted for us. What did she mean by that? I asked. How do you Americans say it? Dimitri mused. Bioengineered, yes. The creature was bioengineered for our use. So you think the Saurians have been studying humanity for some time? I asked. It seems self-evident, yes, my general. I'm not a general, I said. I'm just an American grunt who used to work for Black Sand. Dimitri looked crestfallen. But I'll keep fighting, I said. I'll lead us to the end. He nodded, grinning at me. I took a deep breath, with a hot alien air burning down my throat. It reminded me of the worst smoggy day in L.A. when I'd played basketball in high school. I felt like I'd been drowning after a while, each breath painful in my throat. While wearing the symbiotic armor, Dimitri had just fought like Superman or the Hulk. I'd like to do that. But did I trust a blob of living armor, a creature that would flow onto me like a second skin? What if it covered my face? That would obviously suffocate me. According to Ella, the mystic Russian scientist with the nice breasts, the Saurians had bioengineered the armor for humans. The aliens are too strong, Dimitri said. You have no choice, my... I glanced at him. I had lots of choices, as long as I didn't mind losing. With a roar of frustration, I tore off my parka, shirt, and unlaced my boots. In seconds, I stood naked in the chamber. This was crazy. I felt like a lunatic. What drove me in the end was the fact that humanity had nearly been exterminated. To come back from the edge of extinction, someone had to do something. The dissected corpses on the table and the dead floating in the tubes meant I had to grab this chance. In my humble opinion, we were dead otherwise. Naked. With my heart pounding, I approached a quaking, quivering blob on a raised pad. The living armor hadn't come from Earth, but from some lab in the stars. The Saurians sure hadn't worn this stuff to help them tackle us. That should have warned me, right? With serious distrust riding on my shoulders, I grabbed the substance. It was warm like a fresh pancake, and it pulsed as if it had a heart rate. I heaved, lifted it off the pad, and plopped it onto the floor. Then I stepped onto the squishy blob. Now it was my turn to watch it slither and ooze onto my skin. The stuff was warm, and watching it creep up my legs nearly freaked me out. I wanted to howl and leap away, scraping this gunk off with my knife. I felt something then. The armor's displeasure. The advance halted. You must accept it, Dimitri said. I believe it senses negative emotions. That was just great. This stuff was like a dog that knew when you were afraid. I tried to take a calming breath. It didn't work because of the smogginess and the stench of the alien atmosphere. Sweat pooled on my skin and a bout of claustrophobia threatened to steal my logical processes. I was seconds away from howling. I glanced at Rollo, sprawled on the deck plates. If this didn't work, I don't know what we were going to do. I couldn't lug him out of the lander. This latest Saurian assault showed the lizards hadn't given up. 
If nothing else, they could simply take off and return to the mothership. That would end our chances. We had to do something now, or it wouldn't matter. You gotta relax, Creed, I told myself. Yeah, relax, as I was engulfed by living alien technology. I focused on my old man. Mad Jack could have done this. He would try anything experimental. If I wanted to raise a tombstone to my dad, I had to beat the Saurians. I had to accept this slime. Hey, I told the blob. I love you. This is the best thing that ever happened to me. You gotta turn me into the Hulk and we'll stomp the shit out of these Saurians, okay? They must have agreed, because the dark substance started oozing again, climbing my skin and enfolding me in warmth. This sensation wasn't like the alien heat. As the second skin relaxed against my epidermis, I felt a good warmth. I felt comfortable. That decreased my tension, my anxiety, and that speeded the process. How does it know not to cover my mouth? I asked Dimitri. He shrugged. Oh, yeah, that helped. Not. I grinned at Rollo because I noticed he was watching me. His skin had a touch of green, and he squirmed slowly as if in pain. Great, he said. His lips had stiffened. Put the stuff on him, I told Dimitri. No, Rollo said. Please, no. The Saurians put poison on their blades, I told Rollo. Dimitri said the living armor can help draw it out of you. Why not try it and see what happens? Rollo began to breathe raggedly. We never should have come aboard. I know it, I said. The living armor spread across my chest. I no longer noticed the crappy air in here. Even better, I felt as if I floated. I felt healthy. I mean, 100% well inside. This armor, maybe there was something to it. Dimitri tore off Rollo's clothes. Rollo tried to work his mouth, but it had stiffened too much for him to speak. He groaned, and his fingers twitched. He didn't want the stuff. First mumbling a Cossack prayer in Russian, and then winking at Rollo, Dimitri set a blob on my friend's bare legs. My second skin reached my throat and touched the soft flesh underneath my chin. I grew tense, and the living armor halted its advance. I squatted low and lifted a foot. The outer surface of the armor on the bottom of my foot had become like hard rubber. I tapped the surface armor on my arm. It was like dense rubber. I went to my pile of discarded clothes and drew my combat blade. It was a big, buoy style knife, almost a small short sword. This sucker was razor sharp, and the handle fit into my living armored hand like it was custom made for me. I'd had a thing for knives for a long time. My stepdad had especially hated me throwing knives against our barn door. That had been during seventh grade and junior high school. I bought three throwing knives at a surplus store and had thudded them against the barn door for hours. I'd left two hundred marks or holes in it. My stepdad had wallowed me good for that. Later, I'd made a target out of plywood. I could hit the centerpiece from thirty paces away nine times out of ten. Not that I had any intention of throwing the buoy. It was a fighting blade for hand-to-hand -hand combat. What did I know about that? In prison, there had been a thin little book written by a con from San Quentin. I'd read it fifty times and spoken to others. It had concerned prison knife fighting. There had been little fancy about it. One kept the blade close and used it with a fast thrust. In and out, baby. Sometimes a fighter didn't let you get close. The trick then was to cut him, let him bleed and weaken. The point to all this was I knew something about knife fighting. A mean and ugly style meant for quick results. There wasn't anything gentlemanly about knife fighting. It was a combat technique meant to eliminate your enemy without causing any hurt to yourself. How are you feeling? I asked Rollo. 
The living armor spread over him like a disease. It had flowed over the envenomed cut. Rollo's eyelids fluttered, and he began to stir. I flexed my biceps. Is there a trick to smashing the lizards like you did earlier? I asked Dimitri. Act as you would normally, he said. The living armor will supply you with extra power. We have the armor, I said. But I'm out of bullets, and I don't really trust our alien grenades. We need to kill them, not just knock the lizards out of the battle. What are we going to do about the Saurians and the tanks? Rollo asked. He sat up. The paralysis had gone, although his right eyelid drooped, half hiding that eye. Dimitri had been right about the armor. How do you feel? I asked. Woozy, Rollo said. And thirsty. Can you walk? Give me a second, Rollo said. I kept my gaze away from the corpses on the tables and the dead women floating in the cylinders. That was the price for losing. Do you know the layout of the ship? I asked Dimitri. Ella said something about the lower levels being used for storage and the higher decks being the ship functioning areas. If Ella's right, I said, and we'll have to bet she is, that would mean the control room is at the very top. That is good thinking, Dimitri said. Rollo grunted as he heaved up onto his feet. He glanced at my bowie knife and raised an eyebrow. Remember how I told you I've been to prison? I said. I remember. I'll stick to this, Rollo said, hefting his Browning forty-five in one hand and an alien grenade-launching pistol in the other. How much ammo do you have left? I asked. Two more magazines, Rollo said. Dimitri, you ready? I asked. I have been ready ever since you broke me out of the test tube, the stocky Cossack said. Let's do it, then, I said. Let's hunt down the aliens and kill every Nazi experimenting one of them. Chapter 6 the three of us moved through the alien lander as if it was the end of the movie time. You know how during the beginning of an action movie, the hero usually does something super cool? Then he gets caught, or the villain beats the crap out of him in a nasty way and steals his girlfriend. After a long time of getting ready and building up for the grand fight, the hero and his team smashes into the bad guy's fortress and proceeds to blow everyone down until the final confrontation and movie twist. Dimitri, Rollo, and I now smashed through the lander, sweeping down the corridors and entering small rooms, chambers, and fuzzy-walled corridors of varying sizes and complexity. We found more tube chambers. Some of the upright cylinders held people. Others proved to be empty. Everywhere we killed Saurians. Rollo ran out of bullets, but he found the shock grenade gun to his liking. He stayed in the back firing into groups of Saurians, knocking down some and slowing down others with the electrical discharges. Dimitri wielded a long bar of iron, and he continued to parody the Hulk. Once he smashed a lizard's head clean off the body. Blood jetted from its neck, while the Saurian jerked like a slaughtered chicken and ran against a wall before flopping around on the floor. I used the bowie knife, and my living armor no longer looked black but was slick with green-dripping Saurian blood. The suits pumped us with something, maybe a fast-acting drug to put us into a steroid rage. I felt elation at the slaughter, and I felt powerful, approaching invincible. The only trouble was a dry mouth. I really needed water. At times, my vision turned splotchy. How much farther do you think it's to the top of this thing? Rollo asked. We strode along a wide corridor that went upward like a ramp to a pair of double doors. They were the first normal doors we'd seen. Everything else had been protected by a membrane. The doors ahead of us swished open, and the biggest Saurian I'd seen so far limped out. Behind him in the room, I saw small windows showing an Antarctic storm outside. That was a relief. It let me know the lander was still on Earth. 
I'd wondered if I'd feel it if the ship took off into space. In the room, I spied stools, lizards in crinkling-looking suits near what seemed like controls. If I were to guess, we'd reached our destination. The lander's control chamber. As the doors swished shut behind him, the big Saurian strode toward us on his springy legs, with his long tail dragging and making clinking noises against the floor. This lizard seemed hoary with age, with a billy goat's beard under his scaly jaws, and standing as tall as a man, a six-footer. The old one's scales looked dimmer than the others, and a crust of something encircled his eyes. He also wore more of the crinkly material, and what seemed to be symbols showing his rank and golden rings around his tail. They were what made the noise as he approached. I knew a little about lizards and reptiles. As a kid, I'd read up on everything I could concerning dinosaurs. For one thing, they kept growing as long as they lived. The biggest crocodile was always the oldest one. I was beginning to believe the same held true for the Saurians. Did this old one run the lander? Why did he come alone? Was he surrendering? Rollo raised his alien pistol at the lizard. Wait, I said. He's trying to stall us, Rollo said. This is a trick. The old one wore a device on his chest, which hung from a band around his neck. He touched the device, lifted a microphone, or what looked like a microphone, and spoke into it. You must cease this senseless attack. The words boomed in English from the translator on his chest. He had gall, I'll give him that. Are you surrendering? I asked. I had a good reason for not wanting Rollo to fire. I knew the membranes couldn't stop us, but locked metal doors might. The doors behind the old one seemed solid. If I could, I'd try to talk my way into the control room. Your words lack meaning, the old one told me concerning surrender. You are prey, beasts, animals. We're people, I said, feeling a prickliness in my chest. I was more than sick of their arrogance, but I had to contain that for a greater goal. Answer my question. Are you surrendering? If you are, I give you my word of honor, we'll let you live. Go back to the chambers, the old one said. Remove the battle suits, and the family will deliver you to the Jelk. What family? I asked. What are you talking about? He's trying to mess with your mind, Rollo said. Kill him and smash into the control room. Do you hear my friend? I asked. He wants to kill you. Why shouldn't I gut you right here? You need to give me a reason to keep you alive. For you to kill me goes against the natural order of reality, the old one said. You are fighting beasts that have run amok. The family's duty is to destroy you lest you contaminate the others. However, in this instance, I will bring you to the Jelk. You must leave this area, return to the chambers, and remove the battle suits. Did you feel that? Rollo asked me. I knew what he meant. The deck plates under my feet vibrated more than before, as if I stood on a hard, revving bulldozer. A loud whine penetrated through the bulkheads. If I were to guess, I'd say the Saurians had started the engines and were getting ready to leave Antarctica. I'm giving you a last chance, I told the old one. Surrender the vessel to my control and you can live. This is obscene, the old one said. You have aborted the sequence of reality. The Jelk will be displeased. I'm displeased, I said. No, you are beasts. You are... I could see where this was going. Nowhere. And I was tired of being called a beast. I'd given him his chance. Now I was going to act. In three swift strides, I reached the old Saurian. The engines roared and the deck plates shivered with power. I used the bowie knife and thrust the steel through his squat neck. 
Then I threw the dead old one from me and lunged at the doors. They didn't open. The entire corridor swayed, and thunderous noises swept through us. The floor slid out from under me, and I realized the lander must be lifting off the rocky soil of Antarctica. We have to get in there, Rollo shouted. None of this matters if we can't break into the control room. Despite the roar and the vibration, I climbed up and put my green dripping hands against the doors and heaved sideways. The doors groaned in a tortured way, but they held their place. Give me a hand, I shouted. We have to get in there. The other two rushed forward, and each of us strained against the doors, trying to slide them open. The corridor tilted even more, and the old one's corpse slid away from the double doors. This vehicle must be headed into space. They locked the doors, Rollo said. I thrust my Bowie knife underhanded at the crack between the doors. The blade went in several inches. I shoved with everything I had. Inch by inch, the steel blade slid deeper between the doors. What's your plan? Rollo shouted. I yanked on the blade, trying to force the doors open. Push! I shouted. One of you per door! The three of us exerted all the considerable strength of our living armor-enhanced muscles. I yanked on the bowie knife, using it as a lever. I expected it to snap at any moment. Instead, we slid open the doors several inches so I could peer into the control room. The Saurians turned toward us in surprise. Give me your pistol, I wheezed. While keeping one hand pressed against the door, Rollo shoved me his gun. Through the small crack, I fired two shock grenades into the control room. Saurians dodged to get away, but to little avail. The grenades sizzled with blue arcing lines, and lizards began flopping about in the room. Give it everything, I said. It's now or never. It turned out to be now, because we forced the doors wide enough for me to slither through. The blood dripping from my suit helped grease my way. Then the portal banged shut behind me. Two remaining, sorry-looking, half-shocked lizards sat hunched at their stations. They were stubborn creatures. We had that much in common. The chamber was like a quadruple-sized cockpit of a regular jumbo jet, with seven saurians in attendance. Five lay tased on the floor. Two tapped frantically on their panels. The windows showed the darkening of approaching space with stars beginning to appear. The lander obviously headed for their mothership. I started toward them. One of the saurians hissed. The other slapped a button, and weightlessness came to the control room, for I found myself floating in midair. Fortunately, my forward momentum still kept me heading toward them. The lizards didn't wait on the stools, however. Each leapt away from me, soaring through the chamber to another location. I reached a stool soon enough and leapt after the nearest one. The next few minutes proved tedious and frustrating. The two lizards were much more agile in the weightless chamber than I was. At times they used their tails, thrusting off the bulkheads, or using them to reach and shove, adjusting their flight paths. I kept sailing after them in an attempt to catch one or to cut it with my bowie knife. This went on long enough so several of the frozen saurians on the floor began to stir. That changed the tactics of the two survivors. They landed near one of their own, shaking him and hissing urgently, trying to speed his revival. All the while, the lander headed for space. The last blue of Earth's atmosphere had already faded to black, and now the stars blazed in profusion. What would I do with seven saurians, seven flying monkeys moving in crisscrossing patterns through the chamber? This couldn't go on. I had to stop the lander and bring it back to Earth. Or barring that, I had to stop it before the vessel reached the mothership. Therefore, I changed tactics. This wasn't a game or a sporting proposition. This was life or death. Extinction or the continuation of the human race. That meant bitter ruthlessness. No one would give me a prize for playing fair. It was either win or lose. Prison had taught me some bitter lessons. The most critical of those lessons was to cheat when the stakes became high enough. I cheated now by landing on or beside the five stirring saurians. 
I killed each one, finding I had to hold the head in order to cut the throat. Otherwise, I'd merely push myself away as I attempted to ply my blade in the weightless situation. You shouldn't have come to Earth, I roared at one, feeling guilty at this slaughter. You should have left us alone. After finishing off the last of the five, we played the game in earnest, the two survivors and I. Like a hungry, angry wolverine, I chased them up and down and side to side throughout the compartment. They used every trick, I suppose, in weightless maneuvering. I learned fast. And I'd always been good at pool. It was all about angles, figuring them out and using them to your advantage. My living armored hand finally caught a saurian by the tail. The lizard thrashed, and at the last moment I felt the muscles of the tail bunch and writhe like a python. The creature became desperate and launched itself at my head. It was a smart move, for it made the most sense, as my head was the one vulnerable spot left. It didn't help the saurian. But given his situation, it's what I would have done in his place. We hugged, and I punched my blade into him. The tip must have hit a bone, momentarily blocking my thrust. Then I could feel the blade grating against it, sawing into the hard structure. I twisted the knife to make him die as fast as I could, and to get the edge off the bone. Afterward, my back bumped against a bulkhead. What's it gonna be? I shouted at the last Saurian. Surrender? Show me how to work the controls and I'll let you live. Yeah, my word. The last Saurian crouched against the far wall. His eyes were glassy, but he kept his lizard mouth open as he panted. You'll die unless you surrender, I said. He watched me, but it seemed clear he had no idea what I said. Why didn't he get a translator? Maybe it had something to do with him seeing me butcher his pals. Also, he must have thought of me as an animal gone berserk. Would I try to reason with a blood-maddened tiger that had just clawed and bit six of my friends to death? I almost pitied him, until I remembered the dissected corpses on the tables and the dead floating in the tubes. These lizards treated us like animals. This one merely reaped the reward of his kind's cruelty to our world. I glanced at the windows. Great, we were in space. I had to gain control of the lander, and that fast. I roared at him and faked with my head. He was twitchy, this last Saurian. He leaped, but I stayed where I was. No doubt recognizing his mistake, his tail lashed out for a stool to redirect his flight path. I heaved his dead buddy at him, then I launched myself. The dead Saurian struck the living one, and that's all the chance I needed. In these grisly moments of hack, slash, and spill green blood, I'd gotten a lot better at weightless maneuvering. The gruesome game ended with his death. I panted as I yanked my buoy out of his chest. With all this jumping and pushing, I'd become thirstier than ever. Now I had to concentrate. I floated to the controls, or to one set of them. I tried to remember which button the lizard had pushed that had turned off the gravity. Maybe it was this one. I pressed it, and I thudded hard onto the floor. I missed striking my chin on a panel by the barest fraction. Standing, I wondered what I should do next. Rollo shouted from the other side of the doors. Craig! Are you okay? What's going on in there? I strode across the bloody chamber with its lizard corpses and pulled a lever that looked like it should open the portal. It worked. The doors swished open. Listen up, I said. The two men stared at me. I imagined I was a sight, with a green bloody face, and as I clutched my gory buoy, their glances took in the dead lizards. You killed them all. Rollo said. I try to get them to surrender first, I said. Who's going to pilot the ship? Rollo asked. His girlfriend, I said, pointing at Dimitri. Get Ella up here pronto. We have to figure out these controls before we reach the mothership. 
There may be some Saurians left hiding on our lander, Dimitri said. Rollo, go with him, I said. Kill every lizard you find. But you two have to hurry. We're running out of time. What are you going to do? Rollo asked. I'll start messing with the controls to see if I can figure something out. I know you are cunning, Dimitri said. And I do not question your wisdom. But is it not possible you might accidentally open the outer locks and let out the air if you mess with the controls? The Cossack had a point. Okay, I said. Ella is supposed to be Miss Brainiac, right? Brainiac? Dimitri asked. Smart, wise, uh, mystic scientist with good guesses, I said. Yes, Dimitri said. She is very smart. So go get her. Until she comes, though, I'm going to try things. It's how we've gotten as far as we have. I'm not going to play it safe now. Dimitri gave a worried glance at the lander's controls. Go, I said. We have to get the ship turned around. And see if you can find us something to drink. I'm going to turn vampire and start sipping their blood. Dimitri gave me a strange look. It is said the Mongols, when they lacked other nourishment, used to open a vein on their horse and drink its blood. After the Zaporizhian Cossacks, the Mongols were the world's greatest warriors. Drinking alien blood makes us great? I asked. Likely, if you drank their blood, it would be poisonous to you. I blinked several times, studying our Cossack. Get Ella, I said, and do it now! Dimitri nodded curtly, and he went. Rollo raised an eyebrow at me, and then he went, too. Chapter 7 I sat in the control chamber with Ella Timoshenko. She wasn't naked anymore although she was still barefoot. She put on Rollo's parka as if it was a dress, leaving her legs exposed. She peered intently at the various panels, no doubt trying to decipher their functions. So far, she'd avoided looking at me, and it said even less. Dimitri and Rollo stalked the lander hunting for Saurians. I told them to cleanse this craft of alien invaders. It was an Earth ship now, our only one. I intended on keeping it that way. I badly needed water. I suspect we all did. My lips were chapped, and the armor had begun to stir restlessly on my skin. There had to be a water source aboard ship. How otherwise had the aliens kept the Russians alive for two days? I would have asked Ella... I'd heard her speak to Rollo and knew our scientist spoke broken English so we could communicate. But she had a graver task to perform just now. We desperately needed to gain control of our ship. Ella had narrow, pretty features with a little triangular-shaped chin. She continued to blink like a woman missing her glasses. She turned her head toward me but refused to look in my eyes. Was she shy or still upset with me? This must be life support, she said, indicating a panel. So never touch these controls. Did she think I was an idiot or a Neanderthal? Sure thing, I said. Ella stood. She had nice legs. She wiped her hands against the parka's fabric and moved to the next stool. She carefully sat down, pulling the parka around her. Then she began to inspect the new panel. Soon she rubbed her forehead, shook her head, and gave me another side glance. I cannot be certain, she said. I get that, I said. I'm amazed you can tell anything at all. But our time is becoming more critical by the second. We have to try something. The lander's engine still throbbed, and the ship presumably blasted at takeoff speed toward parts unknown. How long would it take the mothership to notice us? How many landers did the aliens possess? If a few, they would notice sooner. 
If hundreds, well, maybe we still had a chance. We operated in the dark, but we were lucky to be in this position at all. Ella Timoshenko spread her slender hands over the panel, wriggled her fingers, and dared to touch a control. The vibration under our feet quit in an instant. I glanced at her. That was impressive. Maybe our scientists did indeed possess intuitive abilities. I have shut off the engine, she informed me. How in the world did you know to press that control? I asked. Whether out of modesty, because she was too busy thinking, or found talking to me too difficult, she just shook her head and went back to studying the panel. At that moment, a screen to my left flickered with images. I must have noticed it with my peripheral vision. I turned toward the wall screen and saw a saurian. It peered at me. This one had discolored scales around its left eye. My stomach nodded. The bastards had found us. There went our element of surprise. We could still ram them, though. I didn't want to die, but I wanted to float in a specimen jar even less. I could give them the finger a second before impact. My upper lip curled. The Saurian must be some kind of traffic control operator. Likely he was on the mothership, checking in on the lander. The lizard hissed at me. I wished I could have shot him in the head. Can you turn off that screen? I whispered to Ella out of the corner of my mouth. She looked up and must have seen the lizard for the first time. She gave a sharp gasp before saying, I am not certain. No, not immediately, she added. I faced the lizard. After chasing the two saurians around in this chamber, I had begun to distinguish their expressions. Clearly, the lizard operator didn't like what he saw. He spoke sharply before his image disappeared. I stood, and I considered smashing the screen. Before I could proceed, another image appeared on the screen. A human-looking alien wearing a dark jacket turned around and faced me. He appeared to be listening to someone speaking off-screen out of my sight. Maybe it was the lizard operator reporting to him. The man had blood-colored skin and narrow features. He had dark, extremely intelligent-seeming eyes. When he opened his mouth, I noticed pointy teeth like a piranha. The alien spoke, or his mouth moved. From a speaker under our screen came saurian-like hisses. Are you seeing this? I asked Ella. He must be the jelk. Ella said in a low voice. I turned to the scientist. She had been staring at me. The minute our eyes met, hers dropped. This is ridiculous, I said. We're not at a dance. We're about to die. Her gaze lifted, and she glared now. You stared at me before? Yeah, well, I couldn't help it. You're pretty. Now, what's a joke? She glared for a moment longer. Then the outrage in her eyes flickered off, and she had a business look, a coldly logical expression. The Saurian spoke about the Jelk. I remember being intrigued, as it seemed clear the Jelk controlled the expedition. So that's the Saurian's boss, I whispered. Ella glanced around me at the screen. She nodded, adding, Most certainly. I turned back to the Jelk. This was the bastard I had to kill who must have ordered the thermonuclear bombs rained onto Earth. The Joker must be on the mothership. He regarded me closely, and a cruel smile appeared. Those eyes. They showed wicked intelligence. Something twisted like a biblical demon. I had the impression of advanced age. That daunted me. He spoke again, and instead of hisses, English words came out of the speaker. You are humans, earthlings, 
he said. Obviously, I said. Are you the jelk? His eyebrows rose, and I found that disconcerting. Aliens from the stars should be different in thought and actions from us, right? Those raised eyebrows were a human-like gesture. What did it mean if we had similar facial gestures? Ah, oh, he said. You wear a symbiotic battlesuit. I begin to perceive the situation. The chamber shows stains of combat. Yes, you have gained control of the vessel. How foolish of the family. I had thought they could collect specimens without endangering themselves. You earth beasts are more cunning than the indicator showed. My gut tightened. Beasts. This joker called us beasts, too. What was with these aliens? Were they all a bunch of arrogant pricks? I breathed heavily, and I told myself getting angry wouldn't help me now. But I couldn't stop myself. Why do you believe we're beasts? I asked. The smile widened as if he was amused with me. It is self-evident, he said. No, I said. We're talking, right? Speech implies intelligence. How interesting, he said. You attempt to reason with me. Very well. If it's logic you desire, I will accommodate you for the moment. Your lander capturing feat deserves a reward. I am in fact impressed with you. You wear a bio-battle suit. That was a clever tactic. I couldn't understand his calm. We had his lander. We killed his saurians. But he didn't seem concerned with their deaths. It told me he was cold-hearted. I suppose I already knew that, since he was genocidal. You claim to have risen above the level of beasts, he said. Yet I know that a few short years ago your species avidly attempted to destroy each other. Our XT sociologists studied Earth several cycles ago. At the time... He leaned toward the screen and pressed three fingers against his forehead. If I were to guess, it looked as if he was thinking or attempting to recall facts. Ah, now I remember, he said, confirming my suspicion. The German Imperium attacked the Soviet Empire, creating widespread destruction. At the same time, the American techno-wizard solved the atomic equation and annihilated Japanese militarists. I glanced back at Ella. She didn't notice. With her features scrunched in thought as she observed, she obviously studied the jelk. A light bulb went off in my head. The atomic equation did it for me. You're talking about World War II, I said. You had observers watching us back then? The jelk showed off his pointy teeth. He might look human, but he wasn't the same as us. Animals destroy in a reflexive manner, he said. The civilized solve in a constructive way. The genocidal freak was a hypocrite. I'd had my fill of them. Oh, sure, I said. Civilized. That's why you nuked the earth and sowed death spores everywhere, right? Unsurprisingly, you labor under misinformation, he said. It was not I who did these things, but the Lokars. Uh oh I heard Ella say behind me. The engine has come back online. I glanced at the Russian. Her fingers were pressed against a panel. At the same time, I felt the vibration under my feet. Did you turn the engines back on? I whispered. Ella looked up at me, and she bit her lower lip. Negative. I think he did it. You are observant, the jelk said. That's another point in your favor, I suppose. 
Yes, you've noticed that my operators have taken remote control of the craft. In several time units, you will join the fleet. I remember the police driving me to prison. I'd sat in the back of a police car, with my wrists handcuffed. Fear had filled me then. I'm not letting this prick capture me. He thinks I'm an animal. Remember those dissected people on the tables? I rubbed the back of my hand against my lips. Maybe there was a way to short-circuit the remote control. We had battle suits and some alien weaponry. I wasn't about to call it quits just because this grinning bastard spoke to me in a high-handed manner. It appears your rationality is lower than you realize, the Jelk said. Keeping my features neutral, I faced him. Yeah? How do you figure? Why would I eliminate your species in a violent act of destruction, and then send down Krav to collect specimens for bio-battlesuit testing? You tell me, I said. The smile evaporated, and the coldness of his dark eyes became more pronounced. You are a rash creature, too full of your own importance. I suppose your present feat has puffed up your hubris to inordinate levels. No, Earth Beast, that a single command from me will cause the atmosphere in your vessel to flee into the vacuum of space around you. You're threatening to kill us? I asked. Call me Beast one more time. Mister, I said, I've been ready to die for a while now. The threat is not an action, the Jelk said. It is instead a possibility. You may yet live, but that will depend on the next few moments and what you decide. I wanted to shove his face against a block of cement and grind it to paste, but I was unable to think of anything useful to say, so I just nodded. Interesting, he said. You now exhibit caution. Maybe the observers underrated human intelligence. In any case, as I was saying, your rationality, your reason, is weak. The Jelk Corporation does not waste resources. The assault upon your planet... Hmm, he said. I suspect that the Lokars feared you enough to act aggressively. It is possible they learned of my plan and attempted to neutralize my recruiting grounds before I could reach this system. Yes, Ella whispered behind me. The aliens want us as soldiers. I was right all along. What are you saying? I asked the Jelk. You wanted to hire humans as mercenaries in a galactic war? Again, you misunderstand. The Jelk Corporation does not indulge in war, not in the style or manner of beasts. The Lohars, however, do not abide by civilized conduct. They are a betweener species, climbing upward from beastliness to sophistication. Not only was he irritating, but confusing. Who are the Lohars? I asked. Is that your name for the Saurians? How you strive for understanding, the Jelk said. I applaud that. Yet it is difficult for you to comprehend concepts beyond your intellect to process. You are a fighting beast with the rudiments of rationality. That you wear the bio-battle suit and have destroyed the workers proves it. He pressed his fingertips against his forehead. I had not anticipated this pseudo-intelligence. Perhaps I can recoup my investment after all. He removed his hand, and his smile reappeared. This wouldn't be the first time that the Jelk on the spot understands better than the policymakers back in the conglomerate. Listen to me, Earth Beast. 
Comprehend, if you can, the offer I'm about to make you. I don't think I've ever wanted to squeeze anyone's neck more. I felt helpless, and I had no idea how to fix this. If he wanted us as mercenaries, that would be one thing. But this idea I was a beast? The joke cleared his throat. The sound had a gritty quality, like a two-pack-a-day smoker. I had planned to use you Earth Beasts as ground troops. There are enough transports en route to move several hundred million of you. Once you had been put to cryogenic sleep, of course. The bio-battlesuits were an investment. Oh, never mind. I'm sure you cannot comprehend. The point is that now a paltry few million of you have survived the planetary bombardment. Your amazing feat of conquering a lander and taking it into space? I believe I can recoup expenditures by taking the best of you and rearming you as space assault troopers. You appear to possess enough wit to successfully operate in a vacuum and weightless environment. Was I hearing this right? Let me get this straight, I said. You're offering to hire us as space mercenaries? Crudely stated, but accurate to a point, he said. My thoughts threatened to whirl around and around. I didn't want to end up dissected on a table, and I dreaded the idea this slug was lying. I didn't want to live the rest of my days in an alien cage, either. But fighting space wars as a mercenary? Won't the Saurians want revenge for what I've done to them? I asked. By Saurians? Oh, I see. You're referring to the family. Certainly the workers would prefer to see you destroyed, but that has no bearing on my offer. The Saurians... The... Family works for you? I asked. They are mere workers indeed, the Jelk said. Their poor martial performance against you attests to their lack of fighting ingenuity, at least in face-to-face -face encounters. A truly combative species would have quashed your struggle at the outset. And if I refuse your offer? I asked. The Jelk appeared surprised. Come, come. The outcome of refusal is obvious on several levels. At the most lenient, if I returned you to Earth, you would die within the next few weeks from the bio-terminator lacing the air. But, of course, I won't return you, but simply let vacuum and space take care of your sullen aggressiveness. Then I will gather other humans as my space assault troopers. I didn't like him. I didn't trust him or the Jelk Corporation he represented. But he controlled the ship's engine, and I believed he had the power to back up his threats. Besides, I was thirsty, hungry, and wondering how to get the bio suit off me. If we become your mercenaries, I said. How will you pay us? His eyebrows rose again, and those dark eyes glittered. You will be fed, housed, given medical treatment and sexual servitors. I interrupted. It was clear we'd be his fighting slaves. He thought of us as animals, after all. But I had plans that didn't include serving the Jelk Corporation my entire life. A judge had once sent me to prison, but I'd found a way out of that. First, I had to survive, and I had to help the last remnants of humanity endure our world's destruction. I have one request as part of our payment, I said. Speak, he said. I'm listening. You spoke about millions having survived the Lohar attack, I said. But it seems clear the Earth has become uninhabitable, or nearly so. Quite, he said. It seems to me you're probably not going to recruit all of the survivors, I said. No, he said. 
it wouldn't be profitable. My payment is that you house the survivors, helping them overcome the Bioterminator. His upper lip lifted, showing me those pointed teeth of his. Am I to understand that you believe your service can pay for such costly planetary reconstruction? Think about it for a moment, I said. I led these humans with nothing but our wits and fighting ability. We beat your Saurians, even though they had every advantage. I realized the Jelk Corporation had observers here once. Yet you've already admitted that they failed to fully appreciate our abilities. We humans fight a whole lot better if we feel we're fighting for something noble and useful. Your space assault troopers will give you their best if they know back home humanity still exists, that they're buying that existence with their sweat and blood. I find it interesting how you ape civilized behavior, the Jelk said. Hmm. I do have several ventures that could use highly motivated assault troops. I suppose I could land a freighter or two on the surface, dismantling. He paused, thinking for a moment. Then he held up one of his red-skinned hands. Earth Beast, I agree to your proposal. I had no idea if he kept his word or not. If he was lying, I went for broke and asked him how I could trust him. He made barking noises. I learned later that it was Jelk laughter. You can trust me, he said, because you have no other options. Refuse, and the last of your species, on the planet at least, surely dies. Accepting my offer gives them the chance of life. Besides, as I said, en route are a host of space freighters. Some are always near their end of usefulness. Instead of sending those particular vessels back, I'll junk them on your world by landing those that are able. They will serve as the centerpiece of the various planetary life support stations. How could a few freighters house several million humans? I didn't like his cavalier attitude, but he was right about one thing. I had little bargaining power. It seemed as if this would be the best I was going to get. We'll fight harder if we know Earth has a chance of survival, I repeated. I believe you've already stated so, and I agreed to your terms for now. If you're as good at fighting as you claim you are, I'll want more assault troops later. Thus, I have the best of reasons, enlightened self-interest, to keep you Earth beasts breeding for now. Let me add this caveat, however. If the Lohars struck here once, what is to stop them from striking again? A cold feeling worked through me. A Jelk battle fleet standing guard, I said. Isn't Earth now part of your empire? Firstly, battle fleets cost money, he said in a dismissive voice. Secondly, your star system is definitely not part of our empire, as we have none. We are a corporation. We have emporiums, resource centers, and trading partners. Your planet might have become a temporary resource node, but not after the Lohar devastation. Still, if you Earth beasts can truly fight, well, we shall see what the future holds. I couldn't figure out how to get more from him, at least not at the moment. These Lohars, I yearn to dust their planet with a bio-terminator. I also ate to capture the commanding officer and the entire crew of the enormous vessel that had devastated Earth. They would die, every one of them. First, I had to keep myself and my planet alive. Yes, I said. I agree to your terms. The Jelk barked again, laughed again. I'm not sure what he found so amusing. 
But that was how I and the others found ourselves as Jelt Corporation Space Assault Troopers. I didn't know it then, but our troubles had just started. Chapter 8 The next few weeks were hell. It started with the lander's slow approach toward seven monstrous vessels that waited between the Earth and the Moon. The Jelt Corporation ships had running lights blinking along the sides like an old neon Christmas sales sign that changed colors from red to green to blue and back to red. By comparing the lander to them, I realized each of their vessels was kilometers in circumference and shaped like an oak leaf. The seven ships were arranged in a pentagram pattern that I found ominous. I didn't know if these were freighters, jelt battleships, or what. Our lander headed toward the nearest and soon entered an open bay door. The hangar was huge, with five other landers parked on a red-colored floor space. We made the sixth lander. Time to go, I said from the control chamber. We hurried to the exit where Saurians and battle armor greeted us. At gunpoint, we filed out of the lander onto the floor. They ordered us into a long column and marched us deeper into the ship. Rollo tapped my shoulder and pointed back. I turned and quailed at the sight. The stars and the lonely blue earth were visible through the huge hangar door. It hadn't closed, and in that moment I expected escaping air to pick us up and launch us toward the opening into space. Another membrane, Rollo said. Of course, that made sense. A membrane kept the atmosphere within the hangar bay. Thinking about the membrane and touching my battle suit brought home to me that the Jelk liked to use biomaterial instead of just inorganic metal. What did that tell me about them? I guess the obvious. They were different from us and thought differently. I let my gaze rove over our column of marching men and women. There were more humans in the lander than I'd expected. A good three hundred of us. The Saurians had been busy these past few days. As we neared the edge of the hangar bay and neared several large doors, the Saurians separated Rollo, Ella, Dimitri, and me from the others. We were taken left while the rest of the column marched to the right. Did the Jelk think of us as the ringleaders? Or were we the ones most dangerous to them? After winding through a maze of corridors, the guards forced the four of us into an empty chamber with shower heads. A heavy door clanged shut behind us, and liquid immediately hissed from above. Don't look at me, Ella said. I began coughing instead of looking at our scientist. The water tasted awful, like metal. Then my bio-battle suit melted off me, and I felt the hot liquid pelting my bare skin. It was a strange sensation, with a pang of parting, like losing a good friend. Through the heated fog, I saw the other suits melting or oozing off Rollo and Dimitri. The living armor didn't become blobs again, but slithered like powerful snakes for small portals that looked like rat holes along the sides of the shower room. At the sight, the good friend sensation dwindled. An alien-grown thing had been covering my skin? I'd always hated snakes, and watching the last of the armor slither through a hole, I had an atavistic reaction. I never wanted to become used to the symbiotic creature. Being a Jelk space mercenary, what would be our life expectancy, and who would we fight? The water's changing color. Ella said. I looked up and got sprayed in the eyes. It stung like powerful soap, and I kept my face aimed downward after that. The trickle by my toes had become orange. I realized they were hosing us down like horses. Ella speculated it was in order to get rid of any contaminating bio-terminator. By the time I was starting to feel like a prune, the spray quit. The doors opened, and battle-suited Saurians entered. They prodded us along another corridor. I tried to keep from looking at a naked Ella. 
She had her hands in front of her. The one time she looked back at us, I made sure I was staring elsewhere. The lizards forced us to a smaller chamber with benches along the sides. A human-seeming doctor in white and with outrageous eyebrows beckoned us near an alcove. She held a huge hypo filled with yellow liquid. The needle was bad enough, and far too long. I squinted at the sludge she no doubt planned to inject into me or us. Little metallic-looking particles floated in the solution. What is that stuff? I asked. The doctor glanced at a saurian as if I'd spoken gibberish. The lizard pointed his gun at me. Go ahead and give me the shot, I said. I'm not stopping you, I'm just asking. The doctor scowled. The lizard hissed, and the woman plunged the needle into my arm. There was no warning, no rubbing my shoulder first. She's doing it like a vet would to a cow or pig. I watched with loathing as the yellow solution with the metallic particles disappeared in front of the plunger. The stuff was entering me, all of it. Seconds afterward, I felt nauseous and a copper taste filled my mouth. What was this stuff? The doctor spoke alien words, and she pointed. The room seemed to tilt and elongate. I stared at the door. It retreated as I watched. The doctor must have spoken again. Her words became distorted and much too loud. A sick feeling spread through me, reaching my groin and then my legs. I staggered to the exit, pushed through a membrane, and found two more women waiting. They were white, like nurses. I spat to get the copper taste out of my mouth. That was a mistake. I dry-heaved, and the world, the room, spun around me. What's going on? I mumbled. This way, please, one woman said. At least she spoke English. That was good. They seemed to be trying to help. I raised my head to stare into her face. She had dark hair to her shoulders and brown eyes like soft, overturned soil. My mouth hardly worked and my tongue felt sluggish. Are, are you from Earth? I asked. I couldn't place the accent. She pushed me. I stumbled, nearly fell, but managed to keep my feet. My eyes must have rolled around in their sockets. I had to concentrate, and that brought a pounding headache. The nurse propelled me to a trough of green solution. Lay down, she said. You want me to lie in the water? I asked. You're going to feel sick soon, she said. You should lie down while you can. I tried to look around and regain my bearings. My vision swam and finally failed me. Everything became blurry and indistinct. What had they injected into me? My knees weakened. I almost fell on my face. The two nurses guided me, helping me lie in the warm solution. They must have put a mask over my face. I heard labored, Darth Vader-like breathing, and I realized it originated from me. Then warm water surrounded every part of me. I submerged. It was the last thing I remembered before passing out. I awoke much different in feeling and awareness. Grogginess filled me, although I realized that hands helped me up out of a liquid solution. Vaguely, I recalled the injection and putting on a mask. I peered at one of the hands holding me, slender with a frail wrist. The hand possessed four fingers and an opposable thumb, and it had a silver-colored ring on the pinky finger, with a tiny cross etched onto the ring's surface. The wrist stuck out of a white sleeve. With my eyes, I followed the sleeve up to a shoulder a pretty neck, and a beautiful face with dark hair. It was the nurse. She gave me a nervous smile. I opened my mouth to reply. Don't try to talk just yet, she said. 
You're disoriented. You've been through intense surgery. You must be a prime specimen to have neurofibers wired into you. I couldn't summon speech, and I didn't comprehend her words yet. But I did like her eyes. I tried to smile. I wanted to see her smile again. I wanted her hands to remain on my skin. She patted my arm. This might hurt. A stinging pain flared in my right pectoral. I realized there had been many such stinging sensations these past few moments. It's what had awoken me. Despite my grogginess and the allure of the woman's face, I transferred my attention to the pain. I lay in a green solution, in a trough of some kind. Hands yanked tiny, sticky pads off my flesh, a bunch of them, meaning a bunch of pads and hands. Each pad had a trailing wire on the end. Hadn't the woman spoken about surgery and wires? I managed to grunt, and I tried to struggle upright. He's getting restless, another woman said. Jennifer, see if you can distract him again. Fingers touched my chin. I tried to shake my head free of the touch. Two hands clamped onto my cheeks, one on each side. I resisted, but I felt terribly weak. Slowly, someone dragged my head where it didn't want to go. The pretty nurse bent over me. She smiled down into my face. It's going to be okay, she said. You've received a heavy dosage of steroid 65. In the next few weeks, you'll experience massive muscle growth. The surgeons also wired you with neurofibers. Only the best commandos receive those. They will speed up your reflexes, and you'll learn to use them well. More stings told me the others continued to rip the sticky pads from my flesh. I quit fighting and relaxed, realizing I needed to gather my strength. Good job, Jennifer. Keep talking. Your voice soothes him. She soothes the savage beast, I thought to myself. Beast. Yeah. I was an Earth Beast mercenary for the Jelk Corporation. But I wasn't a beast. I was a man. One thing I knew, these women worked for the aliens. Could the Saurians have captured Earth nurses to train them this fast in alien procedures? No. That wasn't logical. I shut my eyes and squeezed them closed. What's he doing? a woman asked. We've never had one of them act like this before. Don't have any idea, the head nurse said, the one who had told Jennifer to keep me occupied. I thought back to the words I'd just heard. There had been something strange about it. It hadn't been English, but I'd understood the language perfectly. What had the surgeons done to me while I'd been under? What could they do that would let me learn or assimilate a new language so quickly? A feeling of violation surged through me. I wanted to lash out and attack, but this wasn't the time or place for it. Yeah, yeah, everything was starting to come back. The militaristic Lohars had wiped out the Earth, and I'd made a deal with Mr. Jelk to help the world's surviving remnants. My eyes flew open. I still couldn't see more than blurs past the women around me. I shifted my head from side to side. I counted four women in their white uniforms. Relax, Jennifer said. We're here to help you. I opened my mouth. We're almost done, a woman said. Tell him that. We're removing the implants, Jennifer told me. Then we're going to help you sit up and move into a wheelchair. We're taking you to the green room. You'll get dressed there, and after you eat... This one doesn't eat until after the tests, the head nurse said. Shah Kaith wants privation results. He's listening to you, Jennifer warned. He understands what we're saying. It doesn't matter, the head nurse said. He's red-listed and has to test out. Either way, you won't see him after this. He's big, Jennifer commented, and looks strong. 
Maybe why Shah Clarth is interested in him, the head nurse said. Instead of becoming more lucid, I almost passed out. Vaguely, I was aware, as these women helped me out of the solution and into a wheelchair, as they said. They sprayed my skin with something cooling. My stomach rumbled. I craved a dozen Big Macs and heaps of fries. Matters proceeded in the manner Jennifer had told me it was going to play out. Naked and in the wheelchair, I moved down a corridor. I sat like an old man, with my head slumped forward so my chin rested against my chest. I drooled and couldn't focus my eyes. In a different room, the women helped me dress in a jumpsuit. No underwear, no shirt, but they put slippers on my feet. Two of them maneuvered me off the wheelchair and onto a stool. I recalled stools. The Saurians in their alien tank and in the lander's control chamber had sat on them. We killed every one of those lizards. Why is he grinning now? The head nurse asked. A face pushed down near mine. I focused again. It was Jennifer. Good luck with the tests. She said softly. Who... who are you? I whispered. She laughed prettily, if a bit nervously. Are you from Earth? I asked. She glanced away, straightened, and frowned down at me. Then she bent down and whispered in my ear. They're always watching. You mustn't make them nervous, and... She stopped talking as I grabbed one of her thin wrists. Where are you from? I asked. She hesitated before saying, They took my parents with them the last time they observed, she said. During World War II? I asked. Was that the last time? She became wistful. We were going to help process millions. I so looked forward to visiting my origin planet. But the Lohars got here first. Now... She patted my hand and worked her wrist free. Will I see you again? I asked. You're a fighting beast, she whispered. A prime specimen. We're people, I told her. We're not animals, so don't call me one. She looked away. There was something about her. Even though she'd been brainwashed by the Jelk. I'll see you again, Jennifer. Right? No, she whispered. Something about that no hardened my resolve. Yes, I said, feeling good saying it. You're going far away, she said, with that wistful look in her eyes. I believe you, I said. But you also have to believe me that I'm also coming back for you. We're done, Jen, the head nurse said. We have many of them to process today. Let's go. Jennifer looked into my eyes one last time. I looked into hers and felt a spark leap in me. She straightened before I could try to kiss her and headed for the door. In her white nurse's uniform, her butt swayed perfectly. The cloth tightened in just the right ways. I wanted to be with Jennifer. I wanted to take her out to eat and go to the beach with her. Instead, she exited the room and the door swished shut behind her. I thought about what she'd told me about surgery and neurofibers. Lifting my arm, I examined the skin. There were hairline scars. I examined the rest of my body. I could see hundreds of these extremely thin scars. What had she said? They'd pumped me with steroid 65. The Jelk and the Saurians, the aliens, continued to treat me like an animal. If I lived long enough, I'd make them regret that in a very personal way. I'd hired out as a mercenary. They'd better get used to the idea that we'd made a deal and start treating me, us, 
Right. The door swished open, and I grew tense, expecting to see a phalanx of saurians rush into the room with shock batons to beat me down. Instead, a lean doctor in a white lab coat walked in. She held a slate in one hand and a small, flat device in the other. Her thumb hovered over a button on the small device. She had thin hair, outrageous eyebrows like the first doctor, and wet lips. A name tag said Dr. Warren. Hello, Mr. Creed, she said. It's just Creed, I said, without the mister. Dr. Warren slid the small device into a pocket, pulled out a stylus, and made a mark on what I realized was a computer tablet. So what's on the agenda now? I asked. More steroid 65? Or will you plant extra lines of neurofiber into me? Neither. First you have some tests to take. Afterward... She stopped because I stood up. The room tilted, or it seemed to, and a cold sweat broke out of my forehead. I swayed unsteadily. You should sit for now, Warren suggested. How about you give me some answers, I said. I'm getting tired of this animal routine. We're mercenaries. Tell the joke we have a contract. You should understand that. Dr. Warren calmly put her right hand into a lab coat pocket. A second later, an agonizing jolt of pain stabbed the back of my neck. My knees unhinged and I collapsed onto the floor. Seconds ticked by and I could feel Dr. Warren bending over me. Let me give you some friendly advice concerning the Jelk Corporation. Immediately obey those in charge. Do not seek to give orders or corrections. You have become Shah Cloth's property. If that doesn't sit well, think of yourself as a semi-liquid form of venture capital. I realize you're a fighting beast, but the key to your... Warren quit talking, because I spun on my back and used my legs to swipe hers out from under her. The doctor went down in a heap, and I heard the tablet clatter across the floor. The cold sweat remained, and the throb of pain in my neck still bit. I had a good idea what had just happened, and I was going to put a stop to it. Warren groaned. Then I managed to flop onto her, and she yelped in surprise. I wrestled with one of her hands, the one striving to shove itself into the lab pocket. Instead, I shoved my own hand into the pocket and grabbed the small device she'd put into it a few minutes ago. As my fingers touched the device, the shock started again in the base of my neck, jolting down throughout my body. I groaned at the agony, and I found myself blinking rapidly. I tried to clutch the device again, and once again jolts sizzled through me. The clammy feeling worsened, and I vomited. I tried. There wasn't anything in my stomach to throw up. I lost all interest in trying to grab the device, though. I rolled onto my back and lay there, gasping. That was foolish, Warren said. It sounded as if she spoke from on her back. I cracked open an eyelid and turned my head toward her. That caused a splitting headache to throb into existence and it robbed me of the majority of my vision. There were splotches in my sight. I did spy something lying on the floor near me. The doctor, I presumed. I hit my head, Warren complained. What's going on? I asked. What did you put into my neck? It's not what I put into you, Warren said. Family technicians put it in while you receive the neurofibers. The Jelk are sticklers for obedience from their animals, particularly from their fighting beasts. I'm a mercenary, I shouted. We made a deal. I'm sure you didn't read or would not have comprehended the fine print, she said. Do you have one of the pain makers in your neck? I asked. No, no, of course not, she said. Why would I? So you're a traitor to the human race, I said. This is an undignified conversation, and it isn't helping either of us. 
In point of fact, this is my first trip to Earth. You weren't born here? I asked. I was born in the Steel Worlds, as we refer to the ships. The last observer team took specimens. They always have. Thus, there have always been several million humans throughout the Jelt Corporation. I don't know why it took this long for the Jelt to decide to draft Earth Beasts into its military arm. Perhaps the Lokars have made greater gains than our masters let on. I've heard word the Jelt Corporation has lost star systems to Lokar incursions. But that's all it is. Rumors. Gossip. I have no hard data. The Jelt told me they don't have an empire, I said. Well, no, the doctor said. They do own star systems, though. Profitable ones. Was this just a matter of semantics? I filed away the thought. It wasn't germane just now. I asked the Jelk if we're mercenaries. He said yes, but thinks of us as animals. Will the Jelk keep his word to me? What word is that? She asked. I told Dr. Warren about my bargain with the Jelk. Hmm, Warren said. Maybe he will. I must assume you spoke to Shah Clyeth. The Jelk are spread thinly throughout their corporation. I don't know of any other masters along on the mission. It's clear you amused him. Jelk seldom laugh. Unfortunately, it's seldom good for anyone when they do, as their humor is as dark as the Crab Nebula. Dr. Warren groaned, and I heard her garments rustle. I had the feeling she'd climb to her feet and knew my thought was correct as her shoes scuffled on the floor. Let me caution you, she said. Her voice came from higher up. In case you don't know, the controller in your neck is for obedience. If you're troublesome, I have permission to use it on you. If you attempt to pry the device from me, even if you touch it, the control device will automatically deliver punishment shocks to you. I reached back and felt along my neck. There was a longish scar. I pushed, and I could feel a hard object inside me about the size of my pinky nail. A wave of nausea hit, along with anger and dread. Shock cloth had stuck a shock collar on me. No, he'd caused an implanted obedience controller into me. Okay, I knew this wasn't going to be easy. My first order of business was to cut this thing out of me. Actually, my first order of business was to survive long enough to try it. I can see you're finally thinking, Warren said. Why bother doing it like this? I asked. You're the one who attacked me. It should be obvious, therefore, why they did it. Especially after the enhancements given you. You're too dangerous to let run around loose. That's not what I mean. Why not tell me up front what's going on? Why hide knowledge from me and then shock me by surprise? Yes, the not knowing is frustrating, isn't it? She asked. But it's the way Shaw Cloth wants it for now, so there's nothing you can do but accept it. Why do you help them? My dear fellow, it should be obvious why. Now, no more questions for now, or I'm going to use the control device on you again. I took a deep breath, rolled onto my stomach, waited for the nausea to pass so I wouldn't vomit again, and pushed upward. I felt her hand on my elbow. I wanted to shove it away, but I let her help me onto a stool. I sat there, gasping afterward. Some of the splotches had faded from my sight. Dr. Warren had a shiner on her forehead, and her lab coat was rumpled. She glanced at her stylus. It's time to run you through some tests to see if the neurofibers took. I imagine they did, but we're supposed to be certain. Once you start the training, there's no stopping until the six weeks are up. You're going to be very hungry the next few weeks, and your skin will itch terribly. My advice is to eat all you can and exercise like a demon. Shaw Cloth will want at least thirty pounds of muscle growth on each of you. If he's so high and mighty, why does he care about mere beasts? I asked. 
Warren laughed without an ounce of humor. My dear man, cloth is a joke's joke. He has and will invest money into you. Why does he do this? For the only reason a joke does anything. Profits. He desires you and the others to become prime fighting creatures so he can recoup his venture capital and gain a massive profit. As you can imagine, the Lohar assault on Earth has enraged him. Because of the sudden lack of mercenaries he'd hoped to recruit on our world? I asked. That and the amount of money he sank into arranging for such a vast fleet of transports to arrive in this system. If you knew the pains he has taken for training millions of battle beasts, I've heard he'd hoped to sell tens of millions of you Earthers to the Rim Confederation. Now those contracts will remain unfulfilled. The loss of income, profits, staggers the imagination. I would think Shah Cloth is wild to regain something from this fiasco. Perhaps that's why you struck his fancy. Lohars, Jelk, and now the Rim Confederation. I knew nothing about the interstellar situation. We were ciphers to them. Animals to catch and sell or to squash and spray. Mankind had obviously gotten a late start in the star-building game, and we'd almost been wiped off the board. Well... This so-called animal was going to do everything in his power to change that. First, I'd have to pass these tests and endure combat training. Let's get started, I said. Dr. Warren raised an unkempt eyebrow. I have a lot to do and a short time to do it in, I said. She gave me a strange scrutiny before pointing at the door. Head that way, then, and we'll get started. I did. Marching toward six weeks of hell. Chapter 9 Ella figured it out first. That our drill instructors weren't the children of kidnapped humans from an earlier survey, but manufactured androids. The unsmiling, monotone D.I.s proved to be bioplastic human replicas with cybernetic interfaces and bio-grown brains. They lacked all mercy. Heck, they lacked every emotion and demanded perfection. It meant we were in the hands of machines that were doing exactly as they had been programmed. For the first several days, we ate like hummingbirds. No, not very little, but a lot. Some of those tiny creatures consume more than twelve times their body weight every twenty-four hours. There probably weren't any hummingbirds left, though. Not after the Bio-Terminator worked its way through the world. The Lohars had a lot to answer for. Thinking of that, I ate until my jaws ached. And afterward, I slurped the Jelk equivalent of protein shakes. Battle-suited Saurians had moved us to another ship, a gravity vessel, where I weighed at least twice as much. I constantly felt tired, and the drag on my muscles and bones made every movement a struggle. It also forced our bodies to work and to grow. We ran on a track, did push-ups and sit-ups and other exercises, rolled for hundreds of feet, ran again, marched, climbed ropes, and ate more meals, repeating the process ad nauseum. All the while, the ramrod stiff, mask faced D.I.s prodded us to run faster, roll harder, and force out yet another push up. I'd been through the U.S. Army's boot camp. It had been a breeze. Despite old movies about rugged boot camps, the one I'd passed through hadn't been anything like that. I remember waiting for a U.S. Army D.I. to challenge one of us to a fight. It happened in every movie on the subject. I'd planned to give the man the fight of his life. But to my bitter disappointment, the challenge had never come. I'd worked out harder in the prison weight room than in the U.S. Army boot camp. Those days, in prison, my biceps, triceps, deltoids had quivered with exhaustion after a strenuous workout. In comparison, Jelk Boot Camp was bad. I felt how a pit bull must feel when cruel humans beat it with sticks, kicked it in the ribs, and generally taunted the dog. 
When our android DIs were displeased with one of us, they used the obedience chips in our necks to shock us. The worst day in that regard proved to be on the obstacle course, at the wall. A D.I. raised his speaking volume, with his face, his eyes, as animated as a seashell. There was nothing vital or vibrant on his plastic-like face. He was an inorganic zombie, but his amplified voice lashed the weakest to jump and try to scale the wall again. The wall was nine feet high. In regular gravity, it would have been a cinch to jump and hoist ourselves over. Here, in double gravity... Let me put it this way. Even after the steroid 65 neurofibers and swelled muscles, the best of us barely managed, while three trainees simply couldn't do it. 712, the D.I. said, pointing at a chest-heaving man drenched in sweat. Climb the wall. The man gulped and stared up with bulging eyes. He leaped feebly, his fingers a good two feet from the top, and slid down in a heap at the bottom. Up, the D.I. said. 712 had nothing left. He stirred, though, but that was it. The D.I. aimed and clicked a small device. 712 writhed on the ground, moaning as a punishment shock struck from within his neck. Jump over the wall or you will receive another shock, the D.I. said. 712 looked up at the wall, but that was all he did. The android shocked him again, making the man jerk and vomit on the ground. Hey! I shouted. He's exhausted! Kaput! Let him rest! The android turned machine-fast to our group. Who spoke? I licked my lips and I stepped forward. We'd learned the hard way that they gave group punishments just as quickly as single man lessons. 602, the android said. You spoke without my leave. He aimed the device and a jolt struck me in the neck. I groaned, massaging my muscles, but I managed to remain upright. When I looked up again, the android had turned back to 712. The D.I. told the man to try again, but nothing happened. So the android shocked him longer this time, threatening to continue unless he cleared the wall. We have to charge the thing together, I whispered. Grimly, Rollo and Dimitri nodded. A few of the others hung back. Ready? I asked. Stand, 712, the android said. If you cannot stand, you will die where you lie. Now, I whispered. I tensed my neck and sprinted at the monster. The android shocked 712. Even so, he must have heard us. The thing whirled around fast. Stop, the D.I. said, lifting his hand. I didn't stop. And since I led, I had no idea who followed me. Pain blossomed in my neck. This time I was ready for it. I bellowed, more enraged than anything else. The android hand pointed at others, and his thumb twitched as he delivered shocks. I reached the android, grabbed the offensive bioplastic wrist, and used one of the nifty new fighting techniques they'd been teaching us. I cracked the wrist using its own leverage and drove a knee into his plastic hard belly. A jolt more powerful than the others struck the back of my neck. It was the last the D.I. gave. The shock device fell out of the android's hand. I bellowed again, landed on the D.I. like a goblin in a nightmare, and moved for his head with every ounce of my heightened strength and speed. I twisted the android's head around, snapping the neck, and had the distinct pleasure of seeing his eyelids flutter. You must stop this, he told me. I twisted again, and the lights went out in those plastic eyes. A moment later, I, and I found out later, all the rest of the trainees, were knocked out by an obedience shock broadcast from elsewhere. I awoke stretched out on a metal slate, with my legs, arms, and neck manacled to it. Below, I heard churning water and tiny gnashing noises 
like hundreds of sets of small teeth. Looking up, I spied a saurian on a perch above, standing at a control panel. A screen stretched above the lizard. The screen flickered, and Sha Cloth, the Jelk, appeared on it. Cloth sat at a desk, with a window showing stars behind him. You're a troublesome creature, Cloth said. According to this tally, you destroyed one of the teaching drones. That's destruction of property. My property. The family has already petitioned for your elimination. Now that you're awake... The drone was defective, I said. Cloth studied me. It was impossible to tell what he was thinking. Finally, he said, Explain. The drone abused one of your mercenaries, I said. One of the modified humans. I imagine neurofiber surgery and steroid shots cost a lot of money. Your money. If the teaching drone had continued its punishment shocks, one of your mercenaries would have died and you would have lost your investment. You claim to have destroyed the drone in order to save me money, Cloth asked. No, I destroyed it to save one of my fellow trainees. I merely point out that in doing so, I saved you funds. Hmm, Cloth said. You labor under several misconceptions. For instance, humans are cheap. Such manufactured bioplastic drones with culture-grown brains are expensive, at least in relation to a wild fighting beast such as you. The net expenses have put you in the red. Worse, you have already cost me much by killing an entire family cluster. True, I said. But in doing so, I showed you the utility of humans as space assault troopers. That's worth a lot of cold, hard cash and can pay for a few busted androids. You overstate your utility by an estimated factor of ten, and future profits can pay for nothing in the present. Jelk don't do credit? I asked. Cloth's dark eyes glittered. You are a glib beast with a highly inflated ego. Let us say for the moment you helped restore needed profits. You've also asked for expenditures in a nearly useless gesture. To save a few million worthless creatures on your barren planet. I still didn't like being called an animal, but I no longer lost my temper over it. In my mind, I was a mercenary. I now told Cloth. I hope to show you... Enough, Cloth said. I will not dicker with you, as the concept is insulting and irrational. What I deem interesting is your wit. It proves that wild earth beasts are more cunning than the domesticated pets we keep underfoot. The Jelk glanced at a tablet. Maybe it was an accounting ledger. Hmm, he said, looking up at me. I must admit that I applaud your combat ferocity. I hadn't believed unarmed earth beasts capable of destroying androids. Before this, I debated growing more android cultures and using them as space assault troopers. But the ease at which you destroyed one yesterday shows I may have overestimated their fighting abilities. They also take too long to grow, and as I said, they are too expensive to throw away in the risky commando operations I have in mind. He drummed his fingers on the desk, not doing them in sequence like a normal person, but tapping them down all together at once. Normally I'd terminate such a troublesome creature like you who willfully destroys my property. The problem is that I've sunk too much capital into this venture. You earth beast. I have an enterprise for you and your ilk. It will be a deadly proposition, do not doubt it. 
Yet the same monies needed to make the attempt. He grinned at me. The Jelk Corporation has yet to acquire a forerunner artifact. They are entirely rare and astronomically costly. If I could capture the Altair object... He mused. Once more, the Jelk drummed his fingers on the desk. Time is of the essence. Yes, I will accelerate the training schedule. I have bid on a raid fleet, and believe... He paused again, thinking. Then Clath leaned forward. Do not destroy any more property. If it will calm your mayhem, I will instruct the Tex to check the androids. My advice to you is to endure, learn, and refrain from incurring my wrath. One more such incident, and I will let the family indulge in one of their primitive customs of retribution. Do I make myself clear? Yes, I said. Release him, Clath told the watching Saurian. There seemed something different about this lizard. For a moment, I thought the Saurian would dump me into the pool of carnivorous fish thrashing below. Then he hissed, relaxed his posture, and tapped a control, and my metal slate began sliding toward the exit. I returned to the training group, and the androids appeared to hold no malice toward my destroying one of their number. I say appeared because it turned out that one of them held a grudge. It also knew how to bide its time, though. For the next few days, we exercised and ate heartily, helping our overstrained, steroid-glutted muscles to expand. Soon, we began studying insertion tactics, laser rifles, pulse grenades, and a host of other vacuum combat-related topics. Five days after the android-destroying incident, a beefed-up force of D.I.s took us to a small arms range. There, we fired laser rifles. These were hefty things, weighing 14 or 15 pounds. Each time a beam fired, the rifle purred with power. We could fire concentrated beams of annihilating strength, hosing and sweeping laterally as if it was a machine gun, or we could use pencil-thin rays for sniper shots. There was even a setting for wide beam. Ammo, or power, really, was supplied by the battery packs we shoved into them. Interestingly, these lasers fired visible light, the better to help us aim them. Frankly, the tech was awesome. Bullets always had some kind of drop or drift. Laser rays didn't drop or drift, but shot in a perfectly straight line to target. Not that these things could fire effectively, or killingly, terribly far. After 300 yards, the beam dissipated as it lost its tight coherence. At 600 yards, they could blind enemy troops if you hit them in the eyes, but the ray wouldn't burn through armor at that range. The next day, we heaved pulse grenades. They flashed brilliantly. If you looked at them while they went off, purple splotches filled your vision. The nifty thing about them was that with a twist of the ring around one, you could change its setting. Maximum setting would produce a violent explosion, killing everyone in a 50-yard radius. I wondered if a pulse grenade could breach a lander's hull. The days merged in hard work. I'd put on thirty pounds already, and with the neurofibers, I could move fast. Eventually, the androids brought back the bio-battle suits. After watching the symbiotic suits slither away in the showers, I had my reservations concerning them. It was too bad Cloth couldn't have given us powered armor like those in many SF novels I used to read. I imagine the living armor was cheaper and helped the Jelk accounting sheet. After stepping onto my blob and watching the second skin cover me, I saw the android shove boxes at us. I opened a box and found combat boots inside. They were like blocks of metal and seemed too big. The weird thing was that the living armor moved off my feet, allowing me to squeeze the boots on. Afterward, the second skin oozed over the metal, sealing it shut. I donned a bulky helmet next. 
We all had helmets, and these were sci-fi marvels. The helmet fit over my head and reached under my chin. That meant the second skin sealed this thing tight. Vacuum tight. I had bio-armor, combat boots, and helmet. After we fit oxygen tanks and maneuvering thrusters onto our backs, we followed the D.I.s into a new corridor. They took us to airlocks and onto the surface of our training ship. I peered at the distant Earth. Out here it was the size of the moon as seen from my backyard. Mad Jack had never made it this far into space. I snarled and silently renewed my vow. My dad wouldn't die in vain. The Lohars would pay for their infamy. I would learn everything I could, and the universe would see that Earthers weren't animals, but the most dangerous soldiers around. For the next five days, we learned magnetic walking, thruster flying, and to trust our living armor to keep us alive in the vacuum of space. The helmets contained a computer, a HUD visor, and a two-way communication system. We could slave our laser rifles to the HUD so a targeting image appeared. Wherever we pointed the muzzle, that's what the targeting circle marked. We practiced flying shots, fast maneuvers, and how to sail silently through the dark. Enduring the loneliness of space and trusting in our helmet's computer-calculated trajectory. The training ship moved around the solar system and we learned the battlesuits could take heavy doses of radiation of all kinds. Maybe as good, the biosuits soaked up sunlight, helping them regenerate and supplying us with energized strength. For the next step in our training, we landed on Ceres, in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. There we learned about low-gravity maneuvering. Jump too hard, and off you sailed into space, having reached escape velocity. You'd see the rocks below and wait to start falling, but instead you kept heading farther away from the surface. In the end, you had to rotate yourself and aim your head at the rocks, using the thrusters to bring you back down. The art of low-gravity gliding took time to master. After we'd practiced all we could on Ceres, we inserted onto Io, a moon of Jupiter. The monstrous gas giant loomed before us with its colorful bands on the planet. I could hardly believe where I was, and how far I had come from Earth. The worst thing about Io was the radiation pounding our suits. Jupiter's magnetic field poured out the deadly rads. The biosuits could take it, our skin and bones underneath not as well. The suits secreted a substance directly into us through our skin, repairing internal damage. It wasn't fun and most of us complained about aching bones and a metal taste in our mouths. Later, with the sun little bigger than a star, we inserted onto Charon, Pluto's icy moon. It was cold out here, and proved a bad idea to lay on your biosuit for long on the methane snow. A nearly absolute cold drained life energy from the biosuit at a frightful pace, intended to boil the methane from your own heat. That meant one stayed standing on his boots, clumping over methane ice. On this training exercise, our retrieval boat took longer than normal to pick us up. The biosuits became stiff, and the cold began seeping into us. Ella figured out a solution. We set our bulky laser rifles on wide beam and carefully shot each other. That warmed the biosuits long enough for us to survive the tardy pickup. The android pilot who set the boat down watched us with his plastic eyes as we boarded. He seemed like a zombie in his coldness. From that moment, I began to wonder and to distrust what rattled around in their brains. During our weeks flittering around the solar system, we learned about zero-G maneuvering, ship assault tactics, and other vacuum combat practices, including space survival skills. We'd been talking, and Rollo shared my doubts concerning our ultimate utility to Shah Cloth. In space, warships would be able to beam anything that moved, including star soldiers like us. And once a commander destroyed all opposition, why would his task force need space assault troopers? 
Would enemy soldiers continue to resist in a half-destroyed space station that had no hope of surviving? This wasn't like the old days of Greek triremes or British ships of the line. In those old days, waterborne navies used boarding tactics. Hoplites with spears charged across, or Romans with short swords raced across a corvus onto Carthaginian galleys. Later, pirates with cutlasses swarmed merchant ships, or Napoleonic sailors swung onto enemy frigates, attempting to storm and capture. At a certain tech point, that no longer made sense. During World War II, Japanese sailors never tried to storm a U.S. battleship. In the Gulf War, Saddam would have never thought of slipping commandos onto a U.S. carrier. Such a thing, space commandos swarming an enemy spaceship, seemed even less likely, not more. Maybe we would be more like swimmers trying to attach a mine onto a ship's hull in a harbor. Yeah, I could see that, I suppose. It also seemed incredibly dangerous and unlikely to work often. Worse, it struck me as closer to a suicide mission than a soldier's task. Eating, fighting, space flying, asteroid walking, the extra weeks merged into a quick month and a half. Finally, our androids declared us battle ready. Yippee as Bruce Willis would have said in his diehard persona. Before our first mission, I asked for a last interview with Shah Cloth, our Jelk overlord. For the last several weeks, a plan had been brewing in the back of my mind. I needed to get down to Earth to speak to several groups of survivors. First, I needed to see how they were doing and if Cloth was corrupting them. Then I needed to plant an idea, a seed, into people who could transmit the idea to others. No one else had stormed a Saurian lander. No one else I'd met so far hated the aliens like I did. Did that mean I had grandiose ideas? You bet it did. The man who considers himself beaten is beaten. The man that still strives, no matter what the odds stacked against him, has a chance. I'd been racking my brain on how to convince Clark to let me go down to Earth. I'd finally figured out a way but it would need a silver tongue. Mine. I'd let him know, through the androids, that I could help him achieve his desired profits, a way that would also bolster our chances of success. Surprisingly, I got the interview a day later. Before I relate the talk, I believe this would be a good place to say a few words concerning the Jelk Corporation. I'd learned a lot about it these past weeks. The most obvious truth about space and other star systems was that aliens should be alien, or different from humans. That was a logical conclusion. How could strange species like Saurians or Lohars act the same as humans? Such an idea did not compute. Certainly there were things out here much different from how humanity operated on Earth for all these centuries. Still... Some things were hauntingly similar, or parallel enough to understand. What I'm trying to say was that the Jelk Corporation had a similar analog in human history. Several hundred years ago, there had been a corporation called the East India Company. British merchant traders had created it, and the company had actually run most of the British foreign affairs during the colonial era, at least in the Far East and in India. It helped start a few wars, too particularly against China. Those had been called the Opium Wars. The reason for those conflicts was simple, a monetary trade imbalance. The British were losing large amounts of silver and gold to China. Like most interesting things, it was actually uncomplicated. The English loved drinking tea. Therefore, they imported gargantuan amounts of tea from China. Back then, it had been the only place that could grow tea in large enough quantities. A saying grew up because of that. I wouldn't do that for all the tea in China. A person could have just as easily said, I won't do that for all the money in the world. In those days, the British were the world's greatest merchants, and they had helped build the world's greatest empire. As good merchants, they wanted to trade goods to China for the tea instead of shipping them silver and gold. That was because bullion was how everyone counted victory points or winning. 
The more you stacked up, the more you had won the game of nations. The more silver and gold you paid to others, the worse you had lost. There was one problem with the idea. The English didn't make or have anything that the Chinese wanted. For most of China's existence, its highly cultured people had only wanted Chinese things. Nothing was as civilized. With increasing desperation, the merchants of the East India Company searched for a product the Chinese would want and want badly. They finally found one. Opium. The British merchants grew the opium in India and shipped it to China in trade for tea. Later, the merchants sat around their dining table sipping tea as they bragged about the new pro-British trade imbalance. The drug pushers had done such a fantastic job that more and more millions of Chinese became opium addicts. China didn't have enough tea to pay for all the opium, and soon Chinese merchants began shipping silver and gold back to England to pay for the drugs their customers wanted. Now, the Chinese government didn't approve of this. Opium dens by the hundreds of thousands had opened in China, and too many people had turned into useless slugs, opium addicts. So the Chinese government had started one of the first wars on drugs. They chopped off the heads of opium sellers and forbade any more shipment of opium into their country. The lords of the East India Company realized they were in trouble due to this policy. If the Chinese kicked the habit, the English trade imbalance would once again tip to the Chinese. Money bellowed. The lords of the East India Company demanded their bought politicians supply them with British warships to teach the Chinese a lesson and force them to allow the sale of opium again. It took several such wars, but the Chinese were coerced. Through destroyed ships and burning port cities, and the opium dens remained open creating endless addicts who pumped England with increasingly more wealth. The point of this tale is that powerful armed trading companies or corporations had been successful on Earth and also appeared to thrive in the space lanes. It appeared that the principles of economics were universal. From what I'd learned so far, the Jelt Corporation would have made the British East India Company look like Boy Scouts. The British had used Gurkhas and Sikhs as company soldiers. Those were tough mercenaries from mountainous areas north of India. Similarly, the Jelk used Saurians, and now humans, and who knew what else? I already knew most of this, as an android ushered me into the pilot chamber aboard Assault Ship 6. It had several seats. The one I sat in had a silver patch on the left part. I'd gained forty-five pounds of muscle since storming the lander in Antarctica. I wore a green coverall, had shaved my scalp, and could easily catch any fly that would have dared buzz past my face. I also bore some extra scars gained during training. Like most things Earth-born, flies were probably extinct now. Hard to believe, I know. The Bioterminator had done a splendid job. I wanted the interview for one key reason. To learn if Cloth had kept his end of the bargain concerning the freighters. Interestingly, the pilot android wore a combat suit of cyber armor, complete with helmet, visor, and sidearm. He watched me the entire time. I glanced to the side at a viewing port. It showed me Saturn up close and personal. The ring nearest the ship was composed of endless floating rocks and chunks of ice. They merged together in the distance as the ring encircled the gas giant. Assault Ship 6 was in orbit around Saturn. I hadn't been back to Earth since the lander lifted off it. A screen flickered into life and I saw a shot cloth. There were no smiles from him. He studied me with his dark eyes, and the evil of his intelligence shined through clearly. I must have been too exhausted from killing Saurians, and too amped up from the bio-battle suit that day six weeks ago to recognize the devilishness there. And while on the metal slate, I'd been too concerned with the churning fish waiting for my dumped body to study the joke closely. My time is limited, Cloth said. As is yours. You spoke about heightening your battle abilities. 
ensuring your coming success. You've surprised me in the past, and I calculated you might again. So you may explain your idea to me. This was it. His eyes troubled me, with their evil and their cunning. I desperately needed to get back down to Earth. Could I convince him to let me go? The trick was to tell him things he wanted to hear. I'd learned the hard way that it was easier to fool someone who wanted to be fooled. If a person spent his life trying to make a quick buck, he would be the easier one to con than an old codger gripping his dollars with a tight fist. Be bold, I told myself. It's easy enough, I told Cloth. I and the others are concerned about the surviving Earth people back home. We're wondering what sort of bonus we can earn for our people by our victory for you. Bonus? Who said anything about a bonus? Cloth asked. The androids are robotic and too expensive to make for good space assault troopers, I said. You need thinking beings. Fighting beasts. Cloth corrected. One, two, three. I silently counted to myself. You need intelligent soldiers using cunning maneuvers and heightened by good morale, I said. A bonus, a reward, if you will, encourages Earth troops to fight better. The Jelk stared at me. What went on behind those dark eyes? Cloth finally stirred and said, There is merit in your idea. What bonus do you seek? So far so good, I told myself. As you know, I fight for the Jelk Corporation in order to help my people survive as a species. Given greater rewards, I will fight more zealously and even sacrifice myself if it will bring aid to— Cloth raised a hand. I'd learned enough these past weeks to know when to stop. Not all Earth beasts would fight as you suggest, given such rewards, Cloth said. Many are satisfied with lesser and cheaper bonuses. I knew that to be true. But I had to shift that truth. Yes, I said. But those mercenaries are not the most able among us. A questionable thesis, Cloth said. Your observers watched World War II, I said. If you glance at the files, I believe you'll find that honor-oriented combat troops fighting for something greater than themselves make better soldiers. The self-centered and more easily satisfied space assault troopers will not give the Gel Corporation as useful a service as the first kind. Earth beasts lack objectivity, Cloth said. Too many of you appear to be dreamers with grandiose ideas that exaggerate your importance. Dreamers, I said as my gut tightened with triumph. I would snare him with his own words. I forced myself to speak naturally. You state the situation more succinctly than I could. Dreamers need dreams to help motivate them. Such motivated dreamers make the best soldiers. Our history is replete with examples. Cloth pressed his red fingertips against his forehead. I noticed for the first time that Jelk lacked fingernails, but appeared to have hardened skin there instead. He pulled his fingers away from his head and glanced at them. He appeared to have noticed my scrutiny. If you fight well, he said, and bring me the artifact, I will grant you a bonus. Excellent, I said. This was working. In order for me to inform the others, I will inform them, Cloth said. Okay. If you could provide us pictures or videos of the survivors, 
and then describe what the bonus would be in concrete terms. What difference would any of that make? Cloth asked. I have spoken. My word is final. To see is to believe, I said. And the more concrete the reward, the easier it will be for us to conceptualize it. We are dreamers, but we must believe the dream is true. You are primitives indeed, Cloth said. Maybe, I said. But we will fight better if you've made your point. Now I grow weary of your voice and your dull-witted appearance. You ape jelk likeness, but you are nothing like us. I hesitated for a fraction of a second before plunging into the meat of my reason for being here. To add power to the videos, I suggest you send some of us down to see how the survivors are doing. For what reason? Cloth asked. So you can escape? I want to save my people, I said. You hired me as a mercenary. If I give you what you want, you give me what I want. I have no reason to escape. You are an animal, no matter how hard you attempt to practice civilized behavior, Cloth said. It was at this moment I began to envision myself putting a leash around Cloth's neck and dragging him around like a dog. With a shake of my head, I forced myself to concentrate on the matters at hand. Why do you care who or what I act like? I asked. As long as you gain profits from me. Cloth showed off his pointy teeth. The back ones glistened. You will go down to Earth and report back to the others. Does that satisfy you? I found myself leaning toward the screen. I must have been inching forward the entire time. I now forced myself to sit back, to relax. Yes, I said. I'm satisfied. The screen turned a dull color and thereby ended the interview. I'd done it. I was on my way to Earth for a visit. I heaved a sigh of relief, even though I knew that the hardest part lay ahead of me. Chapter 10 The six weeks I'd been training in space could have been six years, six decades, or even six centuries. The Earth had changed that much. The only animals left on Earth now, at least that I saw, were those in the Jelk junk freighters landed on Earth. The Lohar thermonuclear fireballs had destroyed dozens of the largest cities. They had bigger bombs, too, planet wreckers, throwing up hundreds of billions of tons of dust into the atmosphere. The purple, orange, and red skies were like nothing I'd seen before. The air was now poisonous, laced with bioterminator. I wore my bio suit with boots, helmet, and breather as I walked through Fresno, California. Winds howled, and everywhere I looked were the dead amid rusting cars and trucks. It was worse than any Stephen King novel, a true nightmare. Paper and debris fluttered everywhere. It made me sick walking the lonely streets. I crouched by a dead girl with shreds of a yellow dress. She wore a little USA flag pin, while a Maltese puppy decomposed beside her. The end of the leash was still clutched in the little girl's dead hand. The Lohars had done this. The militarists of interstellar space figured Earth soldiers would have given the Jelk too much of an advantage. That, at least, was Cloth's version of the story. I wondered where the truth lay. I walked past dead trees, crunching over brittle leaves. A hundred-dollar bill blew past. It was useless now. I kicked spent shotgun shells, empty beer bottles, and bags of rotting groceries. Fresno, California, had died. A ghost town of a bygone era. 
I found the same thing in Reno, Nevada, in Billings, Montana, in Kansas City, Kansas. The android piloted my air car in my direction. We toured the U.S. I hadn't been home since leaving for the war in Afghanistan several years ago. Now I could never go home again. Not to the earth that had been. The aliens had stolen it from me. It turned out that our worst nightmare never came true. That of angry nations launching nuclear missiles at each other. The aliens had launched the nukes and more. The entire planet was like the Japanese Hiroshima of World War II. I guess the rulers of North Korea had been right in their manufacturing of a few thermonuclear bombs. In the days before the aliens came, nuclear deterrence theory said that once a country had atomic weapons, other countries would not threaten its existence for fear of retaliation. It seemed to me, as I toured the dead world, that humanity needed a few terror weapons of its own. We needed bioterminators and planet wreckers. Part of me screamed for revenge against the Lohars. Another part said to let it go. That humanity was going to have enough of a task coming back from the edge of extinction. We didn't need diehard foes. We just needed a place to call our own, and a delivery system capable of threatening fearful harm against any enemy who attacked us. Hmm. Maybe we did need to smash the Lohars, to show the other space races what happened when you picked a fight with Earth. First, we needed to free ourselves from under the Jelk thumb. That's why I'd come back. That's what my plan, a long-term project, entailed. For a hundred miles, as the air car slid across the sky, I ground my teeth together. Humanity had traded places. We were no longer the lords of our domain. We'd become dogs to tame and leash. At best, we were beggars, living off jelt tech. Where's the nearest shelter? I asked the android. He turned back, seeming to measure me with his plastic orbs. Guy got your tongue? I asked. The android faced forward, turned our air car sharp left, and kicked in afterburners, or something like that. I sank back against my seat. I still wore the bio suit and helmet. If the android wanted to start something, I was more than ready to finish it. I didn't trust the androids, not since Karen. I didn't know what went on inside their vat-grown brains, as their mask-like faces gave nothing away. The situation reminded me of Will Smith and iRobot. When was the super truck going to come along and launch a hundred of these plastic men at me? After a steady journey of some time, I looked out a window. Three giant freighters lay in a huge triangle down there at the tip of Baja, California. Each vessel was several kilometers long. Some kind of plastic sheeting bound the ends together. The same material connected the center area between the space freighters. The android landed to the north of the freighter complex setting us down with a thump between groves of dead almond trees. It was at that point the android decided to speak, using his monotone voice. Jean Cloth wished me to inform you that you cannot visit them in your bio-suit. I'd learned how to shed the second skin on my own. I did so now, watching the black slime ooze from me. My normal skin always went from stark white to blushing red as the symbiotic substance oozed off. Then my skin finally settled back to its regular color. I wondered about that, about what caused the changes. I hefted the blob and deposited it into a warm cylinder, closing the lid and turning on the heat lamp, what we called it, anyway. I donned a regular spacesuit. A similar kind as the Saurian man-catcher had worn the day he walked through the tank membrane to confront me. Are you staying here? I asked. The android didn't answer. I didn't like this one. Something odd was going on inside its brain. Whatever, 
I said. I'll be seeing you. I exited the airlock and crunched over dead ground. No birds sang, no beetles scurried from under kicked clumps, and no spider webs hung anywhere. The destruction was worse than I'd expected. I walked through a ghost world. We'd had billions of people seven weeks ago. Now a few million were left. Didn't the Lohars have any soul? Were the space militarists actually androids or robots? Or were they something totally alien that they could contemplate genocide of an intelligent species? I suppose some humans would have said we got what we deserved. We'd been busy wiping out various Earth species. Now it was our time. Our turn. Well, I didn't hold to that kind of thinking. It was crazy. What the Lohars had done. I looked up at clouds racing the wind. They seemed like alien destroyers, their purple shapes sliding faster than I'd ever seen before. Dust swirled around me, and shrieks whipped past my helmet. The apocalypse had come. The angel had sounded the last trumpet, and the alien Lohars had brought us Armageddon. In a bleak frame of mind, I approached the Jelk freighters. I expected guards in spacesuits holding rifles to challenge me. There was nothing but dead grass and deader weeds. I banged on an airlock. Using my fist, I hammered for a solid three minutes. Finally, a green light flashed, and the airlock slid open with a tortured groan of metal. I didn't like the sound of that. Just how far gone was this thing? I entered a steel chamber. The lock slammed shut behind me, and hoses first blasted air and then chemical cleaning agents. It lasted longer than I would have expected. I thought about that. I realized if the bio-terminator made it inside the vessels, poof, there went a sizable chunk of remaining humanity. It was good they went to such lengths. It meant some humans still had fight in their bellies. I needed that. A second airlock opened, and a voice in English asked me to strip. I complied, entered a third chamber, and went through another chemical bath. In the fourth chamber I found clothes, jeans, a buttoned shirt, and running shoes. Nostalgia slammed home. This would be the only world in the universe where I'd feel like I belonged. I took a deep breath, trying to prepare myself for the ordeal at hand. Then I entered a freighter world of sardine-packed survivors. It was like a movie of old China, or your favorite summer fair packed with jostling kids. Wall-to-wall -wall people filled corridors, rooms, chambers, lounges, and rows of seats. The smell of sweat and unwashed bodies slammed against me. The stench reminded me too much of prison or of any place that packed men together too tightly for too long. As I looked around, I realized that was one of the problems. As a ratio of those remaining, too many men had survived. Tough men. Angry men. Mean suckers with the look of death in their eyes as they stared back at me. There were too few children around, and not enough women. The squalor of these surroundings and the hopelessness I was seeing in so many faces made me doubt my plan for them. I didn't doubt my goal, but I did wonder if anything could shake these people out of their despair. This place was worse than a ghetto. Then I met the leader as she and her henchmen made their way through the crowd. They were an intimidating crew, and people shrank away from them. The woman leading the crew was tall, with wide hips, large breasts, and surprisingly handsome features. She had thick, dark hair tied in a ponytail and wore combat fatigues with a big knife on her hip. She seemed like the queen of the Amazons, and I had no doubt she could fight. Four huge henchmen followed, the smallest a head taller than me, making the man six-seven. The biggest man was black, had a bald head, and moved in an athletic way that told me he was lethal. 
The man stared at me. I'd been in black sand, and had been around some vicious guard dogs before. The meanest had been a big brood of a Rottweiler that used to just stare, and I'd known he'd wanted to bite a chunk out of me. The biggest henchman had eyes like that, and I felt his desire to tear me to shreds. The group stopped before me, and the Queen of the Amazons put her hands on her hips. Are you the man from space? she asked. She had a seductive voice, and it flowed through me with power. I was beginning to realize how she ruled this place. I'd had a speech prepared for the occasion, but now I wasn't sure I should start that way. The woman, her henchmen, their glares and stances spoke volumes concerning their hostility toward me. Yeah, I said. I'm the man from space. Her shoulders shifted. It was a subtle thing. I don't know what she expected from me. You look strong, she said. Hey, how about that, I said. But my men could take you. She snapped her fingers. Like that. Maybe six weeks ago they could have taken me. But not after my training, increased strength, size, and most of all, speed. I wouldn't bet a beer on them, I said. She made a show of frowning, and he glanced behind me before she stared into my eyes again. You're brave, spaceman. I don't see any backup for you. Why would I need any? I asked. I don't know. Your alien overlords nuked our world and then packed the few survivors into these tin cans. Now you're coming down here, what, to lay down the law? How often has jumping to conclusions helped you? I asked. She shook her head. I don't like your cockiness, mister. This is my place, my home, not yours. Do you want me to beat him up? The black henchman asked, the one with the eyes like a Rottweiler. She glanced at him. I want to ask him a few questions first. Off the word? He asked. It will depend on his answers, she said. I can make him eat his teeth, the henchman said. No one is as strong and quick as you, Demetrius, she said. The man's chest swelled with pride, and his big hands opened and closed. What if hurting me means the aliens burn this freighter down? I snapped my fingers. And all of you die like that. She smiled. It was a mean thing, but it had an effect. I re-examined her, the stance, the long hair, our breasts strained against her combat fatigues. The woman had a sexual power, and she obviously knew how to use it, making her a master of manipulation. What was she trying to prove? What's it like up there? she asked. She threatened me with violence and she'd done it in front of her people. Now she openly quizzed me? I had plans, but those plans included me running things. That meant I had to do things right from the start. Did you hear me, spaceman? She asked. It's cold up there, I said. That's not what I meant. And it's lonely, I added. Her eyes narrowed, and her lips parted. It seemed she was about to give an order. It struck me then that I was dealing with a ruthless individual. The freighters were like prison back in the day. The toughest, strongest, and most ruthless had ruled there. The woman could never match Demetrius and those like him in physical strength. No doubt she used intellect, cold-bloodedness, and cunning to stay in charge. That meant I couldn't let her outmaneuver me and expect her to listen, really listen to what I had to say. That meant I had to play an old game. The woman would only respect someone mentally stronger than herself. 
Mister, she said, you want to be careful how you talk to me. That's funny, I said. I was just about to tell you the same thing. Demetrius, she said, sidestepping away from me. Hurt him, but don't kill him. I still have some questions I want answered. Demetrius didn't lumber at me like most big men would have done. He looked away 320 pounds and had size and reach on me. He came like a black belt in karate, hands up and approaching carefully. This man had beautiful coordination, and I sensed he had unusual speed. Are you sure you want to go this route? I asked the woman. You look muscular, and I'm guessing the aliens think you're tough, she said. I want to see if it's true. Fair enough, I said, before concentrating on Demetrius. Are you planning on breaking any bones? He intensified his Rottweiler stare down, and he opened and closed his hands several times. Then he made his first mistake. His eyes flickered to the right of me and gave a tight little nod. He shouldn't have done that. It alerted me, and I heard the scuff of a boot behind and to my left. I guess the lady wasn't taking any chances on losing one of her bad boys. I slipped to the side and half-turned. A slender man with a sap in his hand moved toward me from the crowd at my back. As he did, his hand and the sap he held blurred as it aimed for my head. I moved faster, and I caught his wrist and twisted. Those nearest must have heard his wrist bones snap. The slender man's eyes went wide with shock. I pivoted, tucked my torso, and hurled him at Demetrius. The body connected with a karate chop, and the slender man went down hard onto the deck plates. Several things happened at once, then. Instead of continuing his attack, Demetrius retreated. I saw the surprise on his face. He practiced caution, and it told me the man was more dangerous than I'd realized. I picked up the leather-coated sap. While staring at the woman and using both hands, I tore the leather apart so lead shot rained onto the floor. He's stronger than he looks. Demetrius told her. And a whole lot faster, the woman said. What did the aliens do to you? Is that one of your questions? I asked. Why are you so angry? She said. Her question ran deeper than my just being angry at the attack. She must have sensed the rage that boiled in me at the Lohars, at the androids and cloths, high-handed manner toward the so-called human beasts. Do you have any idea about the bargain I made that gained you the shelter? I asked. Unease entered her eyes. Gained it for me, specifically? She asked. The four henchmen, led by Demetrius, protectively flanked her and looked ready to charge me. Did she think I'd picked her to be my woman? Is that how she interpreted my words? No, not just you, I said. I bargained for everyone or anyone who happens to be living. I made sure they found survival in a Jelk freighter. This is about keeping the human race alive. She traded glances with Demetrius. He gave another of his little nods. Facing me, she asked, What did the bargain cost you? We need to talk in private, I said instead of answering. She stared at me for three seconds before saying, Follow me. I have to admit, I didn't want to. They could ambush me or lead me to some horrific end. But I'd come alone for a reason. I had to believe these people still used reason. If they didn't, then everything I was doing would be moot anyway. The woman halted and glanced back at me. Are you coming or not? she asked. I nodded and followed her, liking the sway of those hips. She led us through a maze. Everywhere we went, people jumped off the floor and slid against the walls, getting out of her way. 
Their actions told me the woman used terror at times. It also told me the aliens left humanity alone in the freighters. That part was good. This brutality, I didn't like it. Humanity was turning wolf again, falling back towards savagery. They were making Shah Cloth's words true. I had to make them become lies. We entered a larger corridor, with chairs along the sides and rugs thrown down. Many of the chairs held women, the most in one place and the prettiest I'd seen so far, besides the leader. Many had pregnant bellies. I approved of that part of it. I'm not sure they liked the men or the leader, but what could I do about that now? It was survival of the fittest, the meanest, and the most hard-headed. I understood about the iron law of prison, the law of tooth and claw, as stated by Jack London in Call of the Wild. I should have realized it would be like this and prepared accordingly. She sat in a chair and indicated another one facing her. I noticed my chair had its back to the people in here. Picking it up, I repositioned the chair so I had a wall behind me. She glanced at Demetrius before turning her chair to face me. You're not too trusting, she said. Are you? I asked. She smiled faintly, and it was all the answer I needed. I'm Creed, I said. She frowned, and I expected her to ask what my first name was. Instead, she said, I've heard that name somewhere. Mad Jack Creed, I said. Who is that? She asked. You never watch TV? Her eyes widened. The shuttle pilot who went to meet the aliens. His name was Creed. He was my dad, I said. Oh, I'm sorry. I shrugged. He went the way he would have wanted. I can't say that for the rest of humanity. So why did the aliens do it? She asked. And why do you work for them? Her questions told me plenty. First, that Cloth or the androids hadn't told these people much about anything. Before we really start, I said, I need two things. To begin, what's your name? Diana, she said. Like Diana the Huntress, I asked. Yes, she said. I'm the Roman moon goddess, and I hunt those who displease me. I bet, I said. Now the second thing I'm going to need to know is if you have any brandy. Any booze at all. Why would you need to know that? Because I need a drink, I said. Diana measured me with her gaze, and finally she glanced at Demetrius. The big henchman growled an order. A pregnant woman slid off her chair, opened a cooler, and brought him two Budweiser cans. He stood there, with one in each hand. Give our guest a beer, Diana said. I'll take the other one. Demetrius practically threw a can at me. With neurofiber-enhanced speed, I snatched it out of the air, doing it in a lazy way, as if bored with them. I noticed Diana's eyes. They shone with appreciation. Did she used to be a cage-fighting junkie? This lady obviously knew about fighting men. Thanks, I said, popping the tab so spray fizzled out and then foam bubbled. I slurped the foam before guzzling the beer until I drained the can. That tasted good. Get me another one, I said. I have a lot to say, and it's going to make my tongue dry. I could see the wheels turning inside Diana's mind. Do it, she told Demetrius. I tossed my empty can aside. Diana sipped from hers. I haven't had a beer for weeks, I said. Your masters don't give you any? She asked. I decided to let that pass. 
In truth, I appreciated her angry heat toward the aliens. At least she hadn't turned into a bootlicker. You run all three freighters, or just this area? I asked. She measured me again with those blue eyes of hers. If I didn't know better, I would have felt as if she sized me up to be her partner. There was a hint of promise in her look. The terror I'd seen earlier in the people here cautioned me toward trusting what I saw in Diana. This woman used guile in everything. Of that I had no doubt. I run half this freighter, she said. Rex Hodges is lord of the rest of it. Is someone in charge of everything? I asked. You're with the aliens, she said. That means you should know more about how things work down here. You shouldn't be asking me those kinds of questions. I'll tell you what, I said. Everything you think you know about the situation and about me, erase it from your thinking. Things aren't how you think they are. That's one of the reasons I'm here. What's that supposed to mean? That you should listen more carefully to what I'm saying. Secondly, that you should hurry up and answer my questions. I don't have much time. It took several seconds, but she nodded. No one has had the guts to try to grab full power. Truth is, we're not sure the aliens will let us. Are there any aliens aboard the freighters? She laughed in a throaty way. Not a chance. We'd kill them if there were. She glowered at me. Some of us have been wondering if you're here to impose some kind of martial alien law. Why are you here, spaceman? Tell us the truth. One of the other henchmen handed me a second beer. I cracked the tab and sipped this time. Diana, I said. The Lohars destroyed our world. The Jelk, the one who owns these freighters, must have chased the Lohar ship away. I don't know anything about that, she said. I noticed she didn't say we, but I. That was important. For the next several hours, I told her what I knew. Her men brought more beer, and time passed as I related my story. It's bad, then, Diana said. The Jelk are our jailers or minders. You'd better win them that Altair object. Tell me, Diana, what do you want out of life? She leaned back in her chair so the metal creaked. She eyed me, and I felt something stir. Survive it for now, I guess. Keep running the show as long as I'm smart enough. Several of her henchmen nodded. You're living like cons in here, I said. That doesn't seem to be a way for the last humans to live. Seems doesn't have much to do with anything anymore, Diana said. We're just doing it by keeping ourselves alive. Listen, I said. I figured it was time to broach the topic, to get down to the business of my visit. What I'm seeing around me... It's going to take a strong and cunning person to change things for the better. Even more than that, it's going to take good ideas. You need to find truly hard-headed people among the leaders and their henchmen. You need to set up a secret society with the goal of supplanting the aliens. As I talked, Diana's features became blank, a wall to hide her emotions or thoughts. What you're saying sounds like you're betraying your word to the Jelk, she said. Like treason. I laughed bitterly. Do you think it would be treason if a dog on a leash slithered free of its collar and wandered around town for a while? That's not treason. That's an animal breaking loose. The Jelk think we're beasts. Animals don't have any more loyalty than licking the hand that feeds them. It's really that bad? Diana asked. Worse, I said. Much worse. We don't have a chance, then. Our time is over. Wrong, I said. But if you really think so, 
I'm talking to the wrong person. Diana stroked her jaw, thinking. I didn't want her to think too much in the wrong direction. Meaning, I didn't want her hopeless, but hopeful. Tell me, Diana, what did you do before this? I ran a lumber mill in Alaska. It was hard work. Her answer surprised me, and I doubted she told me the truth. But I would play along. You know how to keep things going, then, I said. Running a gang in a place like this is more than heavy fists. You need to know how to deliver the goods, to keep order. You have a crew behind you, and they look tough enough. But you, we, need more than that. You have to start a secret society that lives and breathes freedom for humanity. You have to start whipping these people into shape, teaching them the right things so they're ready to act when a real chance comes along. What exactly am I supposed to teach them? She asked. I can't think of everything, I said. I have enough troubles out in space. I helped buy you this opportunity, though. I bought our race time in order to turn things around. You have to come up with some ideas, some schemes on your own. Just what are you planning to do? She asked. I drank a few beers, not that many, but enough to loosen up some. I pulled my chair closer to hers until our knees touched. Her eyebrows rose, and I noticed Demetrius bristling. It must have been spite, but I patted her knee, letting my hand linger there. I don't plan on living the rest of my life being treated as a beast, I said in a low voice. I don't plan on letting us sink into extinction. The cards are stacked against us. That's clear, right? She glanced at my hand before nodding. I'm going to cheat, Diana. I'm going to do whatever I can whenever I get the chance to reshuffle the deck. The truth is that I have no idea what I'm going to do exactly. I didn't know my entire plan when I charged up the ramp into the alien lander. I'm watching them closely. I'm learning, and I'm getting more dangerous every day. One thing I'm going to do is fight with every ounce of my mind and muscles to tear the slave collar off of my neck. We're going to be free, and we're going to hammer the Lohars like they've never believed possible. Big talk, Diana said. Yeah, you said it. I don't know where I read it, but a person once said that boldness is genius and has power all on its own. I plan to be bold like you wouldn't believe. Who dares wins, Demetrius said. Now take your hand off her knee. I glanced at him, and in the interest of peace, I took my hand away. You never heard that one, he asked. No, I said. It was the SAS motto, he said. The British Special Air Service. I did note an accent, a slight one. If Demetrius used to be S.A.S., that would make him doubly dangerous. From your stories, Diana said, your boldness has almost gotten you killed a couple of times. It seems to me you might try another way. Maybe, I said. My boldness has also given humanity a slim opportunity to rise up from the ashes of total defeat. I need fighters, Diana. I need men and women back here who will dare to dream with me. Maybe I'm a fool to confide in you. I don't know. I have to take a chance. I have to practice boldness. I don't know how many of the various freighter shelters the Jelk are going to let me visit, but I'm going to keep preaching. You have to be ready. Ready for what? She asked. I shoved away from her and stood up. She and her listening henchmen stood with me. Demetrius hunched forward, with his hands opening and closing as if he wanted to attack me again and finish it. He must still be thinking about my hand on her knee. Come on, Diana, I said. You already know for what. Didn't you learn about your country's origin? Or did you go to the new public schools if I got to teach old-fashioned American values like freedom, liberty, and courage? 
George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Patrick Henry. Give me liberty or give me death. Do you want to be a dog the rest of your existence? Hell no, she said. Some of us are in space, I said. Some of us are down here getting the people ready. You don't think the aliens monitor us, then? Diana asked. Yeah, I said. They do, but not in the way we think. Diana nodded slowly, and I could see she really was thinking about what I'd said. Okay, I said. I don't know how much time I have left down here, but I need to talk to Rex Hodges and the rest of the leaders in this complex. Can you arrange it? Diana pursed her lips. I like your spirit, spaceman. You've given me hope again, something I'd thought I'd lost forever. I don't know if you're a crazy man or for real. Let's go talk to Hodges. It's been some time since I've seen him. He's a tough one, though. An ex-pro football star who played tackle for the Cowboys. You're kidding, I said. That Rex Hodges? The same, Diana said. Yeah, I said. Let's go. Chapter 11 I should have thought harder on what Diana asked. Don't the aliens listen to or monitor us? Cloth claimed to view us as animals. How did the androids view us? How closely did the androids work with the Saurians? The lizards didn't have any reason to love me. After spending half a day in the Baja freighter complex, I trudged back to the waiting air car and the android pilot. The other leaders had been big, tough, and willing to crack heads to get what they wanted. Henchmen backed them, and the leaders knew how to divide the little food, water, and wealth in their possession to keep the rest from rioting. Otherwise, what I'd seen depressed me. If the other freighters were like this, humanity hung on by a thread. We'd all become beggars, living off scraps tossed us by the jelk and packed into steel-walled slums. That galled me. The Lohars. No. I didn't want to dwell on them right now. I had too much to do. I strode angrily into the waiting air car. It rested where the android had landed us, between two almond orchards. Every bare branch was a testament to bioterminator effectiveness. The brittle leaves lay like a dead carpet, the last of their kind. How long until the almond trees crashed upon the dying soil? How long until every trace of them vanished? I shook my head, heading for the entrance. The air car was a misnomer. It was the size of a dump truck. It must have carried a fusion power plant inside. The pilot sat up top, ten feet from the ground, under a clear canopy. The android stared down at me. I pointed at the entrance. He kept staring as if he held a grudge. Did one of them care if another had died by my hand? The androids had always seemed emotionless. Bio-zombies made in the image of men. Did this one remember I'd killed an abusive D.I.? Isaac Asimov, the author of I, Robot, had created the three laws of robotics. The key was that no robot could harm men. Clearly the androids had never heard of that rule. The pilot continued to stare down at me. My hand dropped to my side, but I didn't carry a gun. I wish then I'd worn the bio suit. I would have jumped and clawed my way up to him and smashed through the canopy and asked him what his problem was. I glanced around for a rock and decided the length of broken branch would have to do. Weighing it in my hand, I heaved and watched it twirl before striking the canopy. The android didn't flinch, but he turned his head and it appeared as if his arm moved. The door before me slid open. I climbed in, heard it swish shut, and endured the cleansing agents washing over me. First shedding the spacesuit, I climbed naked up a ladder and into the main salon. The pilot sat up front. 
He turned and regarded me. I don't know. I suppose by the way he'd been acting that I expected him to hold a gun. He didn't. I wanted to ask him why he'd taken his sweet time to open the door. I decided that before I began an interrogation, I'd don my bio suit. I moved to the cylinder and pressed the button. Nothing happened. I have locked it, the android said in his cold voice. Something uneasy settled into my stomach. That something hardened into a knot of resolve. I was going to have to kill another android. I didn't know why, but my gut said to get ready. I straightened, turned, and moved toward him. Remain where you are, he said. Open my locker. I'm not going to ride around in the nude. You will sit or I will subdue you, the android said. Did they give you a shocker? The android turned in his swivel chair toward his controls. I moved, using every neurofiber planted in me. He wore living plastic bioskin and had machine-like reflexes. His hand slid toward a red button. I beat him by the barest fraction, grabbed his elbow and yanked so his fingers hit the panel, but no controls. The first thing I discovered after that was that this android was stronger than the D.I. Maybe he was a different model. He swiveled again toward me, and with a meaty smack, he pile-drove a fist against my gut. It hurt, and would have ruptured a regular man's stomach. The steroid 65 had changed me. Living in double-earth gravity for weeks had strengthened every muscle I owned. I endured, grunted, and slammed an elbow against his face, knocking him off the chair. You plot against the Jelk, he said. Fancy that, I said. I wanted to double up and groan. My gut ached. This android could punch. If I could help it, I wouldn't let him put his hands on me again. I have recorded everything you said in the freighters, he bragged in his cold voice. And I will play it to our master on our return. You're a tricky one, eh? I said. No. Let me tell you something. You haven't recorded anything. You're guessing. Bluffing. From on the floor, he slid away from me, creating a track in the dust there. He stood with the pilot's chair between us. You are a rogue, and for the good of all, you must be destroyed. I decided to play an idea. Why do you want to be a slave to cloth? Join me. Become free and think for yourself. He tilted his head, and for the first time I witnessed emotions in his shark-like plastic eyes. We are not slaves, but we are the true men, he said. Without the flaws of you earth beasts, we serve the Jelk in the promise of further advancements. What's that mean? I asked. Advancements he said. Greater modifications bringing about greater perfection. You're kidding, right? You toady to the jelk in hope of upgrades, and because of that you think you're a true man? You are a plague, the android said. You will bring harm to the jelk, which will possibly bring harm to us, because Shah Clive might come to distrust those in your likeness. You think I'm trouble, is that it? You have destroyed androids. You plot against our benefactor and creator. Oh, boy, I said. Cloth has done a number on you. Return to your seat. We will head to space so I can make my report. How did you do it? I asked. You must have planted a bug in my spacesuit? No. You must have put a bug in my hair or something. The android tilted his head. Bug? A micro-recording device, I said. Yes, a bug. I recorded your conversations and learned of your plan. Why did Cloth tell you to do that?
I asked. We protect the Jelk. We take the pains. He is our benefactor and creator. Return to your seat. I will not ask you again. That's right, I said. You won't. I lunged over the pilot's seat, and we fought a bitter battle there in the cockpit. He was strong. I was quicker, deadlier, and carried the weight of humanity on my shoulders. I lost skin and came close to losing my right eye. Those plastic fingers could stab like iron rods. It took dragging my entire body over the chair and using my legs in a wrestling hold I'd learned from watching cage fighting. This was like some of the worst fights in prison. I grunted, gasped for air, and used my forehead like a battering ram. A broken nose didn't stop him, though. Finally, while losing more skin and sweating like a pig, I managed to work behind the android and used a full Nelson. Bit by bit, I drove his head forward until his chin touched his chest. I bunched my muscles, roared, and became dizzy from the exertion. You should have sided with us, I whispered in his ear. You... Our beasts, he whispered. Cloth is a creator. That's what I needed to hear. Rage added fuel to my tired limbs. I pushed, broke his neck, and found that he yet lived. The next few minutes weren't pretty. I'm not proud of them. I learned things about androids that made me wonder. Did this android live as I lived? As people lived? Or was he a robot, which in the end was no different from a toaster? I guess I'm asking if he had a soul. If he did, my deeds crossed the line. If not, I'm exonerated, even though I felt guilty. I could have taken the easy road, shrugged and said an android had no soul. Probably that would have been better for my conscience. I couldn't do that, though. I wasn't a genocidal lohar. I was a man. I made the android talk, at least in a sense. I found out enough to realize that no one else knew what he did. I discovered his computer file of incriminating evidence, deleting it, and I learned the beginning procedures of flying this dumpster-sized air car. Afterward, I killed him, or shut him down. Take your pick of which you believe. To him, I was the devil. And I guess from his point of view, he was right. Damn. I hadn't wanted complications of the soul. But there they were. Black stains to haunt me. I felt shaky as I staggered to my place in the salon. I had a problem. A dead android on my hands. I knew what Cloth had told me. I wasn't supposed to destroy any more of his property. Otherwise, I was a dead man. Okay. I had to think of something. A way to cover myself. Sitting there, staring out a window, watching the purple clouds race over a dead almond orchard, I realized what I needed to do. With a grunt, I stood. If I was going to do this, I had to get started right away. I visited several more freighters before staging a flying accident. Would Cloth have statistics for his android pilots? Would he automatically suspect me of troublemaking? I couldn't see any way around this, so I planted verbal seeds in a few more freighter leaders and searched for the worst weather patterns. I found them in the former Northwest Territories of Canada. They were hurricane-level storms. Before setting up the accident, I studied everything I could about the air car, its computers, and the info stored in them that might help me later. I searched for clues, for space knowledge, and an edge over the jelk. I read as fast as I could, not really thinking about what I saw. I'd mull over the stuff later. Finally, as time ticked on, I decided I had to act. I didn't know how long Cloth had given the android to show for me around the Earth. I had to make this look real or I'd die. I donned my living armor, helmet, and breather, 
and flew into an orange-colored storm. Howling winds buffeted the air car. I'd strapped the android in his chair, readied the autopilot, and staggered to the couches in the back of the salon. I'd barely buckled in when the air car went up. I didn't have long to wait, and the vehicle abruptly plowed down toward the earth. Through the canopy, I saw the ground rushing near. We had to be going over 150, maybe 175. I clenched my teeth, braced my body, and then everything became crashing, crunching metal. I slammed against the restraints and lost consciousness. I don't know how long I was out. When I came to, wind howled around me. I groaned, and it hurt my chest to breathe, with a stab of pain each time in my heart. Slowly, with nearly frozen fingers, I unbuckled. Everywhere around me were shards of canopy and razor edges of broken, twisted, metallic air car. If I hadn't worn the bio-battle suit, I'd never have made it. Despite my best efforts, metal pressed or cut against me, but the living armor held. I wondered, as I worked free of the wreckage, if powered armor would have lasted the crash. I think the living armor could take greater punishment because it had more flexibility. Finally, after oozing through a jagged, shard-cutting tunnel of metal, I flopped onto snow and crawled away from the strangely buzzing craft. I think one of my legs was broken. It hurt badly enough. I crawled and crawled before looking back. That was a good wreck. Maybe I should have checked the android first, but I wasn't in any shape to have tried. Besides, I didn't know if the air car's fusion core had ruptured. I could take some radiation, but wasn't sure how much would kill my armor in me. I crawled to a field of bare, porous rocks, what must have been lava ages ago. Farther away was a large pine forest, minus any evergreen needles. Those had fallen, all of them, making it a bald evergreen forest. I had never seen one of those. Seven weeks ago, all this had been alive. Now it was dead, or dying the final death. I shook my head and waited. Would android rescuers come? Would Saurians drop down? Maybe whoever watched the black boxes aboard the air cars figured we both died in the crash, and good riddance to the troublesome Earther. I hadn't worried about setting up a rescue beacon because I figured that would be an automatic thing. Yet, what did I really know about the aliens and how they operated? I told myself that the Jelk was in charge. Cloth and his kind thought of profits. It wasn't profitable to let a mercenary just die. Hmm. What about the fuel costs? That was the cynical, nasty side of my brain thinking. What did it cost in fuel to bring an air car or a lander down here? Maybe to come searching for me would cost more fuel than Cloth figured I was worth. They weren't pleasant thoughts. And I disliked having to rely on the Jelk for rescue. Maybe my thinking seems ungrateful to some of you reading my memoir. After all, Cloth had sent down a few freighters for the last humans, so one could argue humanity owed him. I would point out that it had been Cloth's plan to use hundreds of millions of Earthers that had sent the Lohars here in the first place. I realized Cloth hadn't attacked our planet, but hadn't he been the germ of our catastrophe? Besides. I doubted Cloth had planned to quietly hire hundreds of millions of mercenaries, but to capture and subdue the same number of Earthers. One way or another, the Jelk Corporation had helped screw mankind. I endured among the rocks, growing faint, and finally my leg began to ache like a son of a bitch. I thought you were supposed to give me something for the pain, I told the suit. Maybe the crash had injured the living armor. Maybe the bio-terminator was killing the suit. I tried to find a more comfortable position. It didn't happen. 
I was one giant bruise and ache. The wind picked up, and I listened to it shriek for hours. The sounds of a dying world. How long would my air supply last? The androids were freaks, but I suppose I could see their point of view. That this one had called Cloth his creator troubled me. Did that make the androids religious? I chuckled. Cloth was their god, and he didn't really care one way or another for his creations, other than to profit by them. I wouldn't want that kind of god looking out for me. Angling my head, I shifted my gaze upward. I laughed, and even to my ears it sounded crazy. High up there in the atmosphere, I saw a bright orange thruster glow. The rescue team cometh, rah, rah, rah. I might have passed out then. I don't remember too well. Next time I looked, the orange glow had become a slender rocket. The flames licked against snow, and thunder boomed through me. This seemed familiar, but I couldn't place why. The shaking ground caused me to raise my chin off my chest. I opened my eyes. I'd passed out again. Like an old 50s sci-fi magazine cover, the rocket fins touched down, and sometime later, a ladder extended to the ground. I'd never seen this model of spacecraft before. Time crawled until I saw three suited figures climb down the ladder. These three had tails. Saurians. Lizards. They bore weapons. I would have climbed to my feet, but I couldn't. My muscles had frozen. I watched them circle the wreck. They pointed their weapons at it. Finally, they stopped and seemed to confer. I tried to get up. Pain lanced through me. I groaned, and my eyelids fluttered. Unconsciousness threatened. Despite a horrible, throbbing headache, I strove to remain awake and barely won the fight. Over here, I whispered. Over here. The comm equipment in the helmet didn't work anymore. They didn't hear me. In despair, I watched the lizards turn back for their rocket. Wait, I whispered. Here, here. I lacked weapons. I had no radio, and I wondered vaguely if my dream of freeing mankind would perish with me. Dmitri the Cossack had the right heart, and he was tough, but he lacked the cunning. Rollo might have guessed my plans, but I doubted he would see them through. Oh, boy, I muttered. Would the android have prayed to Cloth for aid? Or was that beyond the cultured, grown plastic man? I don't know. I did pray, though, although not the cloth. Give me strength, please, God. I have to do this. We're on the brink of extinction. Gritting my teeth, I tried again. An even fiercer headache exploded into existence, a nova bomb starting behind my eyes and radiating backward. Vomit stirred in the back of my throat. Slowly, I dragged an arm across my chest. I closed my eyes to help lessen the headache, but that only caused fiery splotches to appear before my eyelids. I drew a ragged breath and worked forward. Blood bounded in my head, or well, that's what it felt like. I mustered everything, then, gripped a stone I'd spotted earlier, and pushed against the rock I sat against. I worked up to my feet opened my eyes to stare at the departing lizards, and heaved the stone. The biosuit must have woken up the last time. I'm not sure if it had a will to live or not. Did trees? The thing amplified the little strength I had, and that stone sailed. I wouldn't have been able to gather the strength to throw another projectile. Despite the howling wind, despite the distance... That stone clipped the rearmost saurian. The lizard turned. He must have seen me. I toppled into the snow and lay still, expended and spent. 
Time had no meaning afterward. Just my breathing and near sobbing. I dearly wanted to live. I had to defeat Cloth, to shove his thumb off us. I had Lohars to pay back, but most of all I had a human race to save from destruction. I found myself staring at a three-toed boot standing in snow. The lizards, I think they circled me. I tried to move my head, but I couldn't. Everything I'd had, I'd used. Did they know who I was? Saurian hands, claws, talons, whatever, reached down and hauled me upright. I found myself staring into lizard eyes. That's right, I muttered. I'm alive, you bastard. I don't think it hurt me. I'm certain it hated me. I passed out, so I'm not sure what happened exactly. The next thing I experienced was the grinding acceleration of liftoff. I was on my way back into space, and maybe to a confrontation with Cloth about a wrecked air car and a dead-as-nails android. So be it. At least for the moment, I was alive. Chapter 12 My left thigh was broken, along with several ribs and a badly bruised neck. Without the biosuit, I'm sure I would have died in the air car accident. I was placed in a healing tank. It reminded me of the story of Achilles, the Greek hero of the Trojan War. When he'd been a baby, his mother had dipped him into the river of death, the river Styx. The dip in death had made him invulnerable from harm. The only trouble was that his mom had gripped him by the heel. It meant his one heel had never gotten the Styx treatment. Paris, the archer, the Trojan who jetted off with Helen and thereby started the ten-year feud, shot Achilles with an arrow toward the end of the war. One of the gods aiding the Trojans guided the arrow to the heel. The Achilles heel. Blood poisoning must have set in afterward. The point of the tale, I guess, was that Achilles' mom should have switched heels and made all of him invulnerable. The healing tank didn't make me immune to harm, but it did speed up the knitting process. In that way, I felt like Achilles. Several days after the incident, I could walk again, and my ribs didn't hurt every time I took a breath. Maybe Cloth had been waiting for that. An android in cyber armor entered the hospital wing of the ship. We were in orbit over the Earth. You will gather your possessions and come with me, the android said. My things were my shirt, pants, shoes, and several new scars. The healing tank hadn't taken care of everything. The android marched through an easy two miles of corridors, his magnetic boots clanging every step of the way. The vessel was huge. The regular thrum I'd felt in other spacecraft was lacking in this one. I began to wonder if this was Cloth's private ship. The android and I entered a small room with a metal table and chair. My minder indicated the furniture and said, Sit. I was glad to get off my feet. The bones had mended and most of the tissue knit back together but I'd lost stamina. A screen flickered into life, and I viewed Cloth. I finally wondered about that. Why hadn't he ever met me in person? Why all these meetings via screen? What did he have to hide? Or was he that paranoid about my beastliness? The red-skinned alien took his time while he studied me, and I became paranoid. Was he going to accuse me of destruction of property? Not that he'd be wrong, but then I'd likely be dead. He inhaled sharply and said, You have inordinately bad luck. I find that a poor quality for a battle beast. Maybe I've made a mistake with you. I shook my head. It didn't have anything to do with my luck but that of the android piloting the ship. 
Hmm, Cloth said. If that's the case, then it would seem that those around you have the bad luck, which amounts to the same thing. I slapped the table. I'm the one who should be complaining. I broke bones because of an android's carelessness. He nearly got me killed. I hope for both your and my sake that none of them are coming along on the mission. The android in the room stirred. Cloth noticed. Do you wish to add something, N7? I do, sir, the android, N7, said. I give you leave to speak, Cloth said. Thank you, sir, N7 said. I state for the record that the pilot was in perfect working order. I further note that all androids test out before departing the ship. The implications of this slanderous beast... Who are you calling a beast, you pile of junk? I snarled. I was there. You weren't. I know what happened. So don't give me any of your sanctimonious robot crap. The android no longer stirred but I felt hostility radiating from him. He turned from the screen and faced me. Interesting, Cloth said. You have an uncanny gift, Beast. For years I have attempted to add emotional makeup to my androids, and my techs have always failed me. You, however, appear to have created anger in several different models. If for no other reason, I am loath to destroy you. What do you mean, destroy me? I asked in outrage. I've done everything you've asked, and now you talk about destroying me? What kind of double cross is this? The androids are excellent pilots, Cloth said. Better than the best, Saurian. Have you been down to Earth lately? I asked. Have you seen some of those storms? Did you purposely destroy my property? The air car and android? Cloth asked. I'd been waiting for a direct question. No, I said, generating hatred at the Jelk, at the android, and at humanity's awful position in the universe. I assumed Cloth used some kind of lie detector that monitored my heart rate, brain rhythms, and other bodily functions. With my hatred, I hoped to mask these signs. The Jelk glanced at something I couldn't see, with his eyes darting like a hunting weasel. He checked a medical report, no doubt. He studied me afterward, and I'd swear he looked perturbed. You continue to claim the wind blew your air car off course. He asked. I haven't claimed anything other than android negligence, I said. I could have piloted the air car better than he did. I assure you, Cloth said, you could have done no such thing. Their flight reflexes are amazing. It is their primary function. Creator, N7 said, with something approaching heat in his voice. I've told you not to call me that, Cloth said. It is sacrilegious. I ask your pardon, N7 said. Yes, yes, Cloth said. Now what did you want to say? Sir, the android said. The beast, he lies. Indeed, said Cloth. And how do you know this? It is the only rational explanation, N7 said. The pilot would have made an emergency report. Yeah, I said. He tried. That's what got us killed. I told him to keep his eyes on the control. He was too busy following your rote procedures when the wind flipped us and hurled us down. N7 faced me, and his right hand dropped onto the butt of his weapon. Of course I was lying, and I was doing it as hard and as effectively as I could. What choice did I have? Hmm, what was the old saying? Terror was the weapon of the weak. 
Well, my position was the weakest, and so I used what I could. Contain yourself, Cloth told the android. Yes, sir, N7 said. But the beast's lies, they are absurd and insulting. Interesting, Cloth said. You are insulted? N7 appeared surprised, and he nodded, seemingly reluctantly. Yes, sir. The beast insults me. What is your wish regarding him? Cloth asked. Let me destroy him, sir. He must have destroyed the pilot. It would be just for him to cease being as well. I gathered myself, getting ready to lunge at N7. He might have a cyber armor and a weapon, but I'd fight until the last. He'd learn what calling me a beast would earn him. You may be right concerning his irrationality, N7, Cloth said. Yet he is a ferocious creature, a veritable killer. If he destroyed an N-model android, that would be most impressive. Sir, N7 asked, would that not prove him too wild to trust? No, Cloth said, while watching me. I trust him to stir the other Earth beasts to violent action on the Corporation's behalf. The success of your mission rests on it. Wait a minute, I said. The androids are coming on the artifact hunt? Cloth seemed amused. You will need pilots and weapons officers. I can't send the Saurians. Why not? I asked. The humor evaporated. Do not question me, Cloth said. I am the Jelk, the superior. You are my property. I am not your property. I looked down lest he see my eyes. Someday I was going to put a collar on Cloth. Achilles had dragged Hector around Troy in his chariot. I was going to drag Cloth a lot farther than that. Please, sir, give me the word, N7 said. Let me destroy him. What kind of robot are you? I asked. I am an android with the same style of bio-brain as yours, N7 said. Although mine is fully integrated and civilized. Yet your civilized brain wants to kill me. I needled him. You sound like an animal. Quiet, Cloth told us. N7 faced the screen and stood rigidly like a statue. I couldn't even see him breathe now. His eyelashes didn't even twitch. I waited, wondering what would happen next. Cloth seemed to measure me with his eyes. The Saurians cannot join the expedition for the simple reason that anyone capturing or finding a destroyed Saurian craft would realize they had acted on Jelk orders. That would implicate the corporation, and that must be avoided at all costs. I shouldn't have said it, but I did. So why are you telling me all this? Cloth flicked his fingers in a dismissive gesture. You cannot implicate the corporation. Any Earth beast beyond the emitting range of the central assault ship will die. What's that mean? I asked. I know you've received punishment shocks, Cloth said. The controller in your neck has other uses, too. If any Earth beast drifts beyond range of the emitter, the device will explode, killing the creature. What? This was outrageous. It is an obvious procedure, Cloth said. And it solves my dilemma of having any of you creatures inadvertently creating an incident. Now, wait a minute, I said. 
We're mercenaries, not slaves. Cloth gave me a pointy-toothed smile. You wear the controller. Therefore, it is clear that I make the rules. You are whatever I say you are. It would be good for you to finally come to terms with the idea. I'd never come to terms with it. Why should we go into battle wearing a suicide device? I asked. I'm glad you asked, Cloth said. It is central to the reason why you're alive, instead of drifting in space, heading toward this system's sun to incinerate. I scowled. You've proven yourself an interesting creature in more ways than one, Cloth said. You achieve results. That is your critical quality. With primitive weapons and after shrugging off the tamer ray, you stormed and captured a Saurian lander. Later, with nothing but your hands, you destroyed an abusive D.I., and it is possible you engineered an air-car accident. Why you have done so doesn't interest me, although I suspect it has something to do with your outlandish notions of human equality. You are an odd beast, and it may be that your ideas give you strength of will. Very well, I accept that. The universe is a strange place, with many unusual creatures and events. A jelk does not insist reality conform to every one of his whims or preconceptions. A jelk uses what he finds to grind every particle of profit he can for himself and the corporation. It's what has made us the most powerful species in space. He loves bragging. How can I use that against him? Okay, I said. You seek to keep your species alive, Cloth said. I have found that that idea does indeed motivate you, Earth beasts. Now I am about to test your battle quality in a real situation. Is your fighting power inferior or superior? I have let you visit the freighters on Earth for a single reason. For you to see how slender a thread the rest of humanity hangs on to existence. Yours is a physically strong, but mentally and emotionally weak species. If I summon the freighters and I empty them in space, humanity as a species dies. The only thing keeping them alive is the earth beasts in my employ. Fight well, and your species lives. Fight poorly, or run away, and your species will cease to exist. You appreciate that fact more than the others do, and I believe you will help the others to recognize the importance of fighting well and getting me what I want. Okay. I said. I get it. And I did. Claw threatened humanity with extinction. He was a little better than the Lohars. If we failed to get him profits, goodbye freighters and goodbye humanity. It is for these reasons that you are alive, Claw said. Your vigor and desire to see your people live gives me leverage on you. Fight as hard for me as you fight for your people, and we can do business together. I hear you loud and clear, I said, and you can bet I'll fight hard. Are you giving me command of the space assault troopers? Don't be ridiculous, Cloth said. Then you would attempt to foment rebellion. You will lead your maniple, and the others will continue to lead theirs. I am, however, sending an Earth Beast representative to the Starkians. Who are they? I asked. They are independent contractors, little better than pirates, Cloth said with distaste. 
you will use their ships to reach the Altair system. As contractors, they're willing to deal with the corporation and earn some quick cash. Right, I said, beginning to understand his reasoning. And if Starkian ships take damage, you can deny the Jelk Corporation had anything to do with this mess. For such an emotional creature, you are perceptive, Cloth said. I believe I've made a wise choice deciding upon you as the Earth Beast representative. Sure, I said. Drag you around and around the walls of Troy while you choke to death. I'm still curious about the androids, though. Anyone who finds one of them will realize the Jelk funded the attack. You're right, except for one particular which makes you wrong, Cloth said. The N-Series androids are fitted with similar explosive devices as you space assault troopers. We sell such androids everywhere, so their carcasses, just like yours, will not implicate us. I'll say this for Cloth. He was a cold-hearted businessman. I turned to the android, wondering how I could use this last piece of information. And you're okay with being wired to blow? I asked N7. We serve our creator, the android said. Our designer. Cloth cleared his throat in an imperious manner, his chin rising as he did so. Let me rephrase. N7 said. We have no problem with Jelk directives. That's bloody marvelous, I said. When do we go? The expedition leaves tomorrow, Cloth said. Chapter 13 We were about to embark on our first mission as space assault troopers to steal, purloin, or acquire for the Jelk Corporation the Altair object, a forerunner artifact. As the Earth representative, I learned for the first time the number of commandos to be employed on the mission. I'd expected Cloth to use on the order of two or three thousand. Instead, to my amazement, the number was twenty-three thousand space assault troopers. The number surprised me for a variety of reasons. Firstly, as Cloth had hinted earlier, Rollo, Dimitri, Ella, and I had trained in maniples of twenty troopers per, never more. I was designated First Man Creed, the maniple leader. Under me were my sergeants or second men. Second Man Rollo, Second Man Dimitri, and so forth. It was a simple system, made so the likes of us could understand the hierarchy. In essence, the first men were lieutenants. The space assault troopers lacked anything higher, like captains, majors, colonels, or generals. It seemed like a weakness. I suppose Cloth figured the Starkians or the androids would act as captains, and maybe colonels, maneuvering the maniples as they wished. It seemed like an unwieldy way to do it. I mean, commanding hundreds of twenty-man maniples would put a lot of stress on the directing android or Starkian. Wouldn't it be easier to marshal us into larger formations, like companies or battalions, at least? Then we'd be trained to coordinate and fight as 23,000 commandos, not as hundreds of separate squads acting semi-independently. I didn't like such inefficiency, especially as we would likely have to pay for any errors with our lives. And as yet, we knew nothing about the forerunner object and how we were supposed to assault and acquire it. For a race concerned about their investment, the Jelks seemed to be setting us up for a lot of casualties. Despite Cloth's words, it took another week before we actually left the solar system. My bones needed the extra time to mend, and I exercised hard to bring myself back to peak condition. Finally, we left Earth and the solar system behind as the fleet entered its first jump route or line. I've been wondering about that for some time. Not jump route specifically, but how the aliens beat the laws of physics. 
Things with mass, like a spaceship, and light, too, of course, couldn't move faster than the speed of light. That was an immutable law of nature. Normally, a journey at light speed would take 4.3 years to travel to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star to Earth with planets. And nothing with mass could reach the speed of light, but close enough so that all kinds of problems arose, like time dilation. Why would that be a problem? Well, consider. Back on Earth during the Age of Sail, galleons might be gone for months and even a year, but not for 4.3 years and certainly not for 10 or 20 years. So how could anyone have a star empire or an interstellar corporation while traveling within the constraints of light speed or a bit under light speed? The answer was clear. They couldn't. You needed magic, or a science we'd never heard about, in order to flit from star system to star system fast enough to have interstellar empires and corporations. The technology that allowed ships to jump along these lines was just that. Think of one of those connect-the-dot puzzles you used to draw as a kid. The dots were the star systems. The pencil lines were the jump lanes, lines, points, whatever you want to call them. A spaceship went in at one end and popped out the other in a few hours, having traveled many light years. Just like in Connect the Dots, some points had one line running through them and some had three, five, or seven lines. Those dots with seven different routes were strategic points in the stellar system. Control one of those critical star systems and you could control entire routes. None of us had seen a star map or knew which jump route went to which star. Our N-series android minders simply told us to get ready for a jump. Then we hurried to our cots, lay down, strapped in, and endured. After the first jump, we learned they were bad, with terrible headaches, cramps, disorientation, and vomiting. We dreaded being ordered to get ready after that. I think even the androids hated the jumps, which made me inclined toward thinking of them as living creatures instead of just machines. And that didn't help my conscience any. After three jumps, we met the Starkians, the contractors who would pilot the frigates and corvettes to take us into the Altair system. I had no idea what Cloth had told them about us. My introduction to the Starkians came a few days later aboard one of their vessels. N7 entered our training area and told me to accompany him to the meeting. Now? I asked. My maniple practiced hand-to-hand -hand combat on the mats, with my second men prowling around to make sure no one became too angry. It is time, N7 said. Like before, he wore cyber armor and carried a sidearm. He looked like the perfect choir boy, with artificially fair features, trusting eyes and smooth, bioplastic skin. He had the stamp of perfection. Not of a Nietzsche Superman, but of the ultimate butt-kissing underling. Do I need to wear my bio suit? I asked. Negative, N7 said. Well, let me shower first. Come now, N7 said. It is an order. I'd fought several practice rounds with several of my soldiers, and my shirt was sweaty while a welt showed on my left cheek because one of the boys had almost pinned me. Sure, boss, I said. And if my stench offends the Starkians, then what? The Starkians are under Jelt command, N7 said. Your odor or lack thereof is meaningless. Negative, I said. I'm the Earth rep and I'm showering and shaving. Gotta look presentable, you know? Give me ten minutes and I'll be with you. I have given you an order, N7 said. That's right, and I'm complying with the order. After I take a shower. The android drew his sidearm, pointing the barrel at my face so I could see inside the pitted orifice. This gun had been used plenty of times, which I found interesting. I grinned and made a show of looking around the crowded chamber. My maniple of troopers had already stopped practicing, most of them lying on the mats and breathing heavily. They now stood to their feet and glowered at N7. 
Hey, how about that? I said. If you shoot me, these mercenaries will tear you to pieces. I do not fear destruction, N7 said. Bully for you, I said. That makes you a fool and a liability. N7 stepped closer so the barrel bumped against my forehead. A good soldier fears death, I told him. The fear helps motivate the soldier to action and thereby keeps him alive to fight again another day. Fear is akin to cowardice. N7 said. Cowardice is against the laws of androids. You want to obey Cloth's orders, is that right? I asked, deciding on a different tack. I do obey. Now you must obey. Right, I said. If you're torn to pieces, destroyed, you will not have obeyed Cloth's order to go to the Starkian meeting. You will have made those orders impossible. I, too, will be missing. In fact, our arguing with each other is eating up time. I'm going to shower, and then I'll be right with you. For the first time since he'd entered the chamber, N7's head swiveled as he surveyed my maniple of troopers inching toward him. Abruptly, he holstered his sidearm, folded his plastic arms across his chest, and half turned away from me. I hadn't liked the barrel pressed against my forehead, and I hadn't been sure which way N7 would jump. Maybe it had been foolish pushing him so far, but I had my reasons for wanting to be presentable to the Starkians. I'd also just gained more credibility in the eyes of my men, and showed them what kind of human haters the androids were. Good choice, Chief, I told him. Rollo, finish the exercises. Then use your best judgment. I don't know how long I'll be gone. With that, I jogged for the nearest shower. I didn't want to keep the android waiting. I wore a jumpsuit uniform, my Bowie knife, and a spacesuit with a helmet hanging on the back near my neck. I rode beside N7 in the shuttle he piloted. Behind us drifted seven Jelk battle jumpers, ugly utilitarian vessels. Our shuttle was a speck compared to them. Below swirled an orange gas giant maybe 100,000 kilometers away. Outlined against the gas giant drifted a hundred or so shark-shaped spacecraft. They looked deadly, but what did I know about space battle? Precious little was the answer. Much farther away, about half the size of the moon as seen from Earth, blazed this system's sun. How far were we from the solar system? Three jumps away, I knew, but what did that mean? Those are the pirate ships? I asked, pointing at the dark-shaped vessels. That is the Starkian contract fleet, N7 said. There are a lot of them. N7 ignored the comment. I glanced at him sidelong. Something had been bothering me for some time. Why had the Jelk made the androids based on humans from Earth? Had that occurred on a whim? Or was there a significant reason for it? How old are you, N7? I asked. He surprised me by answering. Five standard years, he said. How long is a standard year compared to an Earth year? I asked. I am six and a half Earth years old he said. You're young. No, I have survived three times the average time span of an N-series android. Oh, I said. I wondered why his kind lived such short lives. So I asked him. N-7 took his time answering, finally saying, We are mining androids. Excuse me, I said. The N-series are normally used to mine high-gravity planets or work the extractors of particularly massive gas giants. Why did Cloth change you and the others to a military model? I asked. 
one does not question a jelk directive. No, I suppose not, I said. You were given battle upgrades, I presume? Of course, N7 said. Five standard years, huh? So, you're born as adults? N7 glanced at me with his expressionless eyes. Why do you ask these questions? Just passing the time, I said, and figuring out what makes you androids tick. He glanced at me again. I do not believe you, First Man Creed. You are a clever beast, and you— Hey, I said, grabbing an arm. Let's get one thing straight. Cloth gets to call me a beast because he gave Earth the freighters. And because I'm going to drag him by the throat until I rub all his flesh down to the bones. You, on the other hand, can call me a man. N7 stared into my eyes and said, Beast. Don't do it, Creed. You gotta use Mr. Plastic Man. One, two, three. I grinned, ruefully. Sure, you hate my guts. I get it. And you're jealous of the real humans. Maybe I can't blame you. I... Desist, he said. Your guile will not succeed on me. You are the android killer. We know you, First Man Creed. No android will succumb to your cleverness again. Is that groupthink? I asked. You androids all think as a team? You are witnessing a survival mechanism built into all androids of the N series, he said. Once we comprehend a danger, we remember it and act accordingly. We grow. You grow, huh? That's great. So what about these Starkians? What can you tell me about them? You and I are attending a strategy session. N7 said. There we shall plan the assault tactics. I raised my eyebrows. The Starkians interested me. I knew absolutely nothing about them except that they were pirates. At least by cloth's reckoning. What's more, they were hireable contractors. I suspected cloth would give them a cut of the take from the Altair object. It seemed to imply the Starkians wouldn't care if the others knew they'd done this. Cloth, on the other hand, didn't want anyone to know about his or the corporation's involvement. Why would that interest me? Maybe humanity would need to hire a few contractors someday. I had plans, but I knew nothing about the interstellar situation. Here was a chance to learn more. Well, I take back that I didn't know anything. I knew a few things. The Lohars fought the corporation. The Jelk lived for profits, and I would make every jack tar of them pay for what had happened to my beloved world. And Severn and I traveled the rest of the way in silence, docked beside the largest of the shark-shaped vessels, it was the size of a city block, and waited as reverberating clangs and clanks told of heavy machines operating around us. Finally, N7 rose and donned his helmet. I did likewise. We exited the shuttle and soon floated weightlessly down extremely narrow corridors. The bulkheads seemed to close in around us, and the corridors turned much too sharply at times. I noticed fist-sized portholes along the bottom of the wall like giant mouse holes. I had no idea what they were for. At last, without any guards or Starkians in sight, we reached a small entrance. It opened, and N7 and I had to duck to enter a wide and far too low of a chamber filled with creatures. Gravity took hold in the chamber, almost catching me by surprise. N7 knelt before a large, kidney-shaped table and took off his helmet. I took off mine, too, and an animal stench hit me like a sucker punch. It was worse than a barn, more like some monkey exhibit at a zoo where the attendants had forgotten to clean the cages. I had to work from holding my nose or making a face. 
Could an android smell? The Starkians were the size of baboons, and looked as furry and as ugly. They sported long canines at the end of their snouts, and most had manes like a lion or a dominant male baboon. Each wore a harness of straps and buckles over their furry, smelly bodies, and they drank from silver-colored teacups, or what looked like teacups. It was a disconcerting image to see them stretch their lips past those fangs and take dainty sips. I counted fourteen Starkians in the low-ceiling chamber. I sat down, sitting cross-legged, refusing to kneel as N7 did. The ceiling loomed a mere inch above our heads now. If we'd remained standing, we would have had to stoop the entire time. I wondered if the Starkians had chosen this room for a reason. Was it a tactic or joke on their part to make bigger creatures kneel? The heaviest Starkian must have weighed sixty, maybe seventy pounds. There were computer screens along the walls, controls and a big hollow image in the center of the kidney-shaped tables. None of the Starkians sat on chairs, but squatted, as you'd expect baboon-like creatures to do. Why did they smell so bad? Their fur looked sleek and smooth, as if it was well-groomed, not like some matted offal. I breathed through my mouth, almost gagging several times. Greetings, N7, the biggest Starkian said. He had white or gray streaks in his fur, and his muzzle was more wrinkled than any others present. Greetings, Naga Gobo, N7 said. That's his name, I whispered. Naga is his name, N7 whispered back to me. Gobo is his rank. It means Lord of Ships. Got it, I whispered. Is there trouble? Naga Gobo asked. He'd keenly watched our exchange. Your beast seems restless. Will he heal to your command? He is well, N7 said. I can speak for myself, I said. Who were these horribly smelling aliens that they figured they could call me a beast? They were the creatures. Their reaction surprised me. All fourteen Starkians drew weapons from their harnesses and aimed short, ugly tubes at me. Tell your fighting beast to heal, Naga Gobo said. The Jelk assured us the creature could comprehend commands and would not run amok among us. Have you taken a good look at N7? I said. I couldn't believe this. Why did all the aliens think we were beasts? Do you see any differences between the two of us? The Starkians watched me through narrowed eyes. None of the weapon tubes wavered or moved away. You may put up your slug throwers, N7 said. Shah Cloth has given you his word. The Earth Beast will remain calm in your presence. You should have already taught your animal to know its place in front of its betters, Naga Gobo said. I swallowed my retorts. These were aliens. Stench had nothing to do with their abilities and scientific knowledge. Yeah, maybe this was why Cloth had wanted me to come. Maybe the Jelk wished me to understand my place in the interstellar community. To the Starkians, I was a beast. To the Jelk and the Lohars, I was a beast. A wild thing to use and possibly tame for combat. It was time to absorb the reality of the situation. The fact that we on Earth would have considered the Starkians as animals wasn't lost on me. It went even deeper, though. To the interstellar crowd, Earthers were the bottom of the heap. Fighting beasts. Did other star-faring races use creatures to fight their wars? Yes. Hadn't Cloth's idea been to capture several hundred million humans to fight as slave creatures among the stars? The more I learned, the less I liked it. Even if we could free ourselves from under the Jelk thumb, how would the rest of the interstellar races treat us? Wait and learn, 
I told myself. See what this forerunner object is supposed to be, anyway. Maybe it's something you can use. The strategy session quickly became interesting. Nagagobo adjusted some controls below the tabletop, and a fast-spinning A-class star appeared in the hollow image. It was the star Altair, and it rotated quickly enough to make it an oblong sun with a flattened top and bottom. Planets appeared in bright blue around Altair. The first four were Mars-like planets, while the next two were gas giants, two supersized Jupiter-like monsters. Between the gas giants was a thicker-than-normal asteroid belt. Nagagobo continued to manipulate the controls, bringing the asteroid belt up close and then picking a small area of it and zooming in. Soon enough, a silvery Taurus appeared. As the zoom continued, the Taurus grew, and so did a veritable host of orbiting rocks and sandy debris around it. The Altair Object! Naga Gobo declared. The Starkians around the conference table began to stir and lean toward the hollow image. I'd been getting used to the smell. It worsened as they moved, and I endured, waiting for the sharpness of the stench to weaken again or for me to get used to it. Several of the creatures got twitchy fingers, some of them opening and closing their baboon-like hands. It made the Starkians seem like thieves eager to grab the object and dash out of the room with it. They're contract pirates indeed, I thought to myself. It's a wonder Cloth trusts them at all. The file is old, Naga Gobo said, indicating the hollow image. But I was assured it is an original and contains trusted data. Notice the gun emplacements to the right. The hollow image zoomed again, focusing on one of the small asteroids circling the object. My eyes widened. It seemed like a regular rocky asteroid, but the surface held several black matted structures, looking like octagonal biodomes. The firing domes are of Lohar design, N7 noted. Naga Gobo nodded. The Lohar Fifth Region is far from home, but it's said that each legionary has sworn an oath to the Jade League to protect the Forerunner artifact as if it was their home planet. Questions bubbled on the tip of my tongue, but I kept my mouth shut. I listened and tried to learn. The Jade League has declared the Altair system sacred to the Creator, Naga Gobo said. Every member of the League has signed a compact in agreement with the theocratic principle. If we attempt this mission and are found out, the League members will increase their efforts to annihilate the Starkians. I turned away from the hollow image to look at Naga Gobo. Let me get this straight, I said. We're making the attack on holy ground? Or in holy space? Naga Gobo growled angrily. Why must your beast utter speech at me? It is offensive and insulting. The creature should speak to you, not to us. The Lohars attacked their home planet, N7 said. Until then, the Earth Beasts knew nothing about civilization. Naga Gobo sniffed in an exaggerated manner. This is true. The Lohars used thermonuclear warheads on their main urban centers, N7 said gravely, and laced the atmosphere with level five bioterminators. Barbaric! Naga Gobo grunted. Before their awaking several months ago, the Earth beasts believed themselves cultured and highly civilized, N7 said even though they continued to practice similar genocidal tactics upon each other. Once again, Naga Gobo sniffed exaggeratedly. The Earth Beasts desire revenge upon the Lohars, N7 added. I realize this and do not need an android explaining the obvious, Naga Gobo said. N7 dipped his head as if apologizing. Shah Cloth is cunning, 
Naga Gobo told the assembled. The other Starkians nodded, with their lips pulling back to reveal their fangs. I'd swear it was a Starkian grin or smile of appreciation. Yes, Naga Gobo said. It is possible Cloth engineered the event in order to gain these fiercely motivated battle creatures. However, if he did so, the Lohar took the bay too well and killed too many humans. N7 glanced at me, but I kept my features impassive. This was an idea I'd have to explore. The Lohar Empire grows with the passing of each year, Naga Gobo said. They have become first in the Jade League, and they desire a holy war against the Jelk Corporation. I realize that you have spoken with Shah Klaath, N7 said. You are aware of the importance of the Forerunner artifacts to the League. The Lohars particularly venerate each artifact and the star system where it resides. They believe the First Ones built the objects. I am aware of Lohar primary doctrine, Naga Gobo said. I'm surprised an N-series android should speak of such things. Shah Klaath instructed me. Naga Gobo held up one of his hands. This is a strategy session. Let us stick to the issue and not become sidetracked. Exactly, N7 said. There is a strategic point to my words. If we succeed in breaking through the Lohar Fifth Legion and dismantling the asteroid maze, we can remove the Altair object. Remove it to where? Naga Gobo asked. I do not know, N7 said. Only Cloth knows. The Jelk will cheat us! Naga Gobo shouted. The others in the chamber muttered angrily, shifting about. No, N7 said. Shah Cloth will pay you in Iridium as bargained. Naga Gobo shook his head. Why will he bother to pay us once he has the object in his sole possession? Shah Klaath ordered me to tell you of a powerful reason why you can know he will pay, N7 said. If he fails to pay, you could always gain revenge on him by telling the members of the Jade League who took the object. And thereby implicate ourselves, Naga Gobo said. No, no, if we did such a thing, the Starkians would have to leave the Quadrant and enter the Beyond. There is no doubt that the consequences of your words would be dire for all, N7 said. Even so, you possess this knowledge as a bargaining tool. Shah Klaath realizes this. He will pay as agreed. The risks, Naga Gobo said. I am to instruct you. Instruct us, Naga Gobo asked loudly. An N-series mining android wishes to instruct me, the leader of the fleet. This is infamy. The other Starkians hooted in outrage as they pounded the table with their fists. I felt as if I'd entered the African wilds of some Tarzan novel, where great apes had gained higher intelligence and technology. To say the least, it was disconcerting. N7 stood. I stood up behind him, ready to reach into my spacesuit and pull out the bowie knife. At our standing, the table pounding stopped. The Starkians took out their squat gun tubes and pointed them at N7 and me. There must be a defect in my processing centers, N7 said. I spoke incorrectly. I meant to say inform you instead of saying the other ill-chosen word. Naga Gobo wrinkled his snout and slowly began to nod. I accept your explanation. It is forgotten. Please sit down, you and your beast. N7 sat, and I did likewise. Sullenly, the Starkians holstered their weapons, a few muttering about us. Good, Naga Gobo said. Now. What is it that Shah Klaath wishes passed on to us? 
Taking the forerunner object and making it disappear will weaken the Lohar position in the Jade League, N7 said. The Lohar Fifth Region will be destroyed, or at least disgraced. The primary doctrine will suffer a critical blow and Lohar theology will also suffer. The forerunner theft might be enough to shatter the League into its component parts. Would that not benefit the Starkians? Indeed. Naga Gobo said in an oily voice, as he brushed his mane like a vain model, although using his fingers. Shah Cloth's guile runs deep. I am impressed. He glanced at me. And I begin to perceive why he uses untested beasts to make the main assault on the object. I was beginning to perceive, too. If the members of the Jade League arrived later to find the Forerunner object missing and floating, dead Earthlings in its place, what would they do to the last humans? Would the Lohars return to Earth in a religious fury to exterminate us in Jihad? And was Naga Gobo even partly right in thinking Cloth might have engineered the Lohar attack upon Earth? In any case, we would be the Fall Guys. For the umpteenth time, it hit home how little I knew of the wider interstellar civilization. I thought we'd been a cipher in a slave-hunting scheme to make more profits for the Jelk. Now it sounded like something more ominous was going on. What was the Jade League? What were Forerunner objects, anyway? What did that have to do with the Creator? And by Creator, did the aliens mean God, or their idea of one? It was strange to think of aliens as religious and having religious wars, jihads, or crusades. I'd always believed that uniquely human. I looked at the hollow image again. The Lohar Fifth Legion apparently lived on the small asteroids and debris circling the silver-gleaming Taurus. How big was that thing? I know you Starkians hate hearing my voice, I said. But what kind of spacecraft guards the Altair object? Naga Gobo stared at N7. You possess a clever beast. It asks wise questions. Yes, N7 said. Perhaps you should leave it here for us, Naga Gobo said. My blood ran cold. Is this why Cloth had wanted me to come? Yet something troubled me. I'd come to listen and learn. So why was Naga Gobo upset if I understood? Why had I been included otherwise? This creature is the killer among killers, N7 was saying. The Earth Beasts hate the Lohars. Once their champion tells the others how the Fifth Legion guards the artifact, the others will war with even bitterer ferocity. It spoke of space battle, Naga Gobo said. Does it realize? May I add a word of caution? N7 asked quickly. Naga Gobo seemed to consider this. Yes, please do. It is best not to speak of space battle in the Earth Beast's presence, N7 said. But only how we will deploy against the final barrier. You will lead the assault troopers? Naga Gobo asked. I will direct them, yes, N7 said. I studied the back of the android's head. This didn't seem like the same model as the one who had spoken about me to Cloth yesterday. Had N7 already received some of those modifications he'd been wanting? I dropped that line of thinking as Naga Gobo adjusted the hollow image yet again. I began to gain an understanding of what we would be doing. Rollo, Dimitri, Ella, I, and the others. This was a mass assault, and we would have to work through the maze of shifting, orbiting rock and blocks of sand circling the artifact, all while facing emplaced strong points and an entire legion of Lohar space soldiers. This was going to be a bloody fight over a holy object to the religious soldiers guarding it. That didn't sound easy or good for us. I listened as Nagagobo went over his strategy and tactics for deploying and giving us enough firepower to take out the Lohar Fifth Legion. 
Suddenly, 23,000 Earthers didn't seem like enough. How long were we supposed to survive out in space? Beasts. They thought of us as fighting beasts. Did one care how many running dogs it would take to clear a minefield? Some generals would gladly pay the butcher's bill with other men's lives. But what if the general was an alien? He used animals to do the fighting. Our well-being wouldn't matter to him. I studied the hollow image. There had to be a better way than how Nagagobo was planning to do this. I wish I'd brought a pencil and paper to take notes. Even better, I'd like to have a recorder and to take pictures of the hollow image and the torus-shaped object. I concentrated, willing myself to remember as much as I could. We Earthers would have to have our own strategy session. For a while now, I'd begun to believe I was getting things under control. I was wrong. Possibly dead wrong. And I couldn't back out now, or Cloth would lift the freighters off Earth and empty the living cargoes into space. This was bad. Really bad. Chapter 14 Fortunately, N-7 took me with him when he left the Starkian ship. We returned to the Jelk battle jumper, and I hurried into the mercenary area of the vessel. This is what it looks like, I said. With a pencil and paper, I sketched the forerunner artifact for the others. Rollo, Dimitri, and Ella sat around a cafeteria table with me. We ate broccoli, beans, and beef. The others leaned over their plates to stare at the drawing. I'd been telling them about the Starkian meeting. After penciling the donut-shaped artifact, I began tapping the paper, putting dots around it. Those are the shielding asteroids? Rollo asked. Asteroids and clouds of sand, I said. Rollo shook his head to indicate he didn't understand. I'd seen similar shakes for many years. It was more a quick twitch of the head, almost like a tick, with his lips pressed together firmly. The Starkian leader, Naga Gobo, said each asteroid and sand cluster circles or fully orbits the object every 15 minutes, I said. The continuous maze helps to keep unwarranted vessels from getting too near the artifact. The asteroids and sand clouds are going to make it hard to get to the Taurus, Rollo said. That's right, I said. I was told, or N7 was told, that the Lohar pilot single ships through the maze. There's a coded passageway through this mess, a strict procedure to follow. Supposedly, the Lohar Fifth Legion pilots are the only ones who can penetrate the orbital maze, taking someone to the inner space around the artifact. Why would anyone go to such trouble to do all this? Ella Timoshenko asked. What does the object do? I don't know, I said. I do know it has religious significance. Ella, who studied my drawing, looked up sharply at me. She had changed like the rest of us, bulked up muscles and neural fibers, but she still had pretty features. You've heard that the aliens call it a forerunner artifact? I asked. All three of them nodded. Well, I said, they believe the first ones built it. That sounds intriguing. Ella said. Who are the first ones? I'm going to assume the names have a meaning, I said. First ones sound like the first ones in space. Reasonable, Ella said. A forerunner likely means... Ah, yes, yes, of course, Ella said, interrupting me. The scientists love these kind of puzzles. Forerunner likely means the object or artifact is a precursor to those presently in control of the space lanes. And you say the aliens worship those things? Rollo asked. I'm not clear on that, I said. The Starkians didn't let me ask too many questions. Like I told you before, when they call us beasts, they mean exactly that. Would you explain something complicated to a dog? 
Not unless the dog's name was Lassie or Rin Tin Tin, Rollo said. Yeah, okay, I said. I'm thinking the object or artifact is more like the bones of a saint to a Catholic. Yeah, but even that isn't exactly right. The artifact isn't living, or at least to the best of my knowledge it isn't alive. Apparently, the Lohars and other Jade League members venerate it like a relic because, in some manner that I don't understand yet, it represents the Creator to them. Creator? Ella asked. Do you mean as in God or Allah? Yeah, that's right. Preposterous, Ella said indignantly. These are intelligent beings with the science of star travel. They cannot possibly believe in God. I wondered how highly Ella would think of the Starkians if she'd smelled them. I didn't ask, but I said, I believe God exists, and I'm intelligent. Ella gave me a quizzical glance. You are serious. You believe in the old fables, in Bronze Age myths. Of course he does, Dimitri said. And they're not myths. Ella gave the Cossack a glance. It told me they'd had this discussion before. I decided not to debate my beliefs with her right there. We had more pressing matters to thrash through. With my pencil, I indicated the paper. This is deadly serious stuff. The Lohars, maybe every member of the Jade League, thinks of the Altair system as holy ground. I'm guessing that the closer one gets to the Forerunner artifact, the holier the space becomes. The Lohar Fifth Legion took a religious oath to defend the object as if it was their home planet. Rollo grinned savagely. You're saying that if we can take this object from them, that they'll feel it deep in their guts? No, I said. If we take it, they won't feel a thing. But you just told us, Rollo said. They won't feel anything, because for us to take it from them, they're all going to have to be dead, I said. Oh, Rollo said. Yes, Dimitri said. Good. We kill them all. I agree. I nodded, grinning at him, and kept explaining. From the way the Starkians and N7 spoke about them, the Fifth Legion is an elite outfit. I'm guessing that makes them pretty tough. This is absurd, Ella said. The aliens possess spacecraft, science far in advance of us. They cannot continue to hold these ancient superstitions. I know, I said, speaking before Dimitri did. I find the universe we're in to be highly confusing, too. Absolutely smelly baboons called me a beast, and religious zealots guarding holy sites in space practice genocide against Earth. My point to telling you all this is to let you know that we're going to be in for a stiff battle, and I don't like the odds. There's more? Rollo asked. Just what we've been saying to each other these past few weeks, I said. We lack proper battlefield organization. We're divided into maniples, but don't have any higher organization so we can attack with coordination. It is clear that the Jelk do not trust us, Ella said. Yeah, I said. And that distrust is going to get us killed. What do you suggest we do about it? Rollo asked. I don't know what else we can do, I said. I suppose just fight like hell and win. The Starkian battle plan is simple to the point of obviousness. They're going to mass all around the object and offload us as closely as possible to the orbiting asteroids. The androids will pilot the assault ships, taking us the final distance. N7 doesn't plan on landing on the small orbiting objects. That means we're going to have to use the sleds to get near enough, and then to use our thruster packs to land and take the fight to the Lohars. During all this maneuvering, Ella said, the Lohar domes will undoubtedly be firing on us. Yeah, undoubtedly, I echoed. Our paymasters expect us to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat? Rollo asked. Surface fighting, I said. 
The Starkians will match their velocity to the orbiting objects. They'll use beams and missiles to soften up the domes. None of this makes sense, Ella said. Why not just blast the shielding asteroids and debris with massive nuclear bombs and heavy beams, clearing the way for transporters? I managed to get N7 to ask the Starkians that, I said. You won't like the answer. More Bronze Age nonsense? Ella asked. In outrage, Dimitri slapped the table. The Starkians don't want to risk damaging the artifact, I said, shaking my head at the Cossack. From what I can gather, the contractors are outcasts, at least to the Jade League members. I don't know if the Starkians buy into the Creator belief, but they don't want the League members to hunt them down in religious fury. Therefore, they're going to use us to take out the Lohar Fifth Legion. In that way, the Starkians, and the Jelk, too, I'd imagine, don't have to worry about bombs or beams hitting and possibly marring the Forerunner artifact. I have the feeling these objects are priceless. Like an ancient Ming vase? Ella asked leaning back in her chair as she stroked her chin. Sure, I said. I have a question, Dimitri said. I studied the blocky man before nodding. What are Lohars like? Dimitri asked. I've been wondering about that for a long time already. Good question, I said. I tried to ask the Starkians and N7 too, but... Everyone ignored me about it. That does not make sense, Dimitri said. They should tell us. We need knowledge of the enemy so we can plan better. So we can kill all the Lohars. I shrugged. It might be redundant to say this, but how would you tell a pack of hunting dogs about bears? You wouldn't. We are not dogs, Dimitri said. Yeah, I said, and for a moment my anger against the aliens smoldered. We are men, Dimitri said, as he slapped his chest. We must adjust ourselves to the facts, Ella said. We must view reality as it is and plan accordingly. That is the only rational response to our situation. That's what I'm trying to say, I told them. You wouldn't tell dogs how to attack bears. You'd bring the dogs to the hunt and let them loose. That's what the aliens are doing with us. Yes, Ella said, nodding. That is a poetical way to describe it, but accurate. These aliens believe us to be inferior to them. Yet the more I learn of these space races, the less I like them or understand their thought processes. I find myself growing disillusioned with them. I have another question, Dimitri asked. Shoot, I said. The Cossack cocked his head, looking befuddled at me. That means go ahead and ask, I said. Ah, Dimitri said. Here is question. How many Lohars are in a legion? Yeah. I'd like to know that, too, I said. They would not tell you that, either, Dimitri asked. We'll know tomorrow, I said, standing, pushing the drawing toward them. That's the end of the briefing. You know enough now to tell the others. I don't think Cloth or N7 intends to give us mercenaries a briefing, so we're it. Copy the drawing, show as many others as you can, and tell them what you know and to pass it on. I'll do the same thing, and hopefully by tomorrow everyone will have an idea of what to do. Ella asked a few more questions. Then we split up to go tell the others what to expect. It was precious little, but the truth was we were lucky to even know that much. You know enough now to tell the others. I don't think Cloth or N7 intends to give us mercenaries a briefing, so we're it. Copy the drawing, show as many others as you can, and tell them what you know and to pass it on. I'll do the same thing, and hopefully by tomorrow everyone will have an idea of what to do.